All right, next person I'm going to introduce, what I want to bring on is our president, Brandon McDaniel, and he's going to give you a little update and talk a little bit about uh, PBS CCS. Uh, Brandon McDaniel entered his 16th season as a professional, in professional baseball. He is currently the executive director of player performance for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, he's been in the field of strength and conditioning for 16 years. Previously worked for the Pittsburgh Pirates, the minor level, and also Exos uh, in their military and strength department with the Department of Defense. I'm going to bring, uh, he has lots and lots of uh, experience and lots of accolades after Esther's his name. Look at all that right there. He is FMS, SFMA, USAW, DNS, PRI, and Strong First. I'm looking forward to introducing Brandon McDaniel, president of the PBS CCS. Matt, can you, uh, make you get my video for me? I'm going to get you a co-host right now. Yep. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> obviously, uh, beginning of the season for, for all of us, strength coaches, dietitians, uh, everybody working in the field right now. So for everybody to take time, um, you know, in one of these first weekends to, to get something like this off the ground, I think it's it's outstanding. So really appreciate that. Matt, as always, uh, he, he does so much behind the scenes for the PBS CCS, uh, to be able to, <clears throat> to be able to host these things is no small task. And, and Matt works on these things tirelessly. So, uh, appreciate that. Frank Velasquez, another man behind the scenes, who's going to be hosting and moderating the event today. Um, you know, Frank has been a strength coach for a long, long time, uh, runs a great facility up in Pittsburgh, and, and he's also just taken, taken time out of his weekend to be able to help with this as well. So appreciate it. Most importantly, um, these keep getting better and better. The, the topics that we're talking about uh, have, have evolved, and we're now able to talk about things in baseball that we weren't able to talk about for years. And so, you know, really, really like looking forward to this one, especially as I saw the lineup come in, as I saw the group that Matt put together, extremely excited for that. Um, you know, want to thank Woodway, uh, you know, for, for providing Thompson for us uh, to get some, some great uh, content from him. 1080 motion. We use 1080 motion with the Dodgers. So I'm a big fan and look forward to sharing uh, 1080 motion with you as well. And then, you know, this, this event is kind of, uh, uh, we're kicking it off and, and it's kind of tailored around Lee and I've known Lee a long time, uh, even before his days in Anaheim, he was a great major league strength coach runs an awesome facility. We send guys to him. Um, he's just, he's just a great guy to go out and, and talk about shoulder, talk about speed, talk about strength with really gets the game of baseball. So you're going to be able to learn a lot from him. He works with all types of athletes, uh, you know, youth, high school, college pro and so he really gets this speed part of things and and us as major league strength coaches we maybe don't get to work on speed as much as we would like with guys um just because it's in season they're a little bit older um you know we're able to kind of break some of those boundaries now but but lee's a big reason uh why we're able to do that because of some of the things that he's done in this facility some of the things he did with his athletes when when he was with anaheim so uh, want to welcome all the strength coaches, want to welcome uh, all the dietitians, want to welcome all the membership. Really excited about where, where this group is going as always. Um, and it wouldn't happen if it wasn't for, for people like Matt and Frank for taking the time to put this together. It wouldn't happen if it wasn't for Thompson and Lee and, 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 and the rest of the strength coaches and dietitians that have stepped up uh, to speak on something like this. We just want to share the knowledge that we have. And we also understand that's give and take that when we're sharing, we're learning from all of you that are out there as well. So please provide your questions. Uh, please provide your comments. We'd love to know how to make these events better. Um, you know, obviously we can't do everything, but we, we do want to be able to give back in a way that's super meaningful to, to all of you that are on here and make this the best experience as possible. So, with that being said, um, Matt, again, appreciate it. And, and hey Brandon, before, before you bounce off, I just have one thing. I'm, I'm not yeah. just a quick question. And it's, it's the beginning of the season. Uh, but with the base path being, what, four inches shorter, do you think there'll be an increase in, say, running? I know the game's power game, right? But do you yeah. think 
uh, with the rule changes and, uh, you know, the throwover rule that over time, guys are going to get a chance to manipulate this during the season to, to increase some running on the base path. Well, I think the game, I think the game has changed uh, already drastically. And I, and I think it's for the good too. Um, as we talk about speed and conditioning, especially on, on this, on, on this topic today, um, it feels like guys are running at a rate that they've never ran at on the base pass. And I don't know if that's because the bases are bigger or if that's the throw over rule um, or if it just kind of created, uh, created a little bit around this where guys are going to be running a little bit more, but you know, we, we play the Diamondbacks um, eight of the first 10 games and they got some, they got some guys that can get up and run. And so I, I got a firsthand look of what baseball is going to look like. So I think it, it changes in a couple of ways. Obviously it's a power game. Like Homer still matter. Velocity still right. matter, but the pitch clock number one is going to change the way that we condition our pitchers uh, because right. they're, we're, we're moving at an incredible pace. Now we're playing the same amount of innings and the same amount of pitches and the same amount of bats in a much shorter window. So just from that standpoint alone, our work capacity is going to need to be up. We're also going to be able to turn over uh, our ability to create power very quickly. But then obviously the running um, guys need to, like we're going to have to change the way that we would go about that as well, because things are happening much, much faster and guys are going to be running more. But also I love it too, as a guy that played college baseball, as a college catcher, like it's going to force catchers to be able to throw the baseball. Right. Um, Uh blocking blockings become uber important throwing the baseball second base to third base um is is gonna it's gonna change it's gonna revolutionize the game that we're gonna go back to making it uh, a little bit more speed oriented and nobody gets that better than our strength coaches and so not only is that going to change the way we train in season but it's gonna and especially this offseason it's gonna make us take a hard look at what we do with our SNC programs, what we do with our speed programs right. in November, December, and January, as we prepare for next spring training. Um, because I think that this is only like the beginning and next year, the game can, could look dramatically different again, just because people are going to start to understand the system in which they're playing in now. Yeah, I, listen, I'm, I'm interested. Listen, obviously you count everything. I'm, I'm going to take a look as the season goes is the game overall scoring more runs, right? The guys crossing the plate more because they're out there a little bit more. I'm also wanting to see if guys are taking a bigger lead to force that throw to first, you know, guys are out nine feet, maybe 11 feet. All of a sudden they throw and all of a sudden you can manipulate that. If you're out there 14 feet, you're, you're either going to 30 or you're scoring. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So um, anyway, I don't want to take up all your time. I know your time is valuable, but I just, those, those are fun little intricacies of the game that I always loved. And uh and I, and I think too, and, and I, I'll, I'll hijack a little bit more of this as well as like, we're all, we're all strength coaches at heart, right? Like we all want to be in the weight room. We all want to get under iron. We want to, we want to be able to, to move heavy things, pick heavy things up off the ground. Super important, right? The baseball had kind of went that way where the game was slow. We had a lot of time in between pitches. I'm going to ramp up and throw as hard as I can. I'm going to swing as hard as I can at this pitch. Right. And because of that, because of just the rule changes of the game, the way that we have to think as strength coaches, I think, is dramatically going to be different uh, in, in that regard. And, and that's going to change all the way to how we draft players, how we draft yeah. high school players, how we draft college players, how we make acquisitions you know, of, of current professional players. So this isn't just a change of major league baseball so if you're a youth strength coach if you're a high school strength coach if you're a college strength coach remember like pro scouts and and amateur scouts are going to be looking at acquiring players that have a certain skill set that fit the style of game that the organization plays and really just fit the style which the the game is going and so we're going to be making these changes just like Trackman, Rapsodo, Blast Motion, yeah. all these different products changed the way that we coached at the youth level. And 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 I say that because I have three young boys. We're going to be changing because of that. So there's going to be a lot of good content on here. So thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate your help as always. And and, and this is obviously going to go great. Thank you. I listen, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your leadership. I think things are going in the right direction. Uh 
Uh, th this man can handle a, a lot of things at once. I'll tell you that. So, so, so Brandon's impressed me over the years. I appreciate your time. I look forward to seeing you. You know, in a couple of weeks, you'll yep. be down here in the in the great state of Florida. We'll be in Tampa, you know, and uh, get a chance to maybe come out and watch the the Dodgers uh, play against those Rays. But uh, listen, I, I appreciate it. I'm going to introduce Frank Velasquez now. He's going to be our host. He's the one who's going to ask all those uh, riveting questions to to our presenters when the time comes. Uh, Frank is, I'll just, you know, keep it short. He can pop on. One thing I love to say about Frank, he's our, uh, gold medal winning team USA in 2017. Uh, love to say that. And, uh, Brandon, I appreciate your time, but here's Frank. Frank's can to, uh, introduce Lee and the rest of our people. I'm going to back out and make sure things run smooth from the other side. But, uh, I look forward to, to watching how the game is changing, uh, in front of our eyes. So. Take it away, Frankie. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning. Good morning to all the attendees and all the presenters. Uh, my name is Frank Velasquez, the Director of Sports Performance for the Allegheny Health Network here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, and a 16-year veteran of Major League Baseball, professional baseball as an athletic trainer and strength coach. Uh, pleasure to be here. Matt, this is our, what, third or fourth year? I th think one thing that came from our, our pandemic that we all went through is is uh, this remote type of webinar is really was around, but I think it's it's uh, it's more frequent now, and and it's a way for our PBS CCS to to disseminate some of our quality content and premium content um, to all of our membership and all the the people in the industry throughout not only the country but the world. Um, thanks for having me as always. And a great supporter of our of our group. We have a we have a, a tight brotherhood. I see some of our uh, people like Matt and I on uh, Dr. Gene Coleman, who was one of the pioneers of the position, uh, spent over 40 years in the game as a strength and conditioning specialist in professional baseball. And Alan Thomas, who's still one of the top coaches in the country, spent, I think, 25 years plus with the Chicago White Sox. So thanks, boys, for jumping on. Um, yeah, it, it, this is great. Uh, I am going to introduce Lee. Um, our Q&A, Matt mentioned, we will do Q&A at the very end of the webinar. So you can shoot your questions in. I will take them down and then we will ask them at the end, all of our presenters. Um, first up, as Matt said, is, is Lee Fiocchi. Uh, Lee is, uh, is uh, like Matt and, and I, uh, a veteran of, of pro baseball, Major League Baseball. He was with the Anaheim Angels for a number of years. And he's also the founder of Dynamic Sports Training. Uh, one of his facilities are in Houston, Texas, and um, he was also affiliated, did some work with the University of Houston as a uh, part of their team, their baseball strength conditioning staff. Uh, Lee is a leader in the industry of athletic development. There's much more I can say about him. He's a very humble person. He's a very smart practitioner, and um, I'm going to let him explain his journey uh, to where, to how he got to where he is now. And then uh, we'll roll into his first presentation for the, the day, which is titled, Is Speed Really the Need? So, Lee, I'm going to hand it off to you. And, awesome. Uh, yeah, man, get after it. Lee Fios. Uh, I appreciate you, Frank. Uh, I don't know if you want to look at my ugly face because I don't have the ability to, to start the video quite yet. But um, it, is, it is very humbling to be able to be in a position where I can share information but um you know first off i kind of really want to take you through um dst uh where i'm at currently and talk about just um dst in general and um just my journey through strength and conditioning so here we are showing my ugly mug this is the hole this is the den this is a lot the place where you know we need to relax you know we're serving athletes and so uh, this is the office. I'm going to flip it around and kind of show you this uh, gym that I have here. So this is D what we call DST West. We uh, have a partnership with um, Houston Christian High School. Uh, so this is actually a high school that you're looking at. Okay, These stairs, I'll take you up in a little bit. Here's the weight room. And here's the cables, the dumbbell rack. Um, 
square footage wise, this blueprint is just about 10,000 square feet. Uh, in terms of usable square footage, we have 7,700 plus, okay? Obviously there's a racks, don't need to go into expl explanations, platforms. You know, one of the unique things uh, about working in a private high school is that sometimes we have access to some really nice things. Uh, this is the great state of Texas. And so there's always a, a arms race. So they're always trying to one up uh, one another. So we're fortunate to be a part of this uh, arms race and be able to have this facility. But uh, within this rack, we'll also have, um, we operate with the athlete management system, the fit management system. And so we're able to put our iPads on here and, and uh, display the workouts to the kids. We have the big screen up here where we're also displaying workouts or showing them video. Um, so then that way they can um, also get some feedback, not just from coaches. So for me in particular, I am uh, since uh, stepping away from the LA Angels, uh, I stepped back into my business full time and uh, have really stepped into a role where I'm facilitating Houston Christian High School. Uh, this is a partnership that we entered, you know, shortly after starting my business um, in 2008. So it was September of 2008 that we started to develop this relationship. Um, I would say it's the start of uh, the start of a, a career that was really humbling. So like I'm showing you these really nice facilities, but I'm going to kind of take you back through show you some things here, but like more so of like the beginning of, you know, how DSD started, but we have two practice fields out here. Okay. We have this 60 foot sand pit uh, that really helps us uh, take impact off of players that are coming back from injury. We have this hill 30 yards on one side uh, and then uh, uh, 12 yards on the other side. And then as I take you back through here, we have our main football field. And then, um, which you can't see of tennis courts back there. And then you have a, an additional field that's uh, allocated towards soccer, uh, lacrosse. So um, there's four fields that we have access to that um, gives us a really wide, um, wide uh, opportunities to train, you know, multiple athletes or multiple um, sports. Uh, we're heading back over here gymnasium this where i'm taking you here is actually going to be like the original weight room okay so you're going to see the original weight room a couple hundred square feet this is the office here dsd office so you look at this so this was the original weight room here okay and so we had just gotten here now this is a, a little wall here. We are able to put up our in our offices, but just a couple hundred square feet, the original weight room. Um, we operated out of here in the second weight room. So when we got here, um, you know, they started to expand. The cool thing about DST is like, so here's one of our first pro athletes. His name's Keith Heinrich. And so um, what's special about what we've been able to cultivate in terms of relationships is that we are now training uh, Keith son and daughter his daughter has actually been a, a competitive swimmer and um, she is now a uh, 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 water polo so i guess she got tired of swimming in the lanes and wanted to be more like her dad and get a hold of the people and try to drown them so she's doing water polo she's one of the top high school water players in the country uh, another cool connection is that we have that water polo near us in uh, anaheim so I've been able to develop a relationship with Tim Pelote. And so that relationship with Tim is cool because he oversees the women's water polo team. And so just last week I saw Tim as they were flying out to uh, um, Europe over in Holland uh, to go compete. Um, but it was really neat to kind of see how things kind of come full circle within our, you know, training opportunities. So one of my original football guys uh, training his daughter who's uh, in some capacity uh, working with Tim, who I got to know through the angels. So as we walk back into the weight room, I'm gonna take you upstairs, okay? We have the second story. And the second story here brings us to this turf area. 
and this is obviously where we can get some prep work going on, get some warm up. Uh, we do a lot of our sled uh, speed uh, profiling up here. Uh, obviously, with weather, it's very unpredictable in Houston. So just being able to have this space. We also have dynamic sports therapy. Stephen Islas talking about relationships it took about 10 years before we really were able to find someone that could, you know, serve our athletes in the same capacity in the way that we serve them through strength and conditioning. So who do we serve this school? There's 500 student athletes at this school. It's academics first. So we're not actually having uh, we're not actually really recruiting kids heavily uh, from a from a sport side, so they there's a heavy academic side. So um, the cool thing about working with athletes that um, more or less have a greater desire to pursue uh, their careers in academics. The the neat thing about that is that it gets you to that place where you got to learn how to motivate people for different reasons. So. Um, they're in here and they want to be around their friends. And so we're always trying to look for ways to help develop them. With a lot of my young coaches, I like to uh, tell them that, you know, we may not be making the athlete better, but they're making us better. Uh, athletes that really challenge you and athletes that like may not really fall on the, the genetic side of things. They may not fall in the category of being uh you know, overly qualified in speed, strength, or power that we do have an opportunity to develop those qualities in them. So that's a very unique uh, in terms of the other uh, serving other people within uh, DST West. We have uh, pro football. Kyle Clemens, our director of uh, pro football. Uh, he's in here training right now. One of his guys. He's been with us for 10 years. Uh, like I said, DS uh, therapy. Uh, Stephen Islas has been with us the last four years, uh, serving in that capacity. Uh, Hayden Letts, who you'll hear from a little bit later, uh, he operates with our um, with our pro uh, baseball population, has a lot of contacts with a lot of our minor league strength and conditioning coaches and, and coordinators at that level. And then we uh, serve that high school, middle school. Uh, Noah Brogdon is a guy that handles that. And so that looks like after school training for um, you know, athletes of all sports. And so the other unique component, obviously, is that, you know, similar to like college strength and conditioning, you're working with sports, uh, field hockey, lacrosse, uh, working with a lot of different sports. Uh, the beauty of working with young athletes is that you really are trying to build a foundation. And we're talking about physical literacy. And so um, the training's great. All those things are great. But you recognize some players uh, lack it between the ears. So just being able to help them. Uh, along that path is great. Uh, we we uh, try to connect them through some of our mindset uh, principles, try to talk about our physical principles consistently. And then we also want to integrate some of that nutrition. So on this last thing here, when you come in, we just want to give these guys a little bit of a sound bite. We'll sit there, uh, go over these things uh, that we believe that can help them, uh, you know, equip them. So teaching them the how and the why, we want to encourage them. Uh, most of them uh, need encouragement from a positive uh, direction. And then uh, third, we want to empower them to, to where they can coach other people. And so um, that's a big part of us really um, applying our values is, is taking them through that trigger focus and teaching them, you know, just a little bit more about like why they do what they do. Hey, Lee, this is Frank. What's up, Frank? Hey, a couple questions before we get into your presentation, man. Awesome facility. Um, the, the model you have, are you training teams at one time or individuals from teams or both? How do you do that? Yeah, so um, everything. So we, uh, we manipulate the, the schedule. So we just all those things operate in one. So we'll have uh, one on one clients in here. So, uh, you know, some of your high end guys, like uh, obviously guys that maybe have, have the, the guaranteed contracts, those guys typically like to work in one on one environments. So we're training these guys one on one in here. Uh, most of our pro group training happens in small groups. Uh, 
where there's anywhere from like six to maybe 15 guys. And then, um, you know, depending on our location, our North location has a, a lot of baseball players. We operate out of a baseball facility. So there's all the fields and, and hitting cages and, and uh, uh, areas to throw bullpens in. So they have like more of a flow of, of groups that come in and out that are staggered. Um, and then when it comes to the high school, we'll train the football team. So I'll have upwards of like 50 to 60 kids in here at one time. Uh, then when it comes to most other team sports, it's usually about, you know, between 30 and 15 athletes per team. Uh, the other thing that, that really helps you develop range is like you literally get kids that have never sniffed a weight room. And so just trying to organize them uh, within a classroom setting and getting them to where they can operate in a place where they're, they're not putting themselves at risk. Um, and so that's, it's a fun challenge to get, you know, your senior and your freshman, freshman that's never sniffed a weight room and a senior that's actually might be advanced in their physical qualities. Um, so it, 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 yeah, the, the groups go from, you know, small to big uh, and everything in between. Very nice. A uh, couple of metric measurements or questions. The, the incline on your hill, uh, mm -hmm. I know Maddie had a hill when he was with Cincinnati and, and with the Yanks. Do you know the the incline on the front side of your hill? And is it different from the incline on the back? Yeah, there's two different inclines. Um, it's been a while since we built those. It was just a pile of dirt. And so we were able to get them to resurface it when they built out the track about maybe seven years ago. Um, the exact inclines, I'm not too sure. Uh, but it, you know, in terms of, of incline, we do not do overspeed on them. Uh, they're, they're strictly for um, what I would just say resistance. So just uh, allowing, um, allowing guys to be able to work on, you know, uh, at foot contact, creating that stiffness in the ankle. So you're in more dorsiflex position. So I want to say they're like less than 15 degrees uh, incline and that there is a difference between the front of the hill that's uh, 30 yards and the back side of the hill that's almost 15 yards. Um, but yeah, they're, they're primarily put there for, like I said, more resistance, uh, controlling velocity of movement. So now um, when we wanna still run at high intensity, we're still controlling the overall speed of the sprint. And so that gives us a couple progressions uh, before we actually go to our full speed sprints on flat ground. Um, really good for us early off season. We're still don't have very much time, but you wanna, you know, like I said, intensity is important, but if we can control velocity, Obviously, we're able to manipulate uh, how much force the body's having to absorb at each of those foot contacts. Very good. Well, with that, um, I'm going to uh, transition us. Matt will transition us into your presentation. Lee, outstanding uh, tour, man. Thank you for taking the time and, and uh, showing us your awesome facility and explaining the, the, uh, the business model of, of dynamic sports training. Um, so up, up now is Lee's presentation, is speed really the need? Thanks, Frank, Lee. One, yeah, one thing, uh, it's got, so we have five different locations that have all five different models. And so if any of the guys are interested in, in having conversations about like how they, um, how they can do business, I'd be more than happy to, to follow up with them and, and kind of just go over some, most of the mistakes. And that's why I say it's humbling is that there's more mistakes that I've made than, than things that I've done right. And so I've, I have learned that um, it's not about being right, it's, it's about getting things right. And so we're just always looking to get things right. And uh, just also just with this group, uh, it's a pretty special group, just being having been a part of the PBS CCS, just wanting to see guys be successful, not just you know for their teams and organizations, but you know how they can advance their families and put themselves in a position where they can have not just a job, but they can have a career in this field. So that's a that's a passion of mine and a big reason why I step back into my business. So I appreciate you, Frank. Appreciate the time. Look forward to chatting it up afterwards. Love it, Lee. What a great resource for us. And I think I'm hoping some people on here take advantage of it. Yep. Thanks a lot. What's up, fam? What's up? Pro Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society is a special group of individuals. They're a true testament to loyalty and dedication within a profession. And I am honored for this opportunity to present. It was wrapping up my second spring training 
My wife had packed herself and my two daughters into her SUV in my truck. She managed to get the girls some Taco Bell, and I kindly obliged and ate the leftovers. From Tempe, we hit the road to Anaheim. Along the way, we hit McDonald's drive through and kept trucking. My wife, Crystal, does a wonderful job finding places for us to stay that are economical. She had engineered for us to stay at this Airbnb for one night before, we ha ha before having to stay at a second Airbnb for a week. That way, we can time up our stay in our third Airbnb for the remainder of the season. Needless to say, we were rolling into an unknown neighborhood pretty late at night, and I soon recognized that I had a load brewing in my belly, and I needed to find the apartment ASAP. I pulled over the car and called my wife to, to, to the truck, rolled down my window, and told her that we needed to find this apartment ASAP because I was about to crap my pants. Immediately from the back of the truck, my three-year-old repeats, dad is gonna crap his pants. And the instant I started laughing, I started unloading. Thank God for the team issued sliders. They kept it in as I waddled to the apartment and found the shower. You may wonder why I tell this story. Two reasons. One, we put our families through a lot of crappy situations. And secondly, I want to make you laugh in case this presentation stinks. Is speed really the need? StatCast shows us that we got guys that we can enjoy watching and seeing speed on display. Bobby Witt Jr., Shohei Otani, Trey Turner, Byron Buxton, Mike Trout, so on and so forth. In this overview, we're gonna cover construction zone, critical windows, age. We're gonna hear from the directors at DST the, across the five locations, three in Houston, one in San Antonio, and then in Arizona. We're gonna connect on ground contact times, the demand of baseball and time to wrap things up. Our conversations are a construction zone. We can build people up or we can demolish them with our words. I believe most of us have had relationships with our parents where we can still think about words that they said that still are with us today. When it comes to relationships and our athletes, I want you to ask that question of like, what are these, what are their goals? Because oftentimes when we start thinking or talking about goals, we can start to establish if that athlete is more outcome oriented or more process oriented. I think that we all <clears throat> would like to think that we're, you know, process oriented, but we where we qu quickly realize is that we're definitely um, influenced by what people think of us and our performance and our results. And so that's something that's just constantly in our face. And <clears throat> it's one of the things that I learned most in, in baseball is that uh, we often uh, times uh, lose our process because we are being impacted by those influences outside of our control. And I would say that the word confidence is not a word I was familiar with prior to working with baseball players. Uh, I believed in, in self-belief and, um, you know, it just wasn't anything more than just believing in yourself. And when a good mentor of mine uh, gave me a new definition of confidence, when he, he, he had told me that it's predictability, that it started to make sense. And when we start talking about predictability, if, if predictability is high, my, my confidence is high. If my predictability is low, my confidence is going to be low. And it's important that when we're, we have these positions, when we have this low confidence that, that we're not letting our feelings or emotions dictate what we do, because the key is to reestablish or establish healthy patterns. Uh, so often uh, we just operate so autonomously that, that we don't um, forget that the key component to have an autonomy is, is actually ac accountability. So that's what we get wrong about autonomy is that we can't have autonomy without accountability. Um, and that's why relationships are so important. 
Uh, obviously, I'm speaking from more of a professional level, um, you know, grown men and relationships that you have with them, uh, that you actually have to get permission from, from them to be able to hold, help hold them accountable. And it's important to, to recognize how they're operating. If they are operating more on motivation, we're knowing that those feelings, okay, are going to come and go. And we got to be able to point them to developing certain disciplines. And uh, in that, uh, it's important also to know the, some of those key drivers, which are typically um, money and family and understanding the, the motivations, uh, the intrinsic versus extrinsic. I find many of the professional athletes being intrinsically motivated by competition, but so often a lot of the preparation um, isn't something that they inherently are competitive uh, with. And so we, we need to not necessarily make them competitive, but we need to help them establish, you know, the disciplines or the desire, the joy in doing the work. Uh, I feel like it's important part to ask questions to help them identify what their biggest challenges may be to being consistent and how they can establish and apply certain disciplines or accountability that are going to help them overcome those times that they're uh, not motivated or demotivated. Uh, Lastly, I'd say that, you know, identifying, you know, athletes' beliefs and the reason why they believe what they believe. Uh, athletes were, you know, they had a strong influence by, you know, who they are raised by. And that would probably be the story for most of them. But if you're not understanding, like, how they are raised and why they believe what they believe, it's, it's going to be hard to find ways to build them up. And oh, we often hear the saying, you, you can't lead you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. Well, I disagree. I think you can lead a horse to water, um, but we need to find what makes them thirsty. And what makes people thirsty is is actually salt. And so what is, what is that athlete's salt? And now I, I do want to leave you with this and remind you that what you learn on the training side is almost useless if you're not relating to your athletes. And that's why I want to leave you with what I started with. Our conversations are a construction zone. We can build them up or we can demolish them with our words. The two most important windows to train speed happen at six to nine years old. Now, this is work that was done by Esteban Bali and Wei and adaptation to training and optimal trainability. The females are always on the lower end of this. Their girls uh, are typically, in terms of their central nervous system, that they're more coordinated um, than most boys. And so on this early one, it's six to eight years old, that females are have this window to develop coordination. Uh, oftentimes we're training this coordination through sport. So jumping, running, throwing, catching, kicking, all that good stuff is happening through sport. So it's not necessarily happening from, from a speed sprint uh, technique standpoint. It's typically not being trained uh, with intentionality. Now, the, the boys, it's going to be that seven, eight, nine range. And um, when we start talking about the boys, uh, they just have that tendency to be a little bit later than the girls when it comes to the coordination. That second window, it falls between that 11 and 16 years old. And what's important to understand about this 11 to 16 is that we're skeletally immature, but yet they're going through these uh, growth um, periods. And so in those, uh, we want to, to stabilize um, their coordination patterns as their body's kind of like uh, um, growing. And so oftentimes we can see people lose coordination. So we want to re-coordinate those movements. The females follow that 11 to 14 timeline, give or take two years. And the boys are that 13 to 16, give or take two years. I often say there's a third window for like these late bloomers. You can see people that can still coordinate patterns um, later on. Um, after that, now when we're talking about the professional athlete, the college athlete, 
typically the, the junior senior age, it's going to take some very specific work to uh, reorganize the body uh, and re-coordinate the body. So what we mean by being critical windows, it just means they're sensitive to that development and coordination of speed, and we want to take advantage of that. Age. The three gentlemen that I'm standing by are all guys that are 30 plus. As we age, we need to train smarter, not harder. An epidemiology study in Major League Baseball players states that athletes 30 plus are more susceptible to lower body injuries. And I would probably say that the majority of athletes 30 plus are probably more prone to lower body injuries. I feel like the Wall Street Journal, which analyzed three games in 2013 and found that 90% of the game is spent standing around, really summarizes you know, one of the bigger challenges within baseball is that so much of the game is standing around. And as you know, as you accumulate more innings, that um, ability to, to accept forces uh, becomes more challenging. And so even though sprint and sprinting, we know that our forces are significantly higher, the loads are being distributed over a greater area. Um, but we have to have more of that acceptance, the ability to accept those forces. Now, when we look at standing, uh, slow load is, is manifesting in the feet and calves. And when we have the 90% of the game, which is either standing or sitting, um, it, it makes it difficult to be able to uh, handle the high intensity movements. Uh, I would say that the the what you would want to to do in order to uh, minimize or reduce that risk is that uh, a body in motion stays in motion, and that's where I said that we need to train smarter, not harder. And later on, I'll cover exactly how we will do that. DST North is going to show you a drill that's going to help you improve your start. Hi, all. My name is Jason McCormack. Out here at DST North, we're in the premises of Premier Baseball Texas out in Tomball. Here I manage the high school after school group program and also assist with the professional baseball offseason directed by Kevin Poppy. Today I'll be demonstrating our crossover series, which we like to introduce at the beginning of our offseason. It is a good way to get our players and athletes utilized to change the direction before really amping up the intensity. So to start, the athletes will perform single crossovers. Our athletes will perform four to five reps, emphasizing lateral power of the inside leg through full extension and landing back under their hips. This will allow a better body position for an athlete to come out of their break in a faster, more explosive manner. For our next exercise, we have our next progression, which is a double crossover. This is essentially down and back. A good point of emphasis here is to maintain a positive swing angle in the direction of the next cut. Depending on what an athlete needs, you can change the amount of the drill to focus on quickness or ground force output. Next in our series, we got our triple crossovers. When doing our triple crossovers, athletes will perform two to three reps per set. Typically, after three reps, we notice a tendency for athletes to lose a bit of their form. Just like the double crossovers, you can always change the amount of the drill to be quickness or ground force output. One way we like to add competition in our training setting is adding a reactionary component to drills when possible. As seen, the athlete on the right will lead while the athlete on the left will try his best to keep up. Adding a little competition in a large group setting is a good way to ensure our athletes stay fully engaged. This is critical towards the end of the off season when athletes are over their training and just want to play their sport. As we keep progressing this series, we will incorporate other planes of motion. For example, here we have our athletes performing a crossover to a drop step into a lateral shuffle and ending with a short burst. There are many ways we like to progress our crossover series to really ensure our athletes are prepared for the demands of their sport. A biggest suggestion when incorporating drills like the crossover series is to get creative. All in all, the crossover series is a simple way to incorporate some good change of direction work in a training session that can be easily progressed in many ways.
Here we have DST San Antonio taking us through high school in-season training in small spaces. Hi guys, I'm Evan Wagner. I'm the Director of Sports Performance at DST San Antonio. Today I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how we work with our baseball and softball population in regards to speed training, um, keeping in mind some of the space limitations, um, and then also how we use it as a way for them to recover after starts, after pens, after games in general. So right now we're in in-season and we've been working on maintaining some of the qualities that we've built over the off-season with a lot of our athletes. So the power, the speed, the agility, everything that we've been working on, uh, we also want them to uh, maintain as the season goes on. So we're working on those drills in season. We're keeping volume in a way where they can handle it and they're able to recover in between their games, not be too sore. We're moving in multiple directions forward, backward, side to side, um, just getting them in positions where they might not always be in games, but then also trying to have that correlate with how they actually perform in the games. So one of the things we're doing is creating high intensity work, but keeping the volume low so they can recover well, uh, but still have a good time, get better, stay healthy. And so in this video, I'm gonna show you guys some of the work that we do uh, versus just running conditioning all the time and trying to get people recovering in that way. We're actually finding ways to help them improve stay healthy uh, on top of their slower mobility work and everything, but also keep them fast as the season goes on. So I'm gonna run you guys through some of our video, uh, some of the clips that we have of drills that we like to do with our athletes and how we kind of progress that, start a little more light work, uh, plyometric, head into a little more um, aggressive sprint work, and then um, work, work in from there, depending on what our focus is for the day. We emphasize intensity as a big thing. A lot of kids want to look cool or maybe they just don't understand the value of that. So we emphasize them giving it what they, the best they can give in those drills, having high focus and having good quality with the way they do things. Um, so again, with space considerations, uh, scaling drills can be valuable. If you have like a T-test, just shorten it up, get them some of the same movements, just understand that like you might not always have the best room, but you can still get a lot of good work done. And go. Got to really work that stick. Seventy five. Hundred. Go. Stop. Back. Stop. Back. Wow. Here we have DST Arizona going over our max velocity training brought to you by Rick Gannon. Welcome to DST Arizona. We're going to talk about max velocity today. Uh, max velocity is the top end speed that you can get throughout or through running. We assess maximum velocity. There's a couple different ways, but we here like to use the flying 10 with different build ins and different fly distances. In the weight room to train for max velocity, we do a couple of things such as um, sprint position, specific isometrics, like a spring ankle. Go. Some other things we like to do are more ballistic lifts, barbell jumps, clean or Olympic lift variations, trap bar pulls, et cetera. Go. Okay. You're good. 
Yep, two more. We also like to use plyometrics in the vertical plane. So some of these could be single leg bounds, skips for height, um, anything training to be elastic out on the field or in the weight room. Higher, higher, higher. We also like to use a lot of drills to make sure that the technique for um, max velocity is correct. So we like to use wickets to correct form. We like to use angling drills, prime times, high knees, um, similar technique drills such as those. Then we get into the actual training of the adaption of maximum velocity where we use flying tens. Um, we increase the build to give you more time to build up to hit that speed. And then after increasing the build, we'll increase the actual distance of the fly. So say a flying 15 with a 25 yard build, or we could even build more distance, more building. GST South will be taking us through minimalist speed training. Hi, how's it going? My name is Ryan Henry, and I am here at DST South in Houston, Texas. I am the assistant director where I help facilitate our pro baseball offseason, as well as facilitating our middle school and high school group in the after school group, as well as uh, the volleyball training that we do over at Houston Cellar Volleyball Club over in Pasadena. Today, I'm going to highlight some drill work and uh, how we can maximize sprint training in a short amount of space. Uh, as you see behind me here, we really only have about, about 10 yards, really. Uh, whenever you break down, you have enough room for the deceleration process. Um, I'm going to highlight a couple drills that we like to utilize here at DST South uh, and how we can maximize the drill work and the force production in a sense of running with 10 yard splits. The first drill I would like to highlight in our, our, our drill work that we have here, uh, we were working on an acceleration process, which is a lot of front side mechanics. Um, we're going to have the athlete have a PVC pipe starting on their back and they're going to uh, raise their leg up in a flex position. A lot of athletes, a common mistake is that their foot will be in front of the knee, the toe will be pointed down, and they'll have the backside, the downside uh, collapsed in a bent position. Although there is a little bit of knee flexion, uh, whenever we do sprint, we want to try and maximize our stiffness and ground contact time that way we can produce the most force possible. Here we'll have the athlete correct the form. She will bring her foot back underneath the knee. The toe will be pointed up in dorsiflexion and we wanna have a stiff backside on the, on the bottom leg and having the heel slightly off the ground. The athlete will then jump and switch legs while punching the ground simultaneously, uh, switching the legs as you continue to go. You can do this in place or we can do this while we bounce, which is the further progression from the A switch. Here the athlete will do five single reps where they're working on punching the ground and staying nice and tall and stiff. In the next progression, we'll do a double. We will start with the other leg up. As the athlete does a double switch, they're working on punching the ground and keeping a, a stiff ankle. That way the heel does not strike the ground. As we go through a series of progression, we usually do three to five reps on the doubles. And here we will progress to a triple, where the triple is a quick switch, a one, two, three punch, as they're continuing to go, in, go into the ground. And again, trying to punch the ground as hard as they can that way, whenever we do result into a sprint, they have the same force production as possible. The last thing I would really like to highlight is our resisted sprinting. We use the extra genie that helps us uh, add load to the sprints. The load is gonna allow them to get into the correct acceleration form. As you see, if it's too light, they will be more upright and more of the max velocities uh, sprint stance, which is not what we're trying to achieve here. We want a good forward lean. That way, whenever they are running, they are pushing behind them and producing force forward. A lot of athletes that you see will not be able to move this. And I do want this heavy to some degree. Now, the reason why I don't do sled sprints here at the facility is the matter of flow. The flow is super important whenever we come to athletes 
in here, having 15 to 20 athletes at a time, it tends to get a little bit packed. And so I have to maximize the efficiency of the drill work with the sprints, as well as managing how many people are doing what at what time. So the extra genie and other drills are great ways that we can, we can utilize uh, sprinting here in a, in a small space. Uh, the extra genie generally goes for a heavy sprint, which I want to have them run. Uh, if we are timing on a laser, uh, I want them to run generally a two, well, basically two times their normal sprint speed. Um, and usually I will set up the laser at 10 yard distance and we will time those and we will continue to increase force from there. As they get on through the week, I want to decrease the amount of weight for lighter loads. That way they can produce more force in a lighter way and run faster. Generally, we will go from heavy to medium to a non-resisted load, um, where we will eventually set up lasers and time their 10-yard starts, and that way we can see what their numbers are. As you know, there are many ways that you can do drill work as well as sprint work. And again, we're just trying to maximize our uh, sprinting abilities in a short amount of space. Again, I only have about 10 yards of true running room uh, with close to 10 yards of a breakdown before they need to decelerate into the wall. Load velocity sled profiling brought to you by DST West. Hi, my name is Hayden Letts and I'm the director of operations here at DST West and I handle our pro baseball offseason training. One method we use for speed development is sled push and pull variations based off the load velocity profiling research from Michael Cahill. This research basically showed that there's a linear relationship between percent velocity decrease and the load applied relative to their athlete's body weight. To develop a load velocity profile for an athlete, we started testing with a flying five yard sprint with 20 yard buildup. After that, we move into resisted flying five yard sprints with a 10 yard buildup. Once we have all that data, we'll plug it into our spreadsheet that we developed. That will tell us which loads correspond to which percent velocity decreases and what times the athlete needs to achieve on the lasers based on what distance we're working at during our training. The research originally lays out a periodization that's 16 weeks long in four week blocks. It starts with four weeks of heavy sled pushes over five yards at 85% decrease in velocity twice a week. It then moves into four weeks of a chest toe, 75% velocity decrease over seven and a half yards, four weeks of a hip toe at 50% decrease in velocity over 15 yards, and then four weeks of hip toe again, this time at 25% decrease in velocity over 25 yards. At DST, we've made some adaptations over the years. We'll stick with the first four weeks of heavy pushes followed by four weeks of chest toe because we found that the position the athletes are in during those two exercises correspond to the positions that are in during the start of their sprint and their early acceleration phase. When we go through our sled sessions, there's two ways we can normally do it. The first is as a part of our pre-lift acceleration work, where we'll go through, say, a heavy sled push and then pair that with a potentiation exercise, like a half kneeling broad jump, um, and that would be time. The second option would be during the athlete's lift. Um, this would normally be in the second half of the week where they've already done their time session, they know what weight they should be using to coordinate to that percent velocity decrease. Um, and normally if it's during the lift, we'll pair it with either some mobility or core stability exercises uh, for active rest. When we set up for a sled push session, lasers are gonna be five yards apart with the laser line just below the top of the sled handle. That way we have a consistent target traveling with lasers on both ends. Athletes gonna set up arms extended, neutral spine, making sure that as we go and drive through the ground, we will step foot on contact. We've got a low shin angle. We're going to achieve full extension to the hip, knee, and ankle. As that leg swings back up, we're keeping a low heel recovery for that next step. So it's going to be on that as we go. Making sure we're driving all the way through the laser. That way we're not slowing down early. Coach will read out the athlete's time. If the athlete's time is more than two tenths of a second faster than their target time, we're going to increase the weight by about 20 to 30 pounds for the next rep. Demands of position players and Shohei Otani sprinting. Greatest force acceptance as an injury prevention strategy in athletic populations. The rate of force acceptance on athletic activities. We're seeing that the rate of force acceptance goes from this zero to 250 millisecond timeline. But 
where the critical timeline is important to comprehend is that within the first 30 milliseconds, we can be uh, receiving up to seven and a half times our body weight forces. We in sprinting are primarily propulsive. And so that's when we're talking about this th first 30 milliseconds of accepting forces is that it's happened pretty instantaneously, but it, it's a ton of force. Uh, where where we've a lot of times got it wrong is that we don't actually train our lower body to be able to accept forces through uh, high speed eccentric training. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we need to actually implement uh, more consistently change of direction within the training program. It's one thing to be strong, but strong um, uh, can only take you so far when your limbs are moving at at high rates of speed. Uh, our change of direction is so infre infrequent in, about in baseball, but that's not what we're trying to do. It's not the specificity in terms of trying to acquire a better skill. It's really about maintaining the tissue tolerance uh, to lengthen at high velocity. Is speed really the need? In this part of monitoring, we really just looked at sprints that were above 85% of top sprint speed. And we just saw that those, those distances, total distances in a single game were typically zero to 300 yards. And then when it came to sprints below 85% of the individual's top speed sprint speed, we saw um, distances from zero to 800 yards. So total distance, that's not very much, but as you know, the, the game and the competitiveness played day in and day out. You want to be cognizant on the consecutiveness of those days. And so we're typically seeing anywhere from three to five uh, days where you're having those high intensity sprints. So three to five high intensity sprints, typically anywhere from 20 to 40 yards at the most. Um, players are going to have um, you know, fatigue that sets in from that consecutiveness of those high intensity sprint days. And what we want to do to combat that, we want to get on the parasympathetic side of things and go with the recovery method. And so once we have those uh, days established in a row where we need to make sure that we get recovery, we're typically going to go with the uh, tried and the true of the cold tub or contrasting. And then the next day is a following that up with an aerobic circuit, making sure they're getting moving, getting the heart rate above 120, and typically moving through some mobility with some core stability. but. Uh, always making sure that our our heart rate just stays up to where we're we're breaking a sweat, spinning the blood. Uh, when it comes to helping the guys that are coming off the bench, it's really about establishing that routine that allows them to accumulate the volumes and intensities that are necessary. That if a guy does get injured, they're ready to um, perform in that day to day role. As you know, distances fluctuate player to player where balls are hit and how productive guys are at the plate. So we've just found this as being an important measure in terms of creating consistency uh, around um, speed. In this position of ground contact, you notice how Mike lands on his heel. So we have a heel toe and then we have his inside leg being that left leg landing out in front of his center mass. Uh, where we don't have a knee to knee uh, positioning. That's, that would be optimal, knee to knee. I'll show you a little bit. Um, but when it comes to base running, it is approaching the bases. It's being good base runner. Talked about uh, sprinting as being propulsive. Uh, this is the decelerative uh, component of it. So that left leg, uh, as we're rounding, is always going to be one that's decelerative. We would just want to minimize that deceleration so we can optimize uh, propulsion and being able to get from point A to point B faster. Here we're getting a professional athlete that is running curved wickets. The photo on the left shows us this uh, inside leg, this left leg at ground contact. So we're seeing it's a different athlete, different picture, different speeds, 
but you're seeing um, less of a heel toe. So we want to minimize how much heel toe we have. Uh, the knees are closer to closer. So his left knee and his right knee are closer at ground contact. And so we're minimizing the deceleration as we're taking this curve. And then on the right side, you're seeing the outside leg to right leg. And we're seeing that knee to knee. So the right knee and the left knee are next to each other. That's a position that we want to achieve at ground contact. And then you're seeing that the ball of the foot is landing. So at ground contact, the ball of the foot is landing and we are knee to knee. Uh, when we're running wickets in that outside leg, which is the right leg, just like when we're base running, when we have um, that knee to knee, we know we're in a good position. Um, when we look at the D cell, we know that the that we got to have a decelerative component with that left leg, but we want to minimize that. So we're always focusing on getting from point A to point B with more efficiency. Um, the guy that we'd want to look at in terms of understanding wickets is Vince Anderson. Uh, I would say that investing that time. Uh, and understanding wickets uh, really helps with uh, improving max velocity position. Uh, this is advanced, so it normally takes a couple off seasons to get guys to understand how to actually run wickets. Um, and then secondarily, then we start to add the specific elements of improving uh, on the base running side of things. Here, this professional athlete will perform the curved wicket I think it's important to understand that wickets are best served with athletes that are, uh, especially a baseball population, athletes that are probably uh, having uh, had some chronic hamstring issues um, and that they're, they're not comfortable getting to maximum velocity. I think that's when um, the specificity of training and, and the detail and intentionality of training uh, needs to take place. Not that it's not important. It's just you only have so much training time. And like I said before, um, those critical windows happen way earlier in their lives. And so if we're making changes to sprint posture and position, I want to be really intentional about it. Um, these guys have, have spent their lives um, sprinting in a certain position. And so um, if I'm going to intentionally improve efficiency, I want to make sure that that efficiency is working towards a common goal. And so most often when guys have had an injury history, I want to apply curve wickets or wickets and then curve wickets um, with those athletes. Serpentine tempos allow us to run about 75%, allows us to really get more efficient at negotiating those that rounding, and it also gives us the ability to round both right and left. Really enjoy using these as a, a training tool when it comes to um, negotiating the base pass. Is speed really the need? Well, when you look at baseball, you're going to see that things like the position you play, whether it's infield or outfield, catcher, that there's a greater uh, positional direction, angle, reactionary component. And absolute speed is not a, a big predictor in how productive you are as a player. Yes, it's exciting. StatCast, Bobby Witt, Shohei, Trey, Byron, Mike Trout, all those guys uh, make the game exciting. It's fun to see it on display. But when we're talking about plans for the demands of the game, we're seeing frequent, low volume, high intensity sprinting. What are we going to do in terms of adjustments in season? When we're seeing three consecutive games with three plus sprints, we're looking at getting a cold tub or contrast. And at the end of the day, the monitoring of these measurables, the ones that make sense for us, is that intensity trumps volume. Volume does make sense when we're preparing guys that are coming off the bench. We want them to have the appropriate volume to get into games when it's necessary and to sustain that over periods of time. Training is testing. 
So the things that we didn't cover, the things that are important when it comes to training the lower body in the weight room, we do we do care about um, lower body strength, but our hips are we do we have strength in flexion, hip extension, hip abduction, adduction? Are we paying attention to muscle insertion origin and, and how we transmit energy from the ground up? Are we taking care of our calves? Are we talking about aging and making sure that guys are still moving at high velocity? Um, those are important factors, but speed, in my opinion, is really not the need. To close out our time together, I'd like to encourage you to organize and plan speed within practice. Whether you're in the big leagues or the little leagues, a little, a lot goes a long way. You've invested time into learning today, but I'd also ask you to invest in some resources. Ralph Mann as a biomechanist in sprinting, Ken Clark, Ryu Nagahara, JB Morin, are great researchers to follow. And then of course, when it comes to application, Altus, the group there that are world-class track and field coaches would steer you in the right direction. And really to conclude, and in this picture, you see Tyler Skaggs, who was an athlete of mine. And as you know, people that we uh, develop close relationships with, I wanna really encourage you to not only um, spend the time with your athletes, but make sure that you're spending that time creating memories. Secondly, when it comes to time, be intentional with your family. Prioritize and create expectations that allow you to be supported and for you to be able to support your family. And then last but not least, thank you for your time today. Thank you for investing in yourselves and putting in the time to get better. Thank you, Lee and team. Outstanding presentation. A lot of takeaway points there. Uh, next on the docket is Dr. Stephanie Wilson. Dr. Wilson is a nationally recognized sports dietitian, a uh, degree, in, a master's of science degree in, in food science and human nutrition and sp with sports nutrition emphasis from the University of Florida. Dr. Wilson has worked with the, the um, Toronto Blue Jays, as well as the University of Florida and um, the head nutrition, the head nutritionist at IMG Academy. She is a level three um, ISAC instructor, one of the few in the in the United States, and also has experience with DEXA bioimpedance analysis, as well as bod pod training uh, testing. She's worked with over hundreds of professional athletes from all the professional sports, NBA, NFL, MLB, PGA, as well as uh, Olympic gold medal winners and first round draft picks. Uh, Dr. Wilson is an accomplished researcher having published in multiple high impact peer reviewed journals. Uh, she resides in Tampa, Tampa, Florida, where she provides sports nutrition and uh, nutrition education to individuals and teams um, as, and practitioners through her company called SOS Nutrition. Uh, Dr. Wilson is speaking today on managing sleep and stress nutrition implement, uh, implement implications. All right, Dr. Wilson, take it away. Hi, I'm Stephanie Wilson, and I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, we are going to go through managing sleep and stress and some nutrition strategies to really focus on this for our elite uh, athletes and players today. I do want to thank the PBS CCS for having me today, and I'm also joined by my colleague Christian Vaccaro, uh, who's in the performance domain as well with the cognitive specialist technician, and I will move to that at the end. Okay, I have no financial disclaimers, um, no connections to disclose with any companies either today. So let's get started. When we think about performance in this achievement-oriented world of sports, where the difference between fame and shame is measured in milliseconds or millimeters, the slightest improvement may be significant for the competitive athlete. And that was one of the first times I, I remember reading this. The bottom line is that 
the difference between first and last place in that elite and professional setting is less than 1%. And as members of the human performance team, we are focusing on finding that performance improvement and intervention that represent that 1% difference to adapt the influence of training and genetics and all the different components to improve performance. Well, to give a little background first, uh, when it comes to improving performance, the road to increase performance starts with a stressor. This is known as the general adaptation syndrome uh, that began with Hans Selye, uh, who was a Canadian endocrinologist. Um, he is today, he's fondly known as the father of stress. And his theory started first with the alarm state. And in this alarm state, your body reacts to stress. The sympathetic ner the nervous system is stimulated here, as well as the HPA access. Uh, in stage two, we see resistance, and this is a, an adaptation to stress. There is sustained release of cortisol to manage that stress and to handle whatever stress we've experienced. And then in phase three, uh, we, with prolonged cortisol release, our body um, doesn't have the resources to handle the stressor anymore, and it becomes depleted from those resources. As a result of this, our immune system is also weakened. And what you see is this um, stress is a nonspecific response of the body to any demand um, that's placed on it. And it can be psychological, physical, or an environmental stress that can induce this response. Um, so we're going to have a deeper dive into stress um, that not all stress is bad. And some forms of stress are life-saving. Uh, that's what stimulates the fight or flight system. And some are even addictive in nature. Um, but this will change the perspective of whether it's considered a good stressor, which is a stress, or a bad stressor, which is a de-stressor or distress when, when we're overloaded. Um, ultimately, we want to consider the reward system in place following the activation of the fight or flight system. So some activities that you may enjoy, like um, things that are really stimulating, they can also pay or promote an increase to this, um, this experience. And Additionally, some stressors can be equally both good and bad stressors on your choices, such as um, physical training or uh, just our general emotional stress. And when you think about this same graph, um, I want you to think about it from a perspective of adaptation. So when it comes to adapting, um, once that initial stressor of the training is put on it, we'll see in performance improvements as we um, have that adapt to that stress. And those are things like endurance, neural, uh, neural changes, and also adaptations as muscle growth. Um, if we have a period of more, more training volume or load or intensity, uh, sometimes known as functional overreaching, then you can actually pull back. Uh, when you have too much, then you pull back and it's taper recovery. And this can cause a rebound effect, which you'll see an important performance improvement. So that's more um, right around that orange period, the, the peak of that. Um, so as we move along, see if I can get a cursor here. I'm not sure if you guys can see this. But um, over here on the uh, orange, as we as we this is where I was talking about us pulling back with the overreaching. So we would overreach and then pull back and we would see performance continue to go up. Now, if for example, we don't have enough recovery, um, then, and our recovery doesn't align, we can experience overtraining, which leads to this downward spiral. And this is what we would consider to be um, an exhaustion or fatigue, some type of overload of the stress system. And ultimately, when there is stress, um, stress is evident as a root cause of multifacet of issues. Um, and it's a sign of what we call sympathetic dominance, which uh, Christian will talk more on. And the fight or flight system is better known as, um, as and affiliated as the sympathetic nervous system response. Careers that are filled with continual stress will inevitably be affiliated with the sympathetic dominance unless 
we have chosen to purposefully develop that parasympathetic response. <clears throat> so um, what happens in this? So you'll notice some of these things are very common that you're, you're aware of when, when we have that fight or flight response happening. Our pupils constrict, our, um, it stimulates saliva, our heartbeat. Um, oh, sorry, with the parasympathetic, that's when we're trying to calm down. We're trying uh, to rest and digest. So our pupils will constrict, our, our saliva will be stimulated, and our heartbeat will slow. This heartbeat is a key for the heart rate variability that Christian will talk about soon. Um, some of the, when we have that fight or flight that's kicked on, um, which is we try and balance with the parasympathetic response, the fight or flight can dilate the pupils, um, inhibit our saliva from actually being released, increase our heart rate, really get that adrenaline pumping, um, but ultimately it inhibits our activity on the stomach. So you'll also notice a lot of these middle area sections, um, the stomach activity stimulating the release of glucose and inhibiting the gallbladder, um, inhibiting the activity of the intestines. These types of nutrition responses is what can contribute to long-term some GI distress as a symptom of uh, this sympathetic dominance that we don't want. And um, what we see is that the, the the HPA axis is what we it's referred to as the hypothalamus. Um, well, stress will trigger the release of corticotrophin releasing hormone CRH, and then CRH acts on the pituitary gland. It stimulates the pituitary to release adrenal cortico releasing hormone or ACTH. The adrenal glands, um, the ACTH then causes the adrenal glands to release cortisol. And in depth, um, what we notice is that the cortisol plays a huge role in this cascade. So the takeaway is that the negative feedback from this cortisol loop um, loops back to the hypothalamus. And a little bit of cortisol production regularly is, is not the problem. The challenge is that when we have it elevated and um, it's constantly, it's excessive and chronic production. That's hyperactivation of that HPA axis. And that is a stressful response um, that can be chronic and contribute to a lot of problems. Now, a lot of men might not uh, really pay attention to, the, to their, their um, sympathetic dominance until it's long past due. And you'll notice down here, um, if you can see my cursor, the um, impact on the um, on sex drive and the sexual function is a huge factor in the symptomology. So let's talk a lot more about stress. Um, cortisol causes the body to break down proteins and turn them into blood sugar. Um, this can be good in the short term because it's going to give us more energy in that fight or flight system. But chronically, this can cause a breakdown at the immune cells, which starts at the gut level, and also for muscle tissue. So um, what exactly are we looking at? Well, here is just that. I just want to emphasize that comprehensive approach. And I do want to give a shout out to uh, my colleague, Kate Burks. Uh, this was adapted from um, one of her slides on stress. And the bottom line is that we want to emphasize this team approach because all uh, when we treat the human holistically, these uh, different symptoms are going to be noticed by different practitioners. And once we put them all together, we can really have that comprehensive uh, interventions. But it's important to really acknowledge how interconnected everything can be. Um, and it can easily snowball rapidly. So on the top left, we have um, perceived stress, which um, impacts things like emotional and mental control especially the stress response. Um, things like mental performance and psychology can play a role there. Faith or um, someone's faith base can also impact that. The serotonin and dopamine impact as well. But then we've got a lot of the nutrition factors here down on the bottom left corner. Uh, you'll see glycemic dysregulation. So from poor diet choices, meal timing and stress eating, low physical activity, if that's a problem for certain people, these are different um, factors that can lead to blood sugar dysregulation. 
and ultimately increase um, stress on the body and the central nervous system. And then big one is our sleep issues, um, our circadian rhythm disruptions from light and dark disruption, as well as inflammatory uh, signals going up. And all of these are impacting our medical, our strength conditioning, our physical therapy and sports medicine teams. They all were, are gonna be impacting this from um, elevated stress, chronic long-term stress. So what are the nutrients that we want to talk about? Well, out of our limitation on time today, I'm just gonna highlight a couple, but for today, I do want you to take away, um, ashwagandha is a, a key nutrient that plays a, a big role. Um, and it's all, all of these supplements that I'm gonna talk about, the ingredients are available through NSF certification. Um, there is at least one product uh, listed on the NSF for sport that contains this as an ingredient. So I have included um, those only those that have that. And there are also other nutrients that can play a role as well. But um, for ashwagandha, this impacts our, um, when you take it two to three times a day um, at about 250 milligrams, it can really impact stress. It actually decreases cortisol. So it will reduce your stress-related appetite uh, that's increased. Um, it'll reduce anxiety, it'll reduce stress, that stress feeling at, at bedtime, and it also help reset the circadian rhythm. Uh, phosphatidylserine, we're going to dive into a little bit more, but about 200 milligrams uh, one to two times a day is recommended, and it can be neuroprotective as well. So that's uh, one of the factors It's really more focused on that uh, allowing the mind, the, the brain um, to have better mood stability and controlling that stress response from it. And then this might seem really vague, but I just couldn't not talk about fruits and vegetables, given the role that um, the antioxidants play in these systems. They are your protective armor that you put on every day to help the immune system, help ligaments and tendons. Um, but the vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, quercetin found in in onions and other um, high antioxidant options, these are gonna play a big role on um, really helping manage the stress that your body's feeling. And then when it comes to the managing the muscle stress, um, HMB, beta hydroxy, beta methylbutyrate is an option that you can, an ingredient that you can use in to protect the muscle from catabolism in these stressful states. So about two to three grams a day is recommended or 38 milligrams per kilo. Um, would be recommended. So diving into uh, uh, phosphatidylserine first, um, what is it? It's a phospholipid that makes up about 15% of the total brain lipids. And actually phosphatidylserine um, is found um, to modulate the brain activity and receptors, enzymes, ion ch channels, and signaling molecules. And ultimately what this does is it plays a huge role in brain function, cognition, um, overall cognitive performance. Um, it, it has been shown to decrease cortisol and ACTH in stressful situations. Um, so here is just one example of the decrease uh, that was seen. And uh, it also reduces creatine kinase in hard training cycles. So in the um, in both 300 milligram and 600 milligram doses, it was found to uh, reduce creatine kinase, the um, muscle damage. And what's interesting is that um, the minimum amount is about 300 milligrams, pretty consistent in the research. But in our diet, we actually only get in about 130 milligrams per day. Um, if it's a low fat diet, because it is a phospholipid, um, it's about 110. And if um, someone's a vegetarian, it drops to less than 50 typically. So this is older, um, older diets studies on the actual intake, but um, we do know that it is a, a really important for brain health. And um, how do we get it from food? Well, you can actually find it in um, the, this list up here. Um, it's found a lot in fish, as you'll notice, um, and also in beans and certain other meats as well. Not very much in dairy though. So that's one that just to be aware of, phosphatidylserine um, can, I have some other good research on it too, but it's it's been very protective for mood. Um, in addition, 
uh, their uh, zinc carnosine is another great option uh, to consider. And this one really plays a role with uh, gut repair because when you have sympathetic dominance, the gut mucosal cells cannot um, proliferate, they can't regenerate. So this is going to be key for that immune system, um, mod, mon, um, managing your immune system and that first line of defense. Uh, the zinc is often um, most common in oysters, which not everybody is a huge fan of, but uh, beef, liver, eggs, and fish are other sources of zinc. And then what uh, what nutrients want to be limited? Well, uh, for starters, we when uh, managing stress, we want to limit our stimulants. So tobacco, um, caffeine should be limited after two o'clock, um, and also alcohol should be limited as well. Uh, caffeine at really high doses can actually increase cortisol, suggesting that caffeine potentiated that stress response to resistance exercise in a dose dependent manner. So actually, um, we actually don't see a huge effect um, on like at what at what levels are those going to impact? Basically, there's no effect or a slight at 200 milligrams, but anything over 400 is going to is going to increase that cortisol. So that is not good. So basically, trying to keep those doses under 400 is going to be better. And then when it comes to that um, managing the uh, muscle damage, um, HMB, first, where do we get it from? Um, HMB is uh, found in our food, it's in our proteins. 5% uh, of HMB is actually converted from leucine. So it's an amino acid uh, metabolite. And if you wanted to eat the amount of HMB that is shown to be um, effective in an in dose, it would equate to 500 to 750 grams of high quality protein. That is way too much protein for anybody. So the point of it is that in order to get those effective doses, it's not really, it's not practical at all to, to try and consume them. Um, about 8% leucine threshold um, would assumed would be to provide the three grams a day. So how does HMB impact cortisol? Well, one of the things that was interesting is in some one study, um, HMB actually reduced the, corti the traditional rise in cortisol that is seen characteristic in overreaching studies. So cortisol rises in overreaching and HMB was actually able to stop that, that rise when it was taken. And this was on the HMB free acid form. Um, but the HMB uh, calcium form is the one that's MSF certified. That is that increase? And then in addition to it, actually HMB also prevented that characteristic rise seen in damage uh, of muscle during overreaching. So yet again, um, managing that muscle, uh, the muscle loss during stressful scenarios, catabolic situations is really where HMB plays a role. It's not effective in situations where there's not muscle damage. Um, jumping on to sleep, because sleep plays a huge role. Uh, basically, decreased sleep results in increased appetite uh, significantly, and we also see that um, when there's chronic sleep deprivation, that the appetite suppressor, leptin, will also decrease. So um, when we decrease our cortisol, we can actually uh, manage our appetite some more. So we know with sleep, there's a big role between the environment and the nutrients. Uh, just to focus on a couple of nutrients, uh, basically, the insulin is the key for um, crossing the blood-brain bar barrier, and it, uh, tryptophan is required to pass through using albumin. Um, so when it is stimulated into the brain, tryptophan actually will turn into 5-HTP, which will then turn into serotonin and dopamine, and then manage the cascade, which results in turning into melatonin. This will help um, manage the sleep-wake cycle uh, without overdoing it. So I want to highlight 5-HTP as another option um, that's uh, down uh, earlier in the cascade without making people feel too drowsy from some melatonin. Um, another one with trouble falling asleep is magnesium. Uh, magnesium can actually um, possibly stimulate melatonin, but it also helps to, uh, it's a relaxant. 
and it manages um, some of those enzymes as well. And they found that deficiency in magnesium also results in decreased melatonin. Um, th about 300 milligrams of melatonin, I'm sorry, of magnesium is recommended for sleep. And it's, it's commonly found in lots of nuts, uh, spinach, oats, beans. Uh, here's just a list of sources, but basically go to your uh, performance dietitian or sports dietitian, and they can help you manage that. But the magnesium can help uh, with relaxing the mind at night, and a lot of athletes are low in that. And then you'll also see that um, magnesium citrate, glycinate, or a combo can be used before bed. If you have difficulty falling asleep, just want to highlight uh, vitamin D really quickly uh, because those are other options. Um, it plays a huge role in our circadian rhythm. And um, speak with your dietitian about managing those levels, but they also play a lot of roles in the immune system, um, muscle health, and other pieces as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Christian. Um, he is a uh, technician working in the cognitive performance space, uh, working on his PhD right now, but uh, he's been a huge asset in our interventions around managing stress using heart rate variability. So just going to pause this. Hello, uh, my name is Christian Vaccaro, and today I'm going to be talking to you about heart rate variability and heart rate variability biofeedback. So what is heart rate variability? So heart rate variability is the fluctuation in time between each heartbeat measured in milliseconds. Um, a healthy heart does not beat at a steady rate. Uh, for example, if you have an average heartbeat of 50 beats per minute, uh, your heart doesn't stay at a steady 50 beats per minute. It fluctuates between, let's say, 52 beats down to 48, and so forth and so on. And we actually can measure this variation, and that variation measurement can be used to assess, monitor, and train your autonomic nervous system. And we do that using HRV biofeedback. So what does HRV biofeedback even look like? Well, HRV biofeedback is just one way to measure and train HRV in order to increase self-regulation and minimize stress. Um, this works by balancing the two branches of the autonomic nervous system. You have your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. Your sympathetic nervous system is in charge of, let's say, your fight, flight, freeze. It's what gets activated whenever you're feeling stressed, uh, whenever you're feeling nervous, things like that. That's what's in charge. And then you have your parasympathetic nervous system, which is essentially your rest and digest nervous system. And that whole system's job is to calm down your sympathetic nervous system. And the way that you can measure your ANS or your autonomic nervous system is by taking all the different variations in your heart rate and we can put them on a graph. So this graph can generally be interpreted as anything to the left of 0.15 is going to be sympathetic activation and anything to the right of 0.15 is going to be parasympathetic activation. So why is looking at this graph important? Well, it's important because various metrics measure different things when monitoring HRV. For example, let's look at LFHF ratio. In general, LFHF ratio is the ratio between your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system. Now, we can see that both graphs have very similar ratios, but the graphs look completely different. Uh, on the top, we have someone that is generally balanced with activation throughout. Um, and on the bottom, we have someone that has very high activation in both their sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system when you look at the peaks for each of the um, spikes, essentially. So as you can see on the bottom chart, there is this U-shaped pattern going on and there's high activation in both areas. Uh, this high activation in both uh, is an indicator of fatigue. Right, and so this is similar to flying a plane and fixing it, fixing it at the same time. And so that's not necessarily a good thing. So if you only look at the numbers without looking at the graph, you can get, you would think that they are healthy and they're you know ready to go, but that may not be the case. And so through HRV biofeedback, we can monitor this and look at this, but we can also teach individuals how to balance their system so that their system can respond accordingly. 
So what does that look like? So this is an example of someone that has been training for with us for a while. And notice how there's one very focal spike on the graph rather than activation all over. This is called autonomic balance, or also known as the meditator's peak. Now, as you can notice, the LF-HF ratio is significantly higher, but that is because we're fo focusing activation in that specific area. So for training, the higher is the better. Um, using HRV biofeedback, an individual can train to become balanced when they need to. You can use this training when you're feeling activated and stressed in order to help regulate yourself um, whenever you need it. Uh, however, after long periods of doing this training, it can also help you become more like that graph uh, that we saw earlier that's activated throughout and it's just more balanced rather than having that U-shaped pattern that we saw that isn't that great. And here are just some of the various HRV metrics that we watch and observe depending on whether they're in training or if they're hanging out at rest. So why HRV biofeedback? Well, there's tons of research articles out there that show the effectiveness and benefits of training individuals using HRV biofeedback. Um, biofeedback directly impacts the AMS through deliberate breathing and influencing the RSA and barrel reflex. And this influence leads to a lot of benefits. Uh, HRV biofeedback can be used to improve self-regulation, anxiety, performance. It's also been shown to help determine and inform optimal training loads to incre increase athletic performance. Um, HRV has been used to monitor improved neurocognitive performance and can even be used to monitor individuals' psychophysiological state during a performance task. And this information is huge because we can inform players where, the, where they are physiologically and train them to become more calm and collected during high stress environments. Um, when individuals are calm and collected, they have established an environment where they can perform their best and they can perform optimally. And that's the whole idea behind uh, HRV biofeedback for performance. And here are just the references that I use to uh, give you this presentation. There's a ton of research out there uh, feel free to dive a little bit deeper. Um, this is all research-backed, and especially when it comes to performance and well-being. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either me or Stephanie. I'm more than happy to help and answer any of the questions that you have. Thank you. All right. And... All right, thank you, Dr. Wilson and Christian. Outstanding presentation on the importance of uh, uh, nutrition, sleep, and how to handle that uh, that nasty cortisol uh, steroid hormone and and uh, manage our stress. As we know, there that it comes at us in several different angles um, at all times. Uh, next up is Mr. Joe Ken. Joe. Uh, as many of you know, is one of the top top strength and conditioning professionals in the industry. Um, currently, the vice president of performance education with Dynamic Fitness and Strength. Um, Joe is in his third decade uh, as a physical preparation specialist, and he's dedicated his career to paying it forward. Uh, he's an author of two books and has published in many journals of strength conditioning um, over the years. He's a side uh, uh, excuse me, a highly sought after speaker, uh, both nationally and internationally. Um, he's spoken overseas in the United Kingdom. Uh, Joe has coached athletes across many sports, male and female ages, uh, from grade school, 10 years old up to, uh, you know, the, the elite professional and, and, and all pro status. Uh, Jeff has worked at the high school. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Joe has worked at the high school level. Uh, and, and, and in the private sector, um, 19 years uh, as a collegiate strength conditioning coach at Boise State, uh, Utah, University of Utah, Arizona State, Louisville, and had seven seasons uh, working in the NFL. Uh, Joe Ken holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Health and Sports Science and a Master's of Arts degree in Curriculum and Instruction. Um, many accolades to his resume. Um, the 1998 NSCA Big West Conference Strength Conditioning Coach of the Year, 2000 NSCA Mountain West Conference Conditioning 
uh, Conference Strength Conditioning Coaches of the Year. Um, in 2002, he was the NSCA Collegiate Strength Conditioning Coach of the Year. 2013, NSCA Professional Strength Conditioning Coach of the Year. And his latest award was 2015 NFL Strength Conditioning Coach of the Year, uh, recognized by his professional organization of the Professional Football Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association. Uh, without further ado, uh, Joe Ken, he's going to speak to us today, present on reinforcement, strengthening the neck for baseball. And I appreciate Take it away, Joe. Everybody jumping on this webinar and want to thank Matt Krause and the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society for having me on this morning. And we're going to give you a little bit of a mini course in our reinforcement programming, uh, strength training for neck and head support and how it could relate to the improvements in posture and positioning for baseball players. First of all, you know, the biggest thing is where would you fit this in when you're designing your programming? And for me, I prefer to use the term pre-activity preparation when discussing program design inside the weight room in a strength training session setting. I, I think this gives it a more a comprehensive understanding of what we're trying to accomplish versus the typical, hey, let's warm up. I think when you talk to most athletes and they hear the term warm up, they nonchalantly go through a bunch of trivial and remedial exercises just in a goal to improve core temperature and to get the body moving. I prefer pre-activity prep to be very, very specific in the demands of what I'm asking, as well as building plans that help protect the athlete in certain areas of the body and be very specific to what we're trying to accomplish. With that being said, I utilize the R technique program or the R programming methodology from Mike Robertson. So you'll see where we have several are terms that build out our pre-activity prep. Uh, the goal is to get through this in an expedient time, depending on how much time available, but the ultimate goal is depending on what you're going to include, hopefully it's approximately uh, 15 minutes or less. You can do this in pods, which is each individual subcategory is done specifically, or you can do things in medley a medley form where you actually circuit through certain rounds. So with the release and reset, this is typically just some self myofascial release, foam rolling, etc., power plate. And then the resets is typical uh, mobility work and or rocking and rolling and crawling. I highly recommend Tim Anderson's original strength work for a lot of the movement drills that we would use in there. It also could be some of the uh, simplistic things as even your quadruped work and your and uh, your movement prep for the hip and hamstring that most people do. But I, I use that, once that's explained to the athlete, I tend to let them be, be player led so I don't have to count that to the time or the duration of the session. Reactive is your plyometric work. I know a lot of people will work that in as a separate session either on the field and or possibly utilize it as a part of a strength workout and substituting so-called Olympic lifts or explosive barbell and dumbbell lifts for some type of jump or throw with a med ball. So those can be uh, optioned in or out, but the key component of the pre-activity prep is the root or what most people would call the core work, the reboot, the activation work, the reinforcement work. And for our programming, that's for our, our neck and head support work. And then readiness is high volume movements that will help prep the athlete for the specific movements of that particular workout. And again, the ultimate goal is, can we get those four movements done in three rounds of work, vary the exercises. So you're looking at three rounds of work, 12 exercises in less than 15 minutes, or you can pod them and do the root work as a separate pod, the reboot as a separate pod, the reinforcement as a separate pod, or the readiness as a separate pod. I've done them both ways, 
uh, for, for athletics, for team-based situations, I highly recommend the medley. Okay, why implement the reinforcement program? Again, critical to all athletics is protecting the head and the neck. And, the ne and that also helps, if we do this correctly, we're building a more resilient athlete and we're building a shield of protection because most of the time when people talk about uh, supporting the head, they talk specifically about training the neck muscles. But if you really look at how it's built and how the head is supported, it's supported through the neck, the trap region, and those muscle muscles that are in part behind the traps, the smaller muscles, as well as the posterior shoulder capsule. So for us, the reinforcement program for neck and head support will rely on movements that work the neck, movements that work the traps, and movements that work the posterior shoulder. So when it comes to baseball, we're getting a little two for one bang for our buck, because now we're getting additional trap and posterior shoulder uh, work that can help us to, excuse me, help stabilize the shoulder joint. And again, the biggest thing we want to do is protect our athletes. And by doing that, you never know when a fatal uh, situation can occur and a concussion could be uh, part of the diagnosis to the athlete, so especially with what happens on all sports. You never, people running into each other, uh, possibly taking a pitch, uh, falling and diving for a ball in the field of play. And again, what, what, what can neck and head support do for an individual? Again, it's very simple. If we can increase neck strength by one pound or every pound we can increase it, the odds of a concussion decrease by 5%. So stronger neck equals probably reduces trauma to the brain. Stronger neck decreases head velocity of impact Weaker neck, smaller neck increases the risk. So again, there's nothing that doesn't help the athlete when we're trying to protect the athlete and decrease potential risks of injury. Okay, I wanted to make this as practical as I could because of the time, time restraints we have. So we're gonna dig right into it. This is a standard reinforcement template for neck and head support. Our exercise pool considerations. For the neck, we have flexion and extension, lateral flexion, protraction and retraction, lateral rotation, diagonal rotation, and tilts and nods. And tilts and nods are short, very specific range of motions that look like flexion and extension. For the trapezius region, elevation and depression, upward downward rotation, retraction and protraction. Again, we overemphasize shoulder elevation in most strength training programs. The more work I did with this neck project, the more I realized how much we were missing the, the boat, so to speak, with how many more movements we should be training the scapula, which ties into a lot of uh, the trapezius region. So we, we could call the trapezius region more scapula movement training also. And, and I've watched the amount of thickness and the about uh, free flowing of the scapula movement by training these, not just with load, but putting these into our mobility program also. And then you have your posterior shoulder region, extension work, hyperextension, prone or bent horizontal abduction, and then your standard rotation, medial, lateral, internal, and external at different angles of the body. So we're looking at a program again, in this particular situation, the biggest goal or the biggest question that the coach has to ask is how much time do you want to invest in neck training each week or each session, as well as I think you can diagnose it by how much the sports volatility is. So if you're training three days a week, you could probably invest one round each week if in a sport of baseball, and you can manipulate the different variations of exercise to get some pretty quality work. So you're looking at one to two movements or up to four with the neck. And if you're using a band a band programming that will show you some exercises uh, down the in, in the later slides, you could get up to four exercises without removing the band. 
And again, depending on the movement we're doing, it's six to 15 repetitions. And if we're doing ISO holds, uh, anywhere between 20 and 60 seconds on average, it's probably going to be 30 seconds. Uh, trapezius region, we're going to pick one movement, again, from that categories of movement of the scapula. And then the same thing with the posterior shoulder. Pick one movement from the variations of movements that we're going to use that affect posterior shoulder development. Uh, we, we, we have to also remember this, that it is very important with the rotating of the neck and head movements is we have to also uh, really work on more of the rotation work. It's a little bit harder. We're going to program this very practical and we're going to utilize bands. This is where I think uh, products like the iron neck come into play because it really helps with your rotation work, uh, quasi iso rotation work and diagonal rotation work. But the emphasis is generally usually on the big three, you know, neck flexion, neck extension and uh, lateral flexion. I want to invest more in protraction and retraction, especially when most of our players are, when they're done, uh, a majority of athletes tend to stare at a phone. So they're always in that uh, knotted position and we, and we have to get them back into a good posture, upright position, pro and retraction of the neck really help that. And the ISO holds are very good for stability. Uh, the rotation work critical for looking over your shoulder to catch a fly ball and to be able to get your head in the proper position when you're in the batter's box. So again, huge differences are rotate the exercises. Here's a basic template and you can attack it in many different ways. You can keep this right here as a pod or as you're rotating through a medley, your first round of the medley, you do the neck work, the second round, the traps, the third round, the posterior shoulder. So let's get right into some of the practical stuff. This is what I call my shoulder trap mobility program. This should take approximately three minutes, nothing here extravagant. It's just a standard program that's structured together to work all the movements to loosen up and get ready to work the posterior shoulder, even the chest capsule, as well as the scaps and the posterior uh, shoulder and the trap, excuse me, and the scapula movements. So we have the standing, uh, we had standing over under swing. Now we have our bent over T swing. And again, 12 total, 12 to 20. Now we're going into standard shrug. So we have shoulder elevation, forcing down into depression. So as I'm down in the, this position here, I am trying to push the hands or my fingers to my knees trying to keep a neutral chin. Now we go into our multi-plane front raise, protraction, retraction, abduction, diagonal, rotation, downward rotation. Uh, generally, if you do this for 12 total, 12 total, and then six, 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 this should take approximately three minutes. So you're not asking for a whole lot of investment in the program. It's just, where do you find this in? This could be a great way to start practice. Uh, I put a part of our pre-activity prep for our field work on almost all of our days that we hit the field first, and it helps prep the athletes for all the different throws and jumps and all the other crazy stuff that us as strength coaches love to do. So here's just a different angle of the multi-plane arrays. And we'll finish it off with a bat wing ab and adduction. I actually like this too, because it really opens up your pec. The goal is if you can, if you really got the mobility is for the elbows to touch. And then here on the on the, right here on the AB duction, I'm really opening wide, pushing, trying to push the elbows to touch into the into the posterior range. So here's our neck mobility work again. Six going on the basics of six reps total, three each way. We're going lateral rotation. I count to a a, a three count hold. Come to midline, three count hold. 
Each time my goal is to, can I reach further, looking back over my shoulder to see what's behind me? If this is done with uh, three reps aside, this is going to be, I believe, approximately four minutes of work. Now we go into diagonal rotation. So now I'm looking out over my shoulder, could represent looking for a fly ball and then rotate down to the opposite shoulder. Again, three reps each way. I don't know if you have to do more than that, to be honest with you. If you concentrate on the three second count and really work for the stretch and try to improve the range of motion, I think that's an ideal number to get a quality amount of work. And, and I, again, do this uh, a lot of times in the mobility prep work of the field. I also do this with younger athletes because if they've not been doing these types of movements, this can act as a strength training movement because the head can be the load, especially for your younger athletes or your athletes in the minor leagues who have not been exposed to strength training. Now we're going into lateral flexion. Uh, here the key is, and a lot of people have the hard time, myself included, is keeping the shoulders from raising. Then we're going to go into a little bit more of an athletic position and we're going to hit the protraction and retraction work. So here I'm pushing the chin out away from my body and then I'm pulling the head back, trying to pull the chin through the midline of the body. Reach, pull. Reach, trying to keep the chin neutral. With very little movement of the upper body. Then we've got into our nods to flexion, tilt to extension. So a nod, and then we go into flexion, pulling the chin to the chest. Then we tilt the, the chin full, uh, up, and then we extend looking out to the sky. And again, as I'm pulling into the chest, I am pulling hard to get a good stretch. And as I am looking out, I'm looking hard again to really work on range of motion and reaching as high as I can to see uh, what's above us. Last is neck circles. To be honest with you, this is optional. What I wanna do here is just be a little bit more active so I've added this in. This was not a part of my original neck mobility. I've added this in recently just to help finish up the drills. And again, six each way I think is very, uh, very uh, sp precise number, I guess you can say, but doesn't need to be more than that. I don't think 10 is necessary, but I do know if people have more issues, they may want to increase the volume. So here is what I would consider self-supported movements with bands. These are just popular movements that I like and I recommend to do between 10 or 15, except for posture neck is usually going to be six to 15 because we may concentrate on a longer ISO hold. But here's what we have. Self-supported means you can do this without any apparatus. Oops, sorry. So you're gonna stand, you're gonna put the band behind you, you're gonna stand with, and, and the safety key is put the band at the arch of your foot. You're gonna twist the band, come up over your head, and you're gonna place it on the forehead, and, the, and you're gonna pull the crease of your ear back, and you're gonna have that band sit in the crease of the ear. Band goes inside the knee, and now we'll go into protraction. So now we're pushing the head forward, getting resistance from the band.
And again, you get a lot of quasi ISO work because of the band tension. So this is, there is tension on the movement the entire time. And you can see how the band is crossed across the athlete's body. Now you've got short range of motion. You got your tilts and nods. Make sure we always check in the band is secure at the crease. lateral rotation, short range of motion. And again, the coach has to be aware or, or the athlete has to be aware if the band starts to slide, you just stop and reset the band. And again, these are short range of motion work. These are, again, these are just variations of movement that are self-supported, easy to do, and are part of a, a stronger exercise pool. Then you've got your short range of motion diagonal rotation work. And if you're working your mobility work, you can get away with your short range of motion work here. If you're working your full range of motion through your mobility training. Now we'll go into standing posture neck. This is one of the more popular ones with a seated posture neck that we introduce with the bands. You start in a bent over position. You're going to push back and you're going to have an ISO hold. You're going to drive the chin to the chest, go back down and stretch. Generally, depending on how we hold the ISOs will de determine whether we go six, eight, 10 repetitions. I don't, we don't ever recommend more than 10 we generally stay at six. So now we have the standing retraction work. So this supplements the protraction work. So now we're pushing back into the band. Here is uh, some banded movements for scapular and trap work. So we'll start with a standard shrug. So we're going to stand on the band, double leg. We're going to shrug and we're going to allow the band to pull us down into depression. Now we're going to do reverse shrug, working depression. So now we shrug up and then push down hard into the band. Here's a protraction retraction combo with the bands. Wrap it around your upper back through your upper arm. Retract, protract. Then we're going into upward and downward rotation. I think this is a key one. If you are experimenting with Olympic lifts with your athletes, I think this is a crucial one to implement into the training plan. And here is what I consider our standard staple program that I'll initiate with our athletes. This is our seated posture neck, seated dumbbell shrug, bent over T-raise. So you've got neck, trapezius scapula, posterior shoulder. So again, you're gonna, uh, here you're gonna start with the band on your head first. So you're gonna put it in the crease, lock it in from the feet second, push out, iso hold, chin to chest, 
stretch through the spine. You can see this this being a tempoed movement, six reps is more than ample enough in that drill. Now we've got a rhythm rhythm uh, tempo for our shrugs. And again, this is for uh, 15. I'll easily take these to 25. Same thing with the posterior shoulder movements. So this is what it would look like if it was a pod setup. You'd go right in from neck to trap scapular to posterior shoulder. And depending on how many rounds, you would go back and do a second or third round. In a medley situation, each of these would be broken up into the medley round at the, at the beginning or the end or wherever you placed reinforcement. So remember that you either have the medley choice where you're gonna go circuit with the stuff in the PAP or are you gonna do a pod situation where you do all three at once? Just a basic check, always check the bands for defects. If there's an issue, throw them out. Hair protection, towel, skull cap, et cetera. Body position, when we're in the standing upright, focus on athletic position or up tall, depending on how the band uh, support is supported. A crease of the fold of the ear, arch of the foot on the foot. This is just a touch of our reinforcement programming that we offer as a course. Uh, we're giving a huge discount to anybody who's still interested in learning more. So if you use the code PBSCCS1, you'll get 67% off. You get 7.7 .7 CEUs from the NSCA, 1.5 from, from the CSCCA. Uh, this, this will expire at the end of May. And then if you're looking for bands, Obviously, I work for Dynamic Fitness and Strength as their Vice President of Performance Education. And then this gives you an idea from a budget standpoint what those pricings may look like. Uh, generally, I don't think you need the monster bands. You can use the medium band for shrug work. I've only seen one athlete in my career use the medium band to do a posture neck. But most of the athletes should work from a mini a micro mini, mini, monster mini, and then the light bands usually do the trick for the neck training. I appreciate everyone's time. Again, thank you very much to the society for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Joe Ken. Outstanding uh, presentation. And it's not something we do a lot of uh, in, in pro ball, but definitely needed, especially with our catchers, you know, with the, the, the foul tips and the back swings that we want their necks nice and strong to help reduce the risk of those concussion and concussion related injuries. So thanks, Joe. Uh, next up, Casey Callison. Uh, Casey is entering his sixth season with the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, he hails from Heartland, Wisconsin, studying human performance over the past 13 years. Uh, Casey attended the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse, uh, where he attained his bachelor's degree in exercise sports science. Uh, current interests revolve around athlete monitoring and developing a systematic approach to increasing athletic performance. Uh, today, Casey's uh, presentation is titled Developing a System for Speed, Agility, and Quickness. Casey Collison, take it away. All right. Hello and welcome. My name is Casey Callison and today I'll be speaking on how we can go about developing a system for speed within baseball and how technology can help us with that. So first and foremost, I want to start things off by just giving a thank you to Matt Krause and the PBS CCS just for everything that they provide us. Um, and for me specifically right now, it's just this opportunity. This is the first opportunity that I've had to this scale to be able to um, like speak on a platform like this. So 
incredibly grateful for it. Um, and I just, I wanted to start off with that. Uh, just to, again, just say how thankful I am. So just for those that don't know me, uh, my name, like I said, is Casey Callison. Uh, I'm a Wisconsin native. I was born and raised up there. I lived there for 24 years, right up, uh, right up until I got the, my current job with the Toronto Blue Jays. I attended the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Uh, that's where I did my undergrad. I studied, exer studied exercise sports science, um, got my bachelor's there. And then after my time with uh, UWL, I went to grad school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I did a year there and then I decided I wanted to get out and just kind of like start working. And uh, from there, shortly after, I was able to get the opportunity that I have now with the Toronto Blue Jays. So I got hired in 2017, the off season. 2018 was my first season, and that was with our uh, Gulf Coast League Blue Jays. That was our rookie ball team. And then 2019, I was with the Vancouver Canadians. That was a low A short season team. 2020, I was supposed to be with the Lansing Lugnuts, but that was obviously 2020 years, so that was working from afar. And they, they are no longer with us. Um, but then from there, uh, 2021, 2022, and this year for 2023, I'm now with the uh, New Hampshire Fisher Cats, our AA affiliate. So it's been a blast. I love it. Um, honestly, I didn't, I didn't think I'd get into baseball from the very beginning, um, but I was, again, afforded the opportunity, and it's been great ever since. I haven't, I haven't looked back, so it's been phenomenal. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and dive into the uh, goal of this presentation. So when I was going about developing this presentation, I did give a, um, a presentation, presentation similar to this one. Um, within the Blue Jays organization, we had a little bit of staff development stuff, kind of on um, topics we were interested in. Mine was speed development, um, and it was towards some of the progressions later that you'll see in this presentation. But ultimately, what I want to do with this is I want to provide a systematic approach that helps us assess and develop speed. So when I thought about that as well, I figured it'd be great to take the approach of creating a foundational resource that whether it be new coaches to just like baseball or coaching in general, or even just coaches that, you know, maybe maybe don't have much of a system for it or still looking to learn into it. I, I just wanted to provide something foundational to create a thought process and get that going um, to, again, just kind of serve as like the beginnings for that. So that's kind of been the mentality. And I'm, you know, I hope I can get that point across within this presentation here. So <clears throat> first and foremost, uh, I, we have to think in systems. Uh, when we break it down, I feel like all good systems really come from questions, right? We're in the field. We want to get athletes better. Uh, we're curious about learning. We just have that desire deep down. So really, I feel like that's where these systems kind of get created, right? Is we think, all right, hey, I, I got these guys. They've got speed goals. I need to make them faster. How am I going to go about doing that, right? And then you start engineering the process that you're going to have. So that's <clears throat> kind of how we have to think here. And uh, I, I think it's kind of funny, too, because I feel like for how many questions that we have and we try and get those answers right as we start off with maybe it's just a speed goal. But then as we work through our system, then all of a sudden we start realizing there's like four other questions that we start learning about. And, uh, you know, we end up with more questions than we do answers. But at the same time, though, that's honestly why I love my job. That's why I love the field is because we're just constantly learning and helping those around us. So. Talking to <clears throat> the importance of our system, I think it's uh, very important for us to remember that our system is going to be cyclical, right? So whether we call it our process or our system, um, or the process to our system, uh, is like the uh, illustration that I have here, is just everything kind of comes full circle, right? We have our questions that we start with. We have the things that we're trying to figure out the answers to. So we start off with setting a system in place of how we're gonna go about do that. You have your daily workflows, you have your, your grand like master plan of how you're gonna get it done. And then you have your action, action items of how you're gonna carry that out. But then it comes back full circle, right? And then you kind of go back and reflect, how do I feel like that went? Do I need to tweak any things? Okay, I learned this, I learned that, like this worked, this didn't. So we just have to keep that in mind. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we already probably think that way, but I think it's also important to just not forget that um, because we do have to constantly refine our system because with where we're at with technology, just the current day and age, um, th things are constantly growing. We're learning so much, so just remember that. So a starting point <clears throat> of kind of developing, developing our system, right? We know how we kind of have to formulate it, 
but I believe it's also very important to ask ourselves, you know, why? Why are we getting into this? Um, the how to support it and the what as well too. Uh, it's just kind of like, again, having that foundation of when we're going through this, we have to know exactly why we're doing it. And to put this into our situation, applying it, the why is why do we care about speed within baseball? The how is how can we develop and quantify speed? And then the what is what are we going to do with everything once we get the ball rolling? So, and I'm gonna go through that in a couple of the other slides, but again, it's now we've been able to kind of formulate a couple questions. Again, like let's start getting the answers. Let's see if we can't figure that out. <clears throat> so let me get us up here. <clears throat> so first, why do we need a system for speed uh, within baseball? Well, first and foremost, it's just, it's a requirement of the job, right? It doesn't matter <clears throat> where a guy's playing, if it's, you know, offensive, defensive reps, if it's, you know, working on fly balls, if it's covering the base, if it's uh, running the base, our guys have to be able to display high levels of speed, agility, and quickness at any time, and uh, it has to be repeatable, right? So that's a very important reason as to why we would need it. And then also too, which we'll get into later within the presentation, but <clears throat> just as much as we can use speed for performance, we can also use it for recovery too, to help drive that process. So again, like I said, we'll take a peek at that later in the, um, later in the presentation, and that's where the technology piece is going to come in. Now getting into our how, <clears throat> um, it really just comes down to, we have to identify our current needs. Um, our need is a, a need for speed. So we need a way to help quantify that so we can measure it. And that's where now we're kind of getting into um, the KPIs that we're gonna look at. And basically this is gonna go about helping us take the piece of technology um, to help with this. So in this example, we'll be looking at, it's gonna be accelerations, um, top speed, and then high speed distance. These will be the three things that we're gonna kind of start with. And I do, I do feel it's important when we're starting off with our system, when we're just getting going, to probably keep it to just a couple metrics to keep it simple. And then from there, we can grow things out. So that's where I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about Catapult here. Uh, Catapult is something that I'm still learning, uh, but it has been part of uh, my job for the past several years now, and it's, it's, been, it's been great. I've learned a lot from it. Um, still have a lot to learn, but just to provide a little bit of background on what Catapult is, Ultimately, um, you can get a lot of different metrics for us today. Again, uh, top speed, high speed distance, the accelerations. You can also get decelerations. Uh, they offer heart rate. Um, you can get GPS. There's just, there's so many things that you can get with it. You can get player loads, swing loads for like swinging a baseball bat, throws, pitch counts. So the opportunities are <clears throat> almost endless there, but I have been able to um, get some pretty good return on my time with Catapult and uh, make some pretty uh, like good adjustments to programming for guys. So that's why I wanted to share on how Catapult can help us with that today. So, <clears throat> and again, this is kind of going over our what now. We went over kind of the hows, here's the what. So this is an example that we have here of looking at Catapult acceleration load. Um, so as we look into this, this is for a group of guys. What we're going to have there is the loads per the day um, and we also get high, this is average, but I like to think of it as medium, but like your high, medium, and low thresholds for guys. This is all going to be relative based on the timeline that you set. So if you want seven days, 14 days, 21, whatever it is, it's going to go ahead and create those threshold zones based on the data that's in there. So <clears throat> that's pretty cool for us because then we can kind of get an idea, right, of if guys are supposed to have a high day, are we getting there? If guys are supposed to have a medium day, are they getting there? And same thing for the low. So this is a really cool way to help kind of have a piece to talk about with whether it be players or staff members to help kind of educate on our system for speed of like, hey, if, if we want to be peaking at the right time or making sure that guys are ready and getting dosed appropriately, this is a perfect way to show that with the data. Um, and then it's kind of an easier way to digest for guys um, versus just seeing all the raw numbers. The next one we'll get into here is um, like sprint efforts and then high speed dif distance. So another example, kind of uh, the same way, you can see this one's a little bit uh, 
crazier in the sense of like distance and effort. Um, we're getting a little bit further away from some of the highs. But again, that is, uh, that's something important for us to know. And um, let's see here. Yeah, this one, again, same thing with the high, the medium, and the low days, but uh, just again, it's an important way to kind of drive some of this home, right? So if it's, hey, you had, you know, 10 efforts today, and this is the distance that you covered, versus maybe like your low days or two, you have that comparison. What I'll say as well, too, on the efforts, <clears throat> you can, um, just as this provides thresholds in there of like high, medium, and low days, uh, you can also go ahead in there and create like different bandwidths of like what is going to classify as a high intensity effort. Um, and I think like right now we have it set at about like 85%. So anytime it registers a player hitting 85% of their like max velocity, it takes that and then it starts tracking the distance. So pretty important. And again, what's cool is it's all very customizable. So um, you can kind of play with it as you will. But again, great way to kind of share this information with players and staff, just to kind of like have some reflection and make sure we're like on the right path. So, and I know I've kind of been talking about it as I've been going through this, but how do these graphs help us? Well, at the end of the day, having those relative benchmarks are huge for guys and that clearly it's going to develop as guys get that information. So not necessarily going to be the same for every guy, but at least at the very least, it helps us get a relative range um, per each guy and we can work from there. Uh, again, a more in-depth picture, the, visualiza the visualization is great. And then last but not least, it's just matching up subjectively how are the guys feeling like the day is versus objectively what's the data telling us. So that's great to be able to make those adjustments. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. So now that we have that, we have a piece of technology that's going to help us um, with developing our system is how do we keep doing that with catapult so <clears throat> it really just depends on what lens we're looking to go through we have everywhere from a daily view weekly view or a monthly view just depending on how you want to program um, or reflect on it and at the end of the day it also allows for us to produce a report for the affiliate staff um, so that way everybody can kind of be involved in this i think the conversation piece is huge for development of our players and same thing for speed, right? Because if we're sitting there and we're dosing things in as a strength coach and we're trying to have a high day, um, but maybe you know our baseball staff, they're trying to have a low day for a guy and then all of a sudden now these numbers are getting all mixed up, you know, guys are getting fatigued out. I think this is a great resource to be able to bring everybody to the same playing page and say, hey, how are we gonna dose things? Are we hitting the norms that we're looking to hit? And again, with that, right? It's just part of like a continuing education, learning and growth. Uh, because everybody's collaborating together. So that's really where I see the importance of this within our system. And just as a couple examples, I provided uh, one of our schedule days from last year. This is again, let's say we're going through the scenario of working with some guys and if it's a high, medium or low day, whatever it might be, but then I can go into the schedule, take a peek and see maybe what a guy's day is gonna look like. Perhaps it's getting with our manager or whatever coach uh, need be and just kind of talking through the day, whatever adjustments we, we may need to do. If it's either add some more work in, um, pulling the guy off to the side, making sure we have time for it, or maybe it is um, like just reducing some of the work that he has for the day um, and making some adjustments there. But that would be a way for us, let's say for a daily impact, to kind of cut that up and utilize it to make sure the guy's in a uh, good position to succeed. Then we have a weekly or a monthly view um, and this is kind of like thinking end goal. Maybe it's again, right? Like we've got player goals for these guys and we're looking for, you know, by the end of a um, like strength and conditioning phase, phase. So like with our weight training, um, as we're looking for some numbers there too. So then it's kind of getting an idea, right? Of, okay, well, if I know that I have a two week road trip in May and that it's gonna be a little bit tougher for facilities or whatever it might be, but just being able to kind of have that in mind and then also have the catapult data there too, again, back that up for us and help us make those informed decisions. Um, I think again, like it just, it's important for that. And whether it is you're just looking at your scheduled calendar or if you have your own like side little Excel document, whatever it may be. But um, again, just realizing is we can use that to help with the bigger picture and the smaller picture as well too. So I wanted to take 
this time now to just kind of recap what we have so far, because um, I feel like there's been a lot put out there, but we've gone through creating our system, kind of the importance of that and the goal of this to ultimately provide some type of foundational resource for new coaches or just coaches in general um, to start going about developing a system for speed. We've talked about thinking in systems and how we can kind of refine our process of being able to have our steps that we need to get to the end goal, but also refining that along the way. Um, we've talked about having the right questions and how oftentimes when we're seeking answers, uh, we just we find a whole bunch more questions uh, that we need the answers to. Um, we've talked about identifying our KPIs and just our needs at the end of the day. And then we've gone over also too of how we are um, like quantifying them, right? And that's where Catapult is helping us out. So at the end of the day, we have our framework, right? So it's like, I got the house right there is we have kind of our foundation there. We've, we've built the structure. Now what we really need to do is we're going to build in and we're gonna have like the insulation. We need the electrical. We need to get all of those other pieces just to kind of really bring it back home and get more on kind of the speed side of things um, because we have the system to support that. So let's make the system now our own. So this is where, uh, this is from the presentation that I gave in-house um, with the Toronto Blue Jays before. And this is where we're gonna kind of bring things back to just again, more of like that speed development because we have things in place for that. So in this example, I was looking at a, uh, a three week camp. This was a three week camp for speed development. And the idea here was, um, just to ultimately lay, again, a foundation for things, but to kind of paint a picture to get everybody on the same page of how are we kind of thinking about speed development um, and creating a template for that. So we will revisit this because I have a couple things that I kind of made and branched off from here. But at the end of the day, it's really just looking at um, thinking like of the needs of the camp, right? So how many days of the week are we training? All right, we have five days. Uh, we know there's obviously going to be uh, stimulus involved on these guys for the activities that they're doing. So it's probably a good idea to, again, get a gauge of like high, medium, low days. Boom. So we have our intensities. And then it's also kind of looking at what's the daily emphasis going to be. And this is where there's another little model that I've created to help kind of hit that point home of like, what is a posture day or what's a position day or, you know, what what's a rhythm day. So we'll go over that. And then lastly, it's kind of kind of the drills slash like what really makes up that emphasis. Um, and this is still, it's not a perfect product. This was just kind of in the off season when I had some time, um, just kind of some of my own like self reflections of kind of how I would go about it and to again, kind of like spur some of these conversations up. So let's go ahead and kind of get into some of the more like meat and potatoes of this. So, well, kind of talked on this, um, dividing up the stress, what will it look like, things of that nature. I just kind of blew past that in the uh, previous one. So hold on, let me get to uh, this next slide because it's gonna get into it more. I kind of jumped ahead of myself there. But um, so painting the full pictures with this is now when we have our three week model, right? Is we know we have guys for a camp for three weeks in the off season. The goal is speed development. Well. Now we have at the end of the day from Catapult, we have our graphs to kind of help back that up. We have a way to make sure that for the five days of the week that we're training, that we're actually hitting these high, medium, and low days. And we also have a way too, to essentially assess top speed. That's another thing that Catapult will get for us is you can run an initial test of, let's say it's a, a 30 yard sprint or whatever it might be for you. Um, and while the players have the catapults on, it's going to measure top velocity. So once we do that, we can then go into our catapult account. You can edit the top velocities for guys. You create these now um, like normative data points for them. And that's where again is these bands that we were talking about. So when we wanna see these high speed efforts or top speed efforts, if it's the 85%, 90%, whatever you wanna have it at, now we can start actually getting meaningful data on that because you know it's specific to them and then we're really driving things home here. Um, I do feel like with how busy things can especially be within spring training, um, things can get kind of crazy at the affiliate too, uh, when we're working on so many different things to get the guys better. 
uh, when we can do this in the off season and kind of create a plan for that, trial it in a smaller group, you have a small little three week window. Um, you basically like week one, that would be your initial assessment point. Go through it with guys by week three, that's kind of your reassessment point. Um, so at least that way you can kind of get an idea of what's working, what might not be, even from drills per se too. Uh, maybe we find a couple agility drills or different, you know, um, like speed drills that work really well or that we got good feedback from with the guys. Now we know that. So that's just kind of how, again, I would say with kind of our plan um, and whether it's three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, however long, um, however long you're really making it out, but that would kind of be how I would re reflect on this and utilize the graphs to make sure that we're hitting our thresholds. We're getting the like, uh, data that we need um, for like, let's say just uh, again, like top speed um, and that we're able to kind of make the proper adjustments and develop the guys as need be. So this is the other piece that I was talking about earlier of how this will kind of help us dose the days. This was something as I was kind of creating that three week model and putting things in there, I was like, well, if we're going to have a specific daily emphasis, I feel like with it being an emphasis, like we have to kind of say exactly what that's going to be. And that's where kind of building the framework out even more comes into play. So granted, this is a top down approach. When we're looking at the top, that's still going to be a foundational uh, piece of this puzzle, if you will. So the first one being posture. Um, and I will say, right, so we have lumbo pelvic control, we have core stability, those aren't necessarily the only things. But when I was creating this, I was thinking specifically to performance, best bang for the buck. And again, just trying to like start the conversation off. So I'm not, by not including mobility within that, I'm not saying that it's not necessarily important, but I'm just thinking like if I have the perfect athlete right now and I, and I just need to get him into like sprint form, like what are the, the first couple things I'm gonna address? So again, this is the early stage of it, but like as we go ahead and build our system out more, we would have the mobility pieces, we would kind of have more of the webbings of this created. So, but anyways, getting back to it, so, posture again looking at basically just like core control um, and being able to get good motion through the hips ultimately excuse me ultimately at the end of the day it's just um, establishing that and kind of how I go about it within drill work with guys would be beginning with kind of like supine and progressive standing um, that's like just a little bit of a reference to FMS for FMS level two um, just thinking basically really really rudimentary work and then progressing it into more challenging um, and just making sure that guys can maintain, maintain control and stability because especially when we're looking at speed development of like um, like elite level acceleration, elite level top speed, is like we need to make sure that guys are doing the basic things correctly to make sure it doesn't break down when we're working on the more complex things. So that would be like a posture day is working on some of those pieces. The next day or the next emphasis that we have here in the complexity model is just kind of looking at positioning. So with that, it's just, it's just basically establishing basic motor control patterns of deceleration, acceleration, and top speed. Um, in the left-hand column, I have it's kind of like force absorption drills. So that paired with some of our marches, wall drills, skips, plyos, I think the big emphasis for me there is just making sure that guys can absorb things, making sure that we develop the braking system um, before we start developing the motor. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big car guy, so that's a lot of the analogies that I make. Um, but it's, I'll kind of say like, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna soup a car up and you're not gonna take brakes from like a Honda Prius and put it on like a Ferrari or like a Corvette when you have a supercharger and things on there. So that's the way that I think of developing speed and just overall patterns in the weight room as well too, is I really want to make sure that guys can absorb the forces that we're getting, um, before they push it out. Because I feel like that's the easy thing, right? Is guys get really giddy. If, if we're lifting in the weight room, right, we're doing squats or something like that and a guy cuts depth, but, but he you know, feels like he got down there, was still a bit able to get the weight up, so he's all excited. So that's where kind of this position pillar comes in, is making sure that guys can get to the right positions, own it, absorb it, and then from there, build out. Lastly, we have the rhythm one, and that's really just kind of like the end of the complexity spectrum, if you will, but now it's just, ramping things up, higher intensity, actually getting guys to kind of get in there and get after it more. But this would kind of be how, how my mind works of developing this and dosing things accordingly uh, to basically help provide the different intensities for the day 
but then also pattern everything together to make sure that these guys are just developing the, the motor patterns that we need uh, to be able to display speed, uh, acceleration, things of that nature. So again, bringing it all back together here, is now hopefully it makes a bit more sense of when we're looking at if a guy has a posture and position day, it'll be medium intensity. Um, it could be low intensity too, but is that just gonna kind of drive what we're gonna have? So that's like for me, I had in there for drills, is like just making sure that we're working on like, uh, like spine mobilization and making sure that the guy can move appropriately throughout the spine, um, that we're getting him out of anterior pelvic tilt, that we're making sure he has good T-spine um, movement. Um, glute activation is important. Core stability, uh, again, dosing in some depth drops, some marches, some marches. But that's just kind of how I would go about of building this out. I will say in this presentation, I don't, I don't show like what a day per se will look at look like. But that's again, we're using some of these pieces of like that's how we formulate it. This is a little bit more of a zoomed out view. Um, but lastly, to kind of maybe get into that a little bit or like overarching progression of ex of speed and acceleration is uh, with my final slide here, but is <clears throat> just kind of how I would go about, uh, again, like looking at the progression of order of operations, if you will, to a degree, with still room to kind of move around on this. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, when I'm first getting a guy, I, I would say like whether it's an off-season camp, spring training, honestly, even in season two, uh, just with the new environments of moving up levels, things of that nature, I really like to make sure that there's some type of acclimatization phase to where it's just getting to know the athlete, um, probably not challenging him too much with high intensity work, just so that way I can see how they're patterning. I will say like within our system for being in professional baseball, we're obviously gonna have notes on these guys to pass on to other staff members, but it's really just, again, being able to kind of get my own time with the guy, see how he's moving, and then go, um, like, going appropriately from there. Um, after the acclimatization, and this kind of falls within it too, but is again, just making sure that the positioning, the deceleration work, that guys can really own that first uh, before I really start ramping it up. Then from there, I would, it'd be more linear speed stuff of just kind of like the initial acceleration, that initial takeoff and push, the positioning within that. Then also too, how are guys accelerating up to top speed? And then finally top speed within that linear speed. Um, again, I'll say like a lot of this for this progression is pretty self-explanatory and you can kind of per, per case of a player um, kind of move things around. But still I feel like this just for like a basic kind of checklist um, of again, after your linear work, you're getting into more lateral. And maybe in, I would say with this, the lateral, it's just like small lateral movements. From there, dose in some of the multi-directional, where maybe it's like the guy's, you know, cuts to the right, comes back. Um, or, well, sorry, that would be more of the change of direction, but the multi-directional, where it's like a guy's going to come forward, come back, uh, out to the side, and then he's going to go to the other side. But just kind of like, I guess, making sure that within this system and within this progression, that guys are able to own the basics, like I was saying, and then that we also have this little flow chart to basically be able to go back, reflect, see how guys are doing, um, and again, just kind of uh, progress guys as need be. So with that, guys, I'm getting up on my time. Um, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening in. Um, I would love any feedback um, at all on all this stuff. And uh, again, hopefully this is able to provide a little bit of a framework of how to kind of think about how we can go about developing a system for speed within baseball. Um, I feel like I could ramble on and on and on about this um, because it's just what I'm passionate about. But again, at the end of the day, uh, I really hope this was able to kind of just get us thinking about how we can go ahead and develop that system. So thanks again, guys. I appreciate everything and uh, take care. Thank you, Casey. Great presentation. Uh, team, at this point, we're going to take a two minute break, uh, try to catch us up to speed a little bit. Um, we will run our vendor our vendor reel here to, to show our supporters um, for the for the webinar. And just a reminder to send in your, your questions into the Q&A box that we'll be able to answer after the afternoon portion of the webinar. So that wraps up the morning portion. Let's take a two minute break, uh, grab a drink, go to the bathroom, and we will come back here with Francisco Rivas for his presentation in a couple minutes. Thank you.
are building fast, fast athletes here. And the 1080 has been an integral part of that. If you're serious about performance and you're serious about you know, using data to make intelligent decisions, which why wouldn't you? The 1080 Sprint is a game changer. Historically, eating disorder treatment centers haven't really integrated fitness into their treatment model. And I think that the one thing that I love about McCallum Place and the Victory Program is that we do support safe and intentional integration of fitness into our program. A lot of our patients have struggled with kind of trauma around fitness and exercise or, or body shaming. So really being mindful of that and giving support to them is really important to me. I really want to create a safe and supportive environment that's non-judgmental so that they can come in and really work through the struggles that they have. All right, two minutes goes fast. Um, here we are back at it. Um, afternoon session. Frankie Rivas uh, is a, a frequent contributor to our webinars, um, a big part of our society, entering his second season as the minor league strength conditioning coordinator and fourth overall with the Detroit Tigers. Uh, has worked in the industry for a number of years with Excel Health and Wellness. Um, also was a strength conditioning student. Uh, strength conditioning coach at Hannibal LaGrange University and one year as an intern at Diamond Fit Performance. Uh, Francisco has a master's degree in kinesiology from A.T. Still University uh, with an emphasis in orthopedic and sports psychology. Um, he is USAW performance coach level one certified as well as precision nutrition, nutrition coach level one certified. Francisco is going to speak to us today, present on developing ankle stiffness for speed development. Francisco, take it. Frankie, you're on mute. There you go. You can see my screen and you can see me. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, appreciate the time and appreciate once again the PVCS um, take, they inviting me to to speak about this. Um, it's, it's, it's a topic that I have in mind for a long time and, and in hopes to help um, in professional baseball, but also at the, at the high school and college level. Um, I will give you a lot of practical um, ideas as well as assessments. So I'm going to keep it short on the theory side. Um, so I go ahead and, and to my first slide. So today you should learn about ankle and foot assessment and how to identify limitations either from a, from a mobility standpoint or from a stability standpoint, uh, or even gait walking, like be able to analyze gait is, a, is an important aspect of, of longevity, but also of uh, performance. Uh, we, they will also learn uh, exercise progressions to develop ankle stiffness. And then finally, to kind of wrap it all together, you should be able to learn some running and change of direction progressions. The foot. So the foot is a highly complex uh, structure, right? Like it's, it's, you have the ankle joint, you got all the muscles around it, all the ligaments. It's about 26 bones, 33 joints, and over 100 muscles. Just as similar to our hands, they have the ability to do a lot of things. Um, it gives you a lot of proprioception. So it is, it's, it's our connection to the ground, right? Like every step we take, we get an idea of what's going on in our environment. And how can we uh, apply force into the ground? There, we have three arches on the foot. We have the lateral longitudinal arch, the middle longitudinal arch, and the transverse arch. Uh, in an average, we walk about, we can walk, I mean, there's a lot, especially strength coaches and even athletes, we, we spend a lot of time on our feet. So forces up nine average is about ton. So we think about walking with a truck of cement, um, cement, the whole day, you know? So we, we're spending a lot of time um, putting force into the ground. So even though it's a small structure, a small joint, um, it takes a lot of force and a lot of energy through the course of the day. 
So it's, we have to make sure that the arch is a, a strong structure because it helps to it help us stand, help us be in balance, it helps us to run and walk, and as well as jump. So it has to be flexible, but it has to also be strong to be able to express those uh, spring and its qualities that the, that the foot has. So here we can see basically the arch of the foot and how we have dysfunctional patterns. They, they occur from us spending too much time over shoes or not training the right way through the course of our, of our lifespan. So we have people that have uh, flat footed, as you can see on our, on our bottom diagram, and also you can see a dormal foot. So this is another way to assess the foot uh, and the arch. And you have guys that have a, a high arch. Um, if you have someone walking with um, sweaty feet, you can see these footprints that will tell you an idea, um, but you can also have the athlete set and you'll be able to see the flat footed. Um, a functional flat footed will be, as soon as you see them on a box, you should be able to see an arch. And as soon as they put weight underneath their feet, their, their arch collapses. So um, you have the non-functional um, flat footed, which is that we're born with, a, with kind of a deformation around the bones. And those takes a long time to change, um, but those are different ways that you can analyze the foot that we'll explain later. So the gait. So the biomechanics of human locomotion can be explained by the physics of pendulums and sprints, right? Um, when we walk, so if this is my ground, if I'm walking, I'm gonna hit, I'm gonna strike with my heel and I slowly tramper on my way to the front. Uh, this is what we call a pendulum. Even when we jog, it's kind of like a similar um, biomechanic. However, it changed when we start running and sprinting. So this is going to become from a more a pendulum kind of style to more a sprint. So I'll be able to store energy and release it quickly um, as the ground contact time decreases. So as you see on my graphic, um, as the ground contact increases, uh, we're also putting a lot of force into this joint, right? As, as we explained before, even though the ankle is a, is a small joint compared to other joints like the pelvis or um, the hip, um, it has a lot of springiness and strength to be able to disperse this force across all the joints. So um, it, it, it can hold to 400% of your body weight. And as you see, green will be a walking. So you can see that pendulum kind of style. Uh, when we go into jogging, kind of same thing, we're still putting more body weight. And as we go running, um, less time on the ground, it becomes more like a sprint going up and down. And as we sprint mass speed, you will see these changes. So if you see on the bottom diagram, uh, where we walk full contact with the heel and then we transfer the weight to the toe, um, jogging kind of similar. And as we start running, you're gonna see less of a contact with the heel until we get to sprinting. So we're gonna spend less time on the ground uh, to be able to transfer energy. This is where it was, it's important to have ankle stiffness uh, to prevent this heel from touching the ground and having a, a higher ground contact time. Um, ideally, the way they would attack the ground would be going from the, uh, from the pinky toe and going out to the middle and pushing with the big toe. This is how um, we were meant to, um, to attack the ground. The big toe is for balance. So when we walk, we're gonna, we spend more time on the, on the big toe, um, but as we get, um, I was trying to speed the gate. We're going to see more um, contact on this aspect of the foot, outside to the inside, kind of similar to when you see a pattern of throwing, right? Uh, we're going to supination to uh, pronation. So. so going into the foot assessment, um, it's important that we first assess the, the ability of the ankle to dorsiflex, right? So if we're talking about pendulum, if the ankle is not able to do this, then we won't be able to have a good pendulum. We won't be able to have a good spring. Um, so that will be the, the, the part number one. Uh, we call it gate test, but it's a gate test uh, from walking, but it's walking, we call it gate because they walk from one gate to another. Um, the hurdle step is basically the FMS screening um, and then a way to analyze the, the ankle um, stiffness. You can also do it with a 10 yard dash, either from behind or a side view. If you do a slow motion, um, reactive strength index or RSI, uh, it's also a great way to measure the ability of the ankle to be uh, spring, the springiness ability of the ankle. And then a counter movement jump, you can also analyze how, how the athlete um, force absorption technique looks like. So first we're gonna look at the ankle dorsiflexion test, which is, um,
Frankie, is there supposed to be con are we supposed to hear this person talk? Yes. You don't? No. Okay, I'll talk through it then. Perfect. Yeah. So the ankle clearing test, as you see here, uh, we're gonna place the the address moleolus on the line of the FMS kit, or it can be uh, any kind of device, uh, as long as you can kind of mark that area of the ankle. Then we we actually testing the the back foot. So give give a stick or something from balance. It can be a wall. Um, the athlete is actively trying to drive the the back knee forward without letting the heel live in contact with the ground. So here we can assess ankle dorsiflexion. Um, it's also important that we ask the athlete where do they feel the stretch, right? So if they feel some kind of restriction on the front of the joint, then we have um, kind of like a similar, like an impeachment from the hip. So we can attack that area with like mobilizations from a like training room standpoint or um, pels and rails, if you're familiar with FRC uh, kind of modalities. If you feel like it stretches in the back, now we have a soft tissue limitation. So we're talking about like um, deep tissue work, um, mobility work, things like that. It will help clear some of those issues. So once we, so you have a, if it goes past the line, it will be a three. If it goes out the line, it will be a two. And if it goes behind the line, it will be a one, kind of similar to like an FMS screening. Um, and the idea is like, we're trying to get to three because like ankle is actually one of the most important joints in the, in the body uh, because it spends so much time in the ground and so much time on the on, on our feet that's important that it's a it's a quality movement joint okay so i'll talk through the next one for gate test so so first what we want to do we want to have the athlete standing up Right, so we're trying to look at their arches, right? How their joint is stacked in front of each other. Um, so good arches will create a straight line between the knee and the hip. Um, so if we were to look at the foot as the hand, right? You're gonna see a lot of different uh, patterns, right? You're gonna see uh, an ankle that collapses because the big toe is too close to the rest of the foot. Um, so we'll look here on the video what happened when that, when that occurs. Um, Yep. So if we see that connection that we have a flag arch, we're going to see more more stress on the knee. We're going to see valgus stress happening at the knee. Um, hips are going to be internally rotated, so they're going to lack some external rotation. Now, if you think about it, we put in 400% uh, uh, of our body weight every time we sprint. Now, if we have a defic deficient pattern or a deficient structure, uh, this will find the weakest link. With most of the timing athletes, either knee or hips or back, so they will start having back pains just because the arch is not able to create that spring, um, spring in this and trying to disperse that energy. So once we understand how they how the ankle works, we have them walk and see if they can maintain those good arches as they walk. Um, you can also look at the upper body if they're able to rotate, um, but you're looking to see how they attack the ground. You, you see that pendulum kind of style, as you see them walking, as you can watch in the video. Um, you can see bad patterns there, you know, stepping with the inside of the foot. So that's a good way to assess the athlete if you have them walk. Um, and I would like to spend more on the on what I talk about the foot, right? So if you look at your palm and your palm is you can spread your fingers apart. You should be able to do the the same with your toes. Um, so if you think about it, the big toe, if we bring it closer to the other um, toes, it's going to collapse. So it's going to look like this. Going in, and as soon as we are able to mobilize that big toe, you're gonna see, or you're gonna start noticing that your arch starts building up. So the first thing we want to look is at the toes, because most of the shoes kind of restrict uh, toe mobility. So if we can get athletes to understand that their foot should be able to spread out, move independently, like big toe and um, the other four toes, uh, we should be able to understand how to create a stronger arch first. And then once we carry a stronger arch, now we can train in and make sure that we can start training some ankle dorsiflexion. Um, for the hurdle step, we're basically trying to see if they can maintain these patterns in a dynamic way. Now that we stop them walking, now we want to see how they can maintain their weight in a in one leg. It's pretty straightforward um, assessment from my FMS. So we have the athlete with their toes touching the board. Uh, they will step across the core. We're trying to measure the lateral, um, lateral aspect of the knee. 
you're going to step across and you're trying to look at the ankle and see how it stabilizes, if it's a little wobbly, if it collapses, if the arch collapses, um, and if they're not able to maintain an upright posture. So we're looking at core, we're looking at ankle, and we're looking at hip mobility. So faulty movements, you will see about posture, dumping the kit forward, going around the hurdle, things like that. So it's so another way to assess ankle function, but also hip. Um, when we look at the counter movement jump, right? So here we have the same athlete. Um, actually, he had Tommy jump last year. Um, when we when we assess his jumping, you can see how uh, when they land, you can see ankle collapsing on the on the left leg. You can see it again there. So this will tell you the lack of ankle stiffness or ankle stability. Um, and then through the course of his rehab, that's one of the things that we attack. And even if we pause it, right, let's see. Uh, a good thing about having, being in a way where, you know, it's just hard to clean, but you can also see how the arch um, is tainted from the ground and how it's different from side to side. When you, if you look on the right side video, uh, you can see more even arches. So after proper training, you can see he's attacking the ground symmetrically, having a, a really strong ankle that will transfer not just to running, but also to pitching and um, and hitting. So that's a way to also assess the, the foot from um, from an ankle stiffness standpoint. When we look at the at the 10 yard dash from behind or from the side, we're gonna show you first what a poor ankle stiffness will look like. So you can have a, a um, behind view or a side view. You're gonna slow them down. And you can see what we're talking about, right? Like we wanna keep the heel from touching the ground when we're sprinting. It's not a pendulum because then we're going to spend more time in the ground, which um, results in slower times. Um, these are the guys that you say they're a heavy foot that you can hear them run because uh, it should be a spring like, not a pendulum like, right? It shouldn't be a slap um, or rather just a quick tap from the spring, loading the spring and unloading the spring. So if you were to do the side view for, for these guys, this is what it will look like as well. You can see the full contact of the foot there, right? Um, so now let's look at a, at a good ankle stiffness, either from the front and back. Um, so look for these patterns when you see your players running and uh, see how they progress as you challenge their ankle stiffness. We want to look at from the side, it's a little more visible. You can see how like the heels stay in the air floating, um, keeping a strong foundation and acting as the spring as it runs faster and faster. So those are um, some of the assessments that you can do with the technology that's available, depending on what you have. You might have, you might have an FMS kit, you might have a camera, everybody has a camera. So um, you don't need any kind of crazy like force plate to see what the RSI is unless you have that. The RSI will give you a, a peace of mind and see how they progress from a number of, um, numerical standpoint. Uh, but you can also see the same results through film. So how can we develop ankle stiffness, right? So we can do it in the way we can do it running. Uh, with the first step will be to create the mobility, right? So if a guy has a one on the ankle or like he has some limitations on ankle mobility, we want to attack it as we spoke before, like pelvis and rails is, is one of the the easiest technique and easy to provide to the athlete that has the most impact in changing um, brain of motion. Can you hear this video? So the goal of the pelvis and relos is to distract the joint and create more space, but also strengthening the new range that you have. Um, so that's like a quick, quick way to continue to develop ankle mobility 
um, and then push strength. Once we create the mobility, we want to stabilize the pattern. So we talk about um, exercise that will levitate the heel, like keeping the heel in the air um, and holding for time. So if we were to look from the side, it looks like a, an athlete is accelerating in that position. So it's a good way to create awareness of like posture. Uh, the core is working to stay up in that position. And now we're working on keeping the strengthening the knee flexion and things that are required for high speed. Once we stabilize the pattern, we can strengthen the pattern. Um, we can do uh, ankle springs. Here we have field triple A strength coach working on ankle sprints. Uh, you can hold it to, um, to a rack or you can do it in the air, but it's another way to strengthen in the, the foot. Once we strengthen it, we can start loading the pattern to continue to challenge that. You can use lemma, you can use a, a sledge. So this will be loading it isometrically. And then we're gonna try to challenge it dynamically. So here you see me switching legs in the air and holding my ankle stiffness. Now that we challenge it dynamically, we wanna load it dynamically. There's many ways, but this is another sample in the heel off the floor while driving the knee. So this will, will challenge also core strength and then um, the psoas and hip flexors, things that are required um, for speed development. So how can we, so now that we went from weight room, how can we start transferring to the field? Um, of course, running will, will create these adaptations as well, but we need to make sure that the guys, they learn how to accept forces, just like Casey mentioned, like that was a pretty good progression. Um, learn to upset and repel forces, right? So we talk about if you learn to accept forces, it will be more like a pendulum, right? Only accepting forces, but I'm never pushing back. Uh, once we know how to uh, accept forces, we want to repel them quickly. We want to act like a sprint. So we, we accept the force and we want to spend as less time accepting the force to repel it with even more force. Uh, once we understand these principles, then we start developing some rhythm um, to to help the athlete create this uh, connection between lower half and upper half. We overload these patterns. We make it reactive and competitive. At the end of the day, remember most of these guys have to react to the stimulus, either fielding or running on a straight line. Uh, and then if you have even more time to continue to develop it, you will overspeed it. So what you see on the next videos is um, random movements, but they're all gonna follow one of these principles. Um, this is uh, one of our off-season training for position players. You're going to see some of the drills that we did in the off-season with them. And the, the, one of the guys is the guy that you saw in the videos with really good uh, ankle stiffness and development. So we love the stairs here. Everybody has in the stadium. It's a good way to learn and set forces. So here you will see like a quick routine that we did on the on the stairs here in uh, Tiger Town. So here you can see he's accepting and repelling forces, heel is touching the ground, which is fine. We want to train all aspects, but then we go into a little more reactive movements. Um, they require for the for the for the heel to be in the air. Now he's starting to start working into rhythm. So when we go up the stair, he can start working on on loading one side and going to the other, kind of similar to what you see when they sprint. We, we did some uphill sprinting. Um, curvilinear, we we're kind of blessed to have this heel going both ways. So we can do curvilinear patterns, but also um, in different surfaces. So that's also another part Like you have to watch what kind of surface you're using because it's going to require different uh, demands from the ankle, right? Um, concrete is a little um, stiffer, so it's going to, Improve, it might improve ankle stiffness, but also it's going to overload a lot of the tissue like knees and hips because it's a harder surface to push from compared to a grass when some of the forces are absorbed by the ground. Um, so make sure that you um, paralyze it accordingly. Here we have some drills, A runs with the stick overhead, cycle. So this is to develop some rhythm. Wicked drills. And then here we finish with some reactors. So here we're throwing baseballs at the outfielders and he's running as he's trying to chase different balls. As I say, this is just random. It doesn't have to um, progress accordingly to what you see here. You can have, you can start with a drill that has set forces and then go right away to something that's a little bit on rhythm. 
um, we like to train in, uh, in a very variable environment so that way they are able to adapt. So here you can see him moving the sled. Going backwards, you're gonna see more like a pendulum kind of pattern, but going forward, you will see more of a, a spring kind of pattern, Bulgarian split squats. I mean, this is one of the exercises we use to develop speed for obvious reason um, and a stagger single leg RDLs. Then another day we took them down up to a hill in the in the grass. So now we changed the environment. Now we're going uh, uphill, which is required for them to pull more force into the ground, keeping the heel off the floor with the broad jumps. There's different varieties you can do um, in different environments. Power skip, backward walks, backward runs, even bear crawls, because it kind of teach them the rhythm of what sprinting was gonna look like. We went uphill and we went downhill. So we're showing everything uphill, but uh, that day we did downhill to overload the system. And then we finished with some curvilinear sprints um, in a different uh, environment, right? This is the gravel and the in the in the, um, the track. Then with that day we do some step ups. And let my, just to kind of trigger the same posture required for sprinting. This is a pretty heavy day, so you're gonna notice here. <laughs> this is another day we're working also rhythm, change of direction basics, dissecting the force and repelling the forces, co coiling and uncoiling to one side and the other. So it's lower tempos, but creating a better rhythm and understanding, um, overloading with bands, understanding that they, they have to stay between their the center of mass as they're trying to change direction. Um, and the goal is to challenge them. It shouldn't, it, should, it shouldn't be easy. If you see mistakes, it's because they have to figure out a way to learn their environment and get better at it. Some deceleration work. Change of direction, both assisting and resisted. And we'll finish, finish there with some accelerations and stopping, going forward, accelerating, coming back. So you can see all these good patterns in different um, environments and variables, but they all should follow kind of like the six here, learning to accept forces, learning to accept and repel, rhythm, overloading, and being reactive and competitive. Here with the other competition. So the colors in front, they're supposed to move laterally. This was a uh, fail on their side. If it comes in the back, if I yell a color in the back, uh, the person in, in in the back becomes the the runner, the person in, in, in the front becomes the tagger. So you would yell the colors, red, blue, orange, white. And then when I yell a color that's in the back, this, he's supposed to tag the other guy. But that's what you want. You want some... Uh, chaos in the environment that you're training because this is what baseball is all about. It happens really fast now with the clock being uh, even faster. We have to create a little chaotic environment so that they can respond accordingly to the stimulus that is given. These are some of the resources that you can find uh, uh, if you want to dive deeper into um, ankle stiffness and how to create a plan for, for developing speed. Uh, Joel Smith, I mean, he has a great book, Speed Strength. I uh, recently read this book um, by Jen Pilati and Darian Barr. Um, Altis came and meet with us last last year, and then we got a lot of it. So we learned from all different um, um, professionals professionals um, in order to see what, what is out there and how we can make our athletes better. If you have any questions, you can email me to the Tigers email. I will be here for the, for the Q&A as well. Uh, you have my phone number there, my social media. Um, any consultations will be through uh, to my business there. Um, but I, I appreciate the time once again. Um, the PVSCCS um, it's always give me the the platform to to continue to educate all the coaches out there, so we can have better talent in the field in the future. Appreciate it. Thank you, Francisco. Outstanding presentation, and that last slide is uh, hit hits hits my heartstrings, man. I was a uh, born and raised in Michigan, and 1984 Tigers, my bet, my favorite team ever. Tram, Lou, Gibby, Parrish, all those guys. So nice job. Thanks a lot.
Yeah, Trammell has some really good ankles, let me tell you. That's why he plays. <laughs> He's still working out nowadays. Hall of Fame, baby. Hall yeah. of Fame. <laughs> All right, next up, Logan Jones. Uh, Logan hails from Zebulon, North Carolina. In his sixth year of strength conditioning with professional baseball, his first five seasons were with the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks, and he is in his first season with the White Sox. His undergraduate degree is from Guilford College in exercise and sports science, uh, degree in exercise and sports sciences and health sciences. Uh, Logan played baseball for the, uh, for the Quakers there at Guilford College. Uh, also did his internships with the University of Kentucky and Wake Forest. Uh, he is an, a registered strength and conditioning coach uh, through the NSCA. He is a USAW uh, weightlifting certified level one practitioner as well as, as well as a licensed massage therapist. Um, Logan is studying his graduate degree with, in sports management at the University uh, at North Carolina State University. Uh, he and his wife, Courtney, reside in Winston, Salem, North Carolina. Uh, Logan's title of his presentation today is Hamstring Return to Play, a case study. I'm very excited about this presentation. Uh, Logan, take it away. Good afternoon. Hope all is well. My name is Logan Jones. I'm in my first season as a strength and conditioning coach with the Chicago White Sox. This is my sixth year in professional baseball, spending the previous five with the Arizona Diamondbacks. Before we hop in here, I just want to take a second and acknowledge a couple of folks. First and foremost, Matt and company with the PBS CCS. Thanks so much for this opportunity and platform to share this afternoon. And secondly, Katie Stone, physical therapist with the White Sox. Katie was very integral in helping me to put together this PowerPoint presentation and consolidate thoughts and philosophies, hopefully in a digestible manner for you all this afternoon. So thanks so much, Katie. Before we hop in here, I guess a full disclaimer. Today's presentation is going to be a reflection of uh, my bias, experience, conversation with mentor, uh, conversation amongst staff, um, both with the Arizona Diamondbacks, the Chicago White Sox, and elsewhere. My pro prior knowledge of um, maybe things that I found to be successful, things that maybe don't work so well in professional baseball. Since we are doing a hamstring return to play, a case study, this is a very real example of something that occurred in our organization. Uh, in a previous season. So we're, we're taking and pulling from prior knowledge of that specific athlete, individual. Um, we're looking at objective and subjective uh, measurements. So for there, we're thinking different criteria that we're considering um, when we're making some of our decisions. Continuing education and then ultimately just practicality. So what we find to be successful working in our environment that is professional baseball, um, obviously things may look a little different at the major league level, the minor league level, and certainly they will they would be different as well at the collegiate level, the high school level, in the private sector, and so on. But for the sake of time, today's presentation is going to focus mainly on uh, the overarching philosophy and structure, thought process um, behind a scenario of a low grade hamstring strain in professional baseball in season. Um, we do have resources that we can provide. Um, and when I say we, I I'm talking Katie and myself that we can provide to anyone who may uh, have any further interest or, or seek any further conversation in, in uh, regards to maybe this specific scenario or, or maybe just some intel on something that may, may help you in your position and whatever role that you hold working with your athletes. But for the sake of today, we're going to focus on more of the overarching philosophy and, and steer clear of uh, maybe some of the specifics of you know exercise selection and specific intervention, because I think that those are going to be highly dependent on uh, maybe where you are and, and where where you are and you're helping your athletes. Three objectives that that are established for today's presentation. For the first for the first thing here, provide general philosophy and a sample progression relevant to a low grade hamstring strain return to play in professional baseball. Secondly, communicate specific constraints or challenges of operating in professional baseball, uh, specifically as it relates to return to play in season. And then lastly, discuss the importance of a collaborative approach when developing a plan of attack. And, and when I say plan of attack, we're thinking calendars, exercise plans, and different resources that may go into some of the decision making, some of the considerations that, that, are, uh, that are kind of thought through as we were establishing this plan. 
since this is a case study here, we're, we're just going to provide some, I guess, some contextual information um, that kind of can just serve as an example of pertinent information that uh, Katie and I considered um, in putting together this content. However, I think that this should be framed uh, or leveraged in a way that it, it stays at that place. Like this is information that's specific to our situation. However, this will be different for each of you in, in your construction of your own return to play protocol for whatever injury and whatever environment um, that you're working here. So I'll just quickly run through some background information on this specific player. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we're looking at a low grade right biceps femoris, uh, more distal, so down closer to the, the knee. Um, this gentleman is a, a middle infielder. He hits from the right side, his mechanism of injury. Uh, he was underrunning or sorry, underway base running from second, to third um, at this in this instance. He does have a prior history of a left hammy strain and then also an undiagnosed left ankle sprain in spring training. So just kind of keep that in mind. Like th these this is these are bits and pieces of information that we pull from um, when establishing the plan and kind of a, a, uh, creating a roadmap, if you will, for uh, this gentleman's rehab process. An ETA here of approximately three weeks. So we're looking from out from a date of injury, a full blown return to play, um, nine innings in the game, playing a position at three weeks. So that kind of helps us work backwards from um, what our end goal is in mind and establishing what's the most appropriate protocol as we as we work through. Just some subjective information here. This guy's a strong work ethic, loves a weight room, has a good relationship with the training room. Um, we look to seek information. Um, from some of his skill coaches that could help guide us uh, more appropriately in our in our practices, I guess that you could say, as we navigate these three weeks of rehab. Um, we reached out to the hitting coaches, our infield coordinator, and, and got some information. From a hitting standpoint, hitting coaches communicated he has kind of trouble loading his right hip, um, which makes sense because as we get into our some of our more um, objective information here, you'll see that he has a bilateral hip restriction. Um, so that's just contextual information to help us make a decision from a fielding standpoint over the course of the season leading up to this injury. Uh, it was it was realized or noticed that he had decreased first step quickness uh, defensively just in drill work, but it was kind of noticeable too. Uh, it carried over into more of a competition environment, which was certainly concerning. And then his preset um, before before the pitch kind of changed to offload um, what appeared to be that left ankle sprain that we later found about found out about um it went undiagnosed in spring training primarily uh, because he was looking to make a team some objective information here some baseline data from a hardware standpoint so hardware i'm talking for the most part passive range of motion assessment bilaterally restricted through the hips uh, lacks true hip extension on both sides anterior pelvic tilt so you can think lower cross in that instance um, because of that, hamstrings are long. They're disadvantaged from a link tension relationship, um, which also leads to weak adductors. And, and uh, some of our data that we got from his left hamstring outer strength uh, in spring training was a little bit all over the place. Because this is a hamstring injury, we looked at uh, Nordboard Nordic numbers. His right hamstring max force uh, was at a, a pretty significant deficit. But his numbers were all over the place in general. So kind of raising the question of what was his intent with, with the testing as well. And uh, maybe timeliness of our, of our testing could have been a little bit better to create a more consistent baseline for him. Uh, the screen numbers. So we're, we're looking at more of a uh, active range of motion screen in the weight room. Pretty much confirmed all of our hardware restrictions that has touched on. But highlighted the importance of needing pelvic control. Um, an emphasis on unilateral work, both from a warm-up corrective standpoint, but then also from his weight training. A lot of our focus has shifted um, to the to lower body, in particular uh, unilateral work. There, we're not going to roll through uh, the live video just for the sake of time here, but we we did utilize video and looking at some running mechanic type things to help us uh, better prescribe some interventions as we move through this process. Um, as we saw him underway, he was a little bit toey um, on the right side specifically. And what I mean by that is um, at, at, at foot contact, he was whole foot contact striking from above underneath the hip on the left side. However, on his right, he was kind of casting out um, a little too toey on the right foot strike in, in front of center of mass, putting a lot of stress and strain on that right hamstring, which now in retrospect makes makes a lot of sense. 
Um, he seemed to be falling a little bit when he was running, so I, I think that was probably just his way of keeping from from falling. Um, was that he was casting out and foot striking in front of the center of mass. We ran him through a T drill, and he kind of collapsed a little bit on his right side when he was changing direction. Um, so maybe that's force absorption, maybe that's eccentric con control. And then I made a note here that it makes sense with his capacity issue. So if he doesn't have the ability to kind of load and unload that right side or both sides in this instance, it would make sense that he's not able to eccentrically control and 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 uh, re redirect himself and produce force in a different direction. Here's some of the videos. Like I said, we're not going to run through it, but if, if, if this type of thing piques your interest, please feel free to email me. I'll provide my contact information at the end um, and we can go from there. So developing a plan, what do we do with all of this information? Um, I think that this is an important thing to talk about because I think this is most applicable um, to what uh, I guess is, is going to help most people moving forward because every situation is going to be different. Um, the environment in different situations are different, even with the same in the same uh, in the same game of, of baseball, like there, all of these situations will be a little bit different. And maybe to be honest with you, maybe this, this specific rehab plan gets carried out 10% of the time and 90% of the time we have to make an adjustment. So I think having a plan in which to operate is important, but possessing the ability to adapt is essential. So from a planning standpoint here, we just got to take into consideration the goals of of the athlete, of the sports medicine team, the performance team, and then ultimately the organization. Working in professional baseball, these different uh, units have to work in tandem to, to establish, you know, baseline objectives, and then also how are we going to achieve those objectives. We have to consider whether there are constraints or challenges that are going to be in the way of us achieving these goals. So what could possibly go wrong? Um, what could happen that are going to help us from getting us to where we want to be? The demands of the sport and the environment. So the demands of the sport, we're talking baseball here, and then the environment, that would be uh, maybe the level of play. It might be geographic location. Um, and there are a, a whole host of, var of, var uh, of factors that could be in consideration here. So understanding where you are, where, you're, where your players are asked to show up and perform on a nightly basis, and then what are some of the variables at play that could hinder those, the, those goals from being achieved. Ideal versus reality. This is important here. I think from a planning standpoint, we kind of plan for ideal because that way we have an established plan in place. However, reality is what could happen, what will happen, I should say. Um, and what are our contingency plans to, to deviate and adjust off of our ideal uh, best case scenario? What are our resources available? So by resources, I'm talking staff, equipment, space, timing. Um, what are these things going to look like? Because all of these will help us uh, carry out the best plan for the athlete. Uh, unfortunately, we may not be able to, to carry out our plan A um, at all times just because of spatial restrictions, because of timing, um, but we're being pulled in different directions as well. Um, and ultimately, sometimes the athlete himself or herself can be a hindrance to us carrying out uh, what we feel like is the best plan as well. And then, and then this is an important one. What are the standards or the guidelines? So having an enforceable standard. I think we need to verbalize and declare this on the front end so that way we can create accountability and hold people accountable as we move throughout this rehab process uh, or, or else we're, we're just caught in between and, and there are gaps in training and, and then it's a, you know, a, a, a finger pointing game to determine whose fault it is that this was missed or that was missed or this person had an incidence of re-injury. And I, so I think just establishing a standard or a guideline on the front end helps to streamline um, the process moving forward. So this was kind of our plan uh, with this gentleman for a, a low grade right hammy, three week return to play. These were kind of our goals, our priorities that we set. And I'll quickly run through these. And as I mentioned, we'll kind of focus on, on more of our planning and maybe less on the actual exercise selection and stuff as we, as we move forward, just for the sake of time. So, we want to maintain his aerobic base. So when I'm when I'm talking aerobic base here, I'm thinking mainly from a recovery standpoint. So the ability to recover and regenerate in between bouts of effort, in between sessions of work. Um, obviously, this isn't very important from a return to play and injury standpoint. Work capacity. So the ability to repeat high uh, intensity efforts over and over again. So we're thinking globally. So from more of an aerobic standpoint, but then also locally at the hamstring. Um, and we want to monitor fatigue um, as we you know, look to increase his capacity to handle uh, workload. 
we want to increase drill work and, and mechanics as soon as possible. So we want to get him out in a competition environment, out on the field, um, obviously in a controlled situation, um, but we want to get him on the ground, increase ground, ground contacts, create shapes that are very similar to what he's going to be asked to do when he returns to play. The quicker that we can get him out on the field and doing some running mechanics type, type stuff, the better, especially for a low grade uh, hamstring strain. We want a gradual smooth ramp of progressions in general. We want to do our best to fill the gaps and kind of avoid um, these gaps in, in training from a weight room standpoint, from a training room standpoint, from a blending standpoint, when we get ready to move um, out onto the field in more of a skill type environment. Like sometimes it's easy to overlook these different variables that are at play and we have to do our best to create a smooth ramp of progressions for him. We want to utilize his lighter running days as we roll through our calendar to challenge him in other ways. So this may come in the form of supplementary conditioning in the weight room. It may come in the form of um, some active region, flow, movement, uh, circuity type deals in the training room, in the weight room, just looking for unique ways to challenge this individual when we're not when we're not asking him to up level um, his his effort and such on the field. We want to develop effective warm up routine to implement post rehab. Um, so this is important. We want to utilize these three weeks to uh, get ahead of the curve and making sure that we mitigate the risk of reincidence of injury. So we basically want to equip him with the skills necessary to build his warm up routine, an effective warm up routine to implement post rehab to address all of his needs and actually put him ahead of the curve. We want to come out of these three weeks better than we found, or sorry, better than we came into them. Okay, for the calendar here, this is basically just a, a summary, I guess you could say, of specific tasks to be completed on a daily basis. Now, within each task, our methods are, are targeted towards achieving a specific goal or outcome. But just in general, this is this is a summary of those tasks. So try not to get too caught up, as I mentioned, in maybe some of the specifics. What matters is more of the overarching uh, philosophy and goals. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I'm going to walk through week one goals, week two goals, week three goals, and I'm going to kind of click through um, the specific exercise plan, because I'm not sure that, that that's all that pertinent. And if you again, if you have interest or if questions or, uh, or anything, please feel free to reach out to me um, at the end of the day. And I'd be more than happy to share anything that I have that can help anyone along in their journey. So week one goals here. As we look as we look through these different weeks, I think in general our progression kind of models. Um, we, you know, we're we're starting from a closed chain perspective, moving to open chain. We're going smaller range of motion to larger ranges of motion, lower velocities to higher velocities, et cetera. You kind of get the gist. We're we're basically looking to start him at a foundational level and then progress on as we see fit. Um, both from a subjective and an objective uh, testing standpoint, we want to see, you know, somewhat of a linear progression. It's not going to be, it's not going to be perfect, but we want to see somewhat of a linear progression as we move throughout these three weeks here. Progressions are just examples. Um, focus on the principles. So week one here, our general focus is going to be restoration, restoring movement quality, maintaining and developing aerobic base. I touched on that a minute ago in our objectives. Increasing work capacity, so we're looking at repeat efforts locally and globally, and intro and expand on drill work. And by drill work, I'm talking running mechanics. We're talking is like return to play running progression, specific drills that we're equipping him um, with, creating the shapes that we want to create, increasing ground contacts, and uh, basically moving him towards a position where he's going to be comfortable return to play. So you can see here. Uh, the first couple of days, both from a, a strength perspective and also from a rehab focus, the focus is on restoration, movement quality, and aerobic base. We're looking to, to restore pain-free range of motion, re restore his hamstring strength, improve core hip strength, get him in a better position. Like This is really a time where we can address some needs um, because that's, that's really all we can do uh, within 24, 48 hours of this hamstring. Now, if you look two, three, four days out, he was out sick on the 27th. We start our mechanic drill work on the 28th. So we're looking at 72 plus hours post-injury 
Um, we're getting them outside for linear wall drills, running mechanics, low level plyometrics. So low level plyometrics, I'm talking line hops, jump rope, stuff like that. Um, we're looking to increase his aerobic base. So this is really like from a recovery standpoint, we want to um, promote a, a, a place from a heart rate standpoint that we're going to move him towards a parasympathetic state where we're really going to train uh, nasal breathing and getting him basically recovered from any kind of workload that we're throwing his way. And then as we progress throughout the week, as we get towards the end here, we're going to introduce some work capacity stuff. So this, this, this first one's going to be a repeat glycolytic one to one. It's going to be 30 seconds on 30 seconds off. You can see I put purposeful intent, 75% effort. As we move through the different weeks, we'll, we'll see too, like some of our, our work to rest and some of our intervals start to change to replicate more of a demand of, of baseball. But for week one here, we're just general in nature. Here's a week work or sorry, a week one exercise plan. I'm going to skip through it for the sake of time. We'll go to week two. Week two here, our, our focus shifts toward work capacity. So as I've mentioned, that's repeat efforts. As we move into week two, some of our on-field uh, drill work and running can actually start to couple as his conditioning. In week one, we're just not able to be outside on his feet at a high enough intensity to, to do that such a thing. So most of our conditioning, true conditioning week one is gonna be inside. We're gonna expand the drill work. We're gonna intro and expand the skill work. So th that's important. We're starting to get him back in his element of uh, in a baseball environment. So we're, as we up the skill work, we start to decrease some of our drill work. So you can see as running volume picks up, supplementary conditioning dials back. So our, as I just mentioned, basically our conditioning will start to be at least half and half outside, inside. We're looking to increase ground contact, create some tissue tolerance, some, some adaptation there uh, to make sure that he's well equipped to return to play. You can see here on the first, uh, down there towards the bottom, we're going to enter lateral wall drills, low level plyometric running mechanics. So we took him from a linear spot. Now we're going, we're looking more frontal plane laterals still from a drill standpoint. Um, and then as, as we progress throughout the week, we're going to hit some work capacity work. Now we're a one to two work to rest. So that would be an example would be like 20 seconds on 40 seconds off. We're starting to reduce the, the, uh, the, the interval of work. So because of that purposeful intent, the effort level goes up as, as the interval goes down, the effort level gets higher. You see here on day three, we're going to enter a lateral movement. So from there, we're talking mechanics. We're also going to run him through more of a dynamic warm up, and we're going to get into a little more of aggressive plyometric. So that might be skaters, Haydn's uh, 45 degree jumps. It may be like a rudimentary Altus series etc. We're just looking to add a stimulus as we go, but in a more of a linear fashion, a progression that makes sense for this individual and this situation, given the timeliness and the resources that we have available. As we progress throughout the week, you'll see here on, on, uh, on the fifth, we kind of have like a little bit of a benchmark day. We're going to progress as needed to this day, but then I put what we see will tell us where we are. So I think it's important as we go through this to assess and reassess, test, retest, to kind of figure out, okay, are things going as we planned? And if not, what are some contingency plans? How can we adjust and adapt accordingly to make sure that this guy is where he needs to be when he needs to be there? Um, so I think, as I mentioned earlier, this plan is nice. We've spent a lot of time putting it together. However, we may carry out this plan as written maybe 10% of the time. The other nine players that roll through this in the same low-grade hamstring, uh, middle infielder, right-handed hitter, et cetera, we may have nine, 10 different plans in place by the end of this thing, because what we see with our eyes and maybe some objective testing that we do may help guide us in a direction that may be more appropriate for him or her. You can see here at the end, we, we try to have some fun. So this on the six here, this is kind of what I'm talking about. He has a, a down day um, from running. It's a recovery regen day. So we're going to do a cardiac output circuit in the weight room. Have fun. We, we're going to implement some things, some games, but we're looking from a heart rate standpoint, 120 to 150 beats per minute, living in the aerobic zone to really push recovery and moving more towards a parasympathetic state. Week two exercise plan. All right, week three goals here. All right, so we're, we're I mean, we're looking at six, seven days, we're returning to play here. So this is where it gets uh, fun and, and we're picking up the velocity and intensity here too. So 
Week three, as our focus shifts towards on-field activity, drill work is selective. Okay, so our focus here is going to be skill work, not drill work. Okay, so we have to supplement his skill work, what he's being asked to do out on the baseball field appropriately. As we do more out on the field, we have to pull back a little bit in the weight room. We work together to determine a shorter routine he can take with him in prep for early work, BP, pregame activity as he returns to normal games and activity. So you can see here on the eighth, we're gonna intro base running. So we're putting him you know, out on the field in his element. At, to the, at this point, we've checked our boxes of a linear, from a linear standpoint, a lateral standpoint, more of a frontal plane. We've done some curvy linear running. We've done some change of direction. Now it's actually time to get him on the bases to see, okay, assess where we are and basically determine at what, you know, at what volume and at what intensity can we kind of progress this thing to ensure that we're ready to go for him to return to play on what would be the 15th here. So you can see on the ninth, we continue on building on drill work. So we're adding in reactionary, external stimuli. So uh, visual or auditory stimulus, similar to what he's going to be, you know, asked to respond to in game. Um, we're, we're on the bases at 180 yards, which is a relatively low volume. And ideally we'd like his effort level to be 70 plus, like we're looking at a seven out of 10 RPE ish. Got to be careful prescribing percentages because that's very subjective and not everyone's percentages are the same. However, it can give us a, a, a ballpark framework in which to operate. Skip, a, skip ahead a couple of days. We're getting them off the bases again on the 11th. We're ramping it up to 240 yards. Um, we'd like his effort level here to be 90 plus. So more, more game like, um, and, and if, and if all goes well, we get the distance and the yardage that we're looking for at the intensity that we want. We've kind of checked our last box here from a, from a running return to play standpoint. Um, and we actually get him in game the next day as a DH. So it's important as he starts his game work for us to really, really monitor uh, workload in game and, and what the distances and the intensities of his high speed running are. Um, because if he's not able to get what volumes we would like to get here as we go DH on the 12th, five to seven innings at shortstop on the 13th, an off day on the 14th, and then he's a full-blown nine-inning guy in the in the field on the 15th. If he's not able to get that workload, um, the, the capacity that we're looking for, we will need to supplement his uh, base running volume and distance as necessary. So you can see here on the 14th, the day before he returns full go, we kind of have a needs-based day. We kind of determine, we check in, we figure out, okay, are there any, is there anything that we're missing? How are you feeling? Or is there anything that you feel unsure about that we feel like we can kind of fill the gaps here before you go full blow uh, nine inning game? Week three exercise plan. All right, in summation here, some, just some general thoughts. I think that I, I put this slide together, hopefully just to consolidate a lot of information thrown at you in a very short amount of time. And again, I, I, would, I would encourage um, conversation and, and interaction um, at the end of the day, and and I'm going to provide my email and, and my social media to, to encourage um, that. I welcome any kind of feedback that you may have. Um, but here, here are just some general thoughts to hopefully frame this in a, in a way that makes a little more sense. So in establishing this plan, we consider what, what is our goal, why is this our goal, and how are we going to get there? So as I mentioned, having an enforceable standard, that's, that's kind of our goal, our expectation. Why is this the case? We have to have a why behind what we're doing and then how are we gonna get there? So that's our roadmap. We can always add, but it's tough to take away. So, so kind of uh, proceed with caution. It's a gradual ramp of activity. Um, we can always add when appropriate, but if we tow the line and fall off the cliff, it's a little too difficult to, to pull the reins in that instance. And one uh, poor decision could cost us 24, 48, 72 hours in this in this guy's uh, return to play progression, which then causes us to kind of miss our our guideline of, or our, our, our uh, goal of return to play date. Ultimately, we're a problem solver. So I think it's important to have this plan in place. However, as I mentioned a, a few times now, we need to be able to, to assess and reassess and ask questions as to are we progressing at the rate that we want to progress? And if not, what is our, what is a contingency plan how are we going to deviate from what we currently have in place? Include the athlete as much as possible in the planning process when appropriate. Understand that that may not always be appropriate. It may not always be 
uh, the easiest thing to do, that conversation to have. However, I do feel like if the athlete has some autonomy and some say into what goes on as part of his or her rehab process, uh, the, the degree of buy-in and relatability is going to be that much better. The importance of communication. So that's building relationships through this process, the collaborative approach, as I mentioned before, within the medical team, but then also including skill coaches in, in our environment. It may be someone in the front office. Um, it may be someone that's physically at an affiliate. It could be someone that's back in, in Arizona or in Chicago in a rehab type environment. And the importance of communication. We have to hammer the basics of sleep, hydration, and nutrition. These are kind of, this is kind of the foundation in which we can operate. These are our controllables. If these aren't done well, um, we're walking uphill and trying to achieve some of the outcomes that we're looking to achieve from a return to play standpoint. And then ultimately just use rehab and return to play situation as a development opportunity for the athlete. This is a time where they're removed from a competition environment and, and we need to leverage this time appropriately to address some specific needs, Ch provide a change of pace that could create an environment for them to self-organize and figure things out on their own and take some accountability in, of, of their actions and maybe why it is that this is happening and do our best to make sure that we're not in the same situation again. Thank you so much for your time and attention this afternoon. I really do appreciate it. Again, as I've mentioned, here's my contact information. I'm more than happy to help anyone that I can along in their journey and whatever situation that you're in specific to um, today's presentation of a, of a hamstring return to play or not. It doesn't matter to me, but thanks so much for your time and attention this afternoon. Thank you, Logan. Great job. All right, next up is Kara Lynch, registered dietitian. Uh, Kara was a dual sport athlete, University of Alabama, and she graduated from the University of Alabama with a degree in with a degree in dietetics and is now a registered dietitian, uh, licensed uh, nutrition professional. Kara has worked with Florida State University uh, as well as University of Delaware as the first director of performance and nutrition. Uh, after Delaware, Kara went overseas to Dublin, Ireland, uh, where she was working towards her PhD in, on nutrition knowledge, attitudes, and behavior of female platform divers and coaches. Uh, Kara, Kara is currently the Director of Performance Nutrition for the Minnesota Twins, where she oversees both the major and minor league operations from nutrition. Uh, Kara and her husband, John, have two children, and they live in Naples, Florida. Uh, today, <clears throat> Kara is going to present on the, the presentation topic, the why the color red should be on your mind, relative energy defi deficiency in males. Kara? My name is Kara Lynch. I am the Director of Performance Nutrition at the Minnesota Twins, and I'm excited to chat with you guys about the color red today. So let's get started. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend live. So for anybody that knows me or has heard me present before, I really dislike lecturing going through presentations. So you know, without being there live, I'm going to, to do my best to get you guys thinking about a couple different areas of our topic today, which is why the color red should be on your mind, relative energy deficiency in males. Okay, so today's objectives. Today, you are going to become aware of relative energy deficiency or REDS. You're going to hear me refer to relative energy deficiency throughout this presentation as REDS. You're going to learn how to identify the screening and diagnostic tools of REDS. And then you're also going to learn the practical application to support the recovery of REDS and hopefully add a, a couple additional tools to your toolbox. Which athlete is healthier, the pitcher or the catcher? Both are six foot two, the pitcher is 200 pounds, catcher is 240, both have been diagnosed with low vitamin D. The pitcher is experiencing frequent muscle strains. We don't know how many times per day he is eating. The catcher we do know is eating five to six times per day and is not experiencing any frequent muscle strains. I'm gonna give you guys a second here to think about this and then we will chat through it. Okay, so there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer here. The goal is really to get you guys thinking as we go through this presentation for different signs and symptoms that might come up if a player is experiencing 
um, relative energy deficiency. Um, so what we're looking through here, we know that the pitcher is experiencing frequent muscle strains. However, we really don't know much about his food intake at this point. So we can't necessarily say that he is experiencing those muscle strains because of his food intake. Um, but then on the contrary, we do know that the, the catcher is eating five to six times per day. And we know that this catcher is, you know, not experiencing frequent muscle strains, isn't taking uh, multiple trips to the training room. So, you know, we might feel or think that this catcher is overall a little bit healthier. He does weigh, you know, 40 pounds more than the pitcher um, for being the same height, you know, clearly different positions here. Um, so just kind of keep this in the back of your mind as we're going through this presentation. So now, which athlete would you want to lose weight? We have our pitcher and our catcher here again, both six foot two. The pitcher is 200 pounds. The catcher is 240 pounds. Now the pitcher is approximately 15% body fat and the catcher is approximately 22% body fat. We now know that this pitcher eats approximately three times per day and is feeling frequently fatigued. And we know that the catcher is eating approximately the five to six times per day and is experiencing high energy. So I'm also going to give you just a second here to think through this and then we will chat about it. Okay, so also keep this in the back of your mind as we are going through this presentation. We can see that the catcher who weighs more and has a higher body fat percentage is fueling themselves a little bit more frequently and is experiencing higher energy levels and is not complaining of any frequent fatigue. We also know from our previous example that this catcher is not taking frequent trips to the training room. And then we know this pitcher who weighs 40 pounds less is, you know, 7% less body fat is eating. Um, and fueling themselves less throughout the day and is also experiencing those frequent muscle strains and is frequently fatigued. Now to bring us back to our first objective, we are going to learn about relative energy deficiency. So REDS is the energy deficiency that's relative to the balance between the dietary or the food intake and exercise energy expenditure. So overall, REDS describes the effects of a low energy availability on reproductive and bone health as outlined in the triad model that you can see on this diagram, the male and female athlete triad, as well as impairments in additional symptoms such as the gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, or psychological system. You can see all of these impacts in the bubbles that are listed on this diagram here. And if you're not familiar with what energy availability is, this is essentially the energy that's remaining for bodily processes after the energy cost of exercise is accounted for. So if you have an athlete who is essentially not matching their overall food intake to their training demands or to that exercise energy expenditure and you know, their body is utilizing all of the food intake that it's receiving, um, you know, for the energy cost of exercise, we can start seeing a lot of these metabolic adaptations where the body's going to start conserving fuel or energy, and it can affect all of these physiological systems. Now, I'm sure, you know, a couple of you might be familiar with the female athlete triad, and it wasn't really until 2014 um, that we started learning that this, you know, concept, not only the athlete triad, but relative energy deficiency was not only impacting females, that it was also, you know, playing a role in, in males and really impacting males. Um, now, Unfortunately, right now, we don't necessarily have specific literature within a lot of our, you know, anaerobic or high power, high intensity sports. We see more of our literature coming up within in the endurance space. Um, so there definitely are limitations to what we're going to chat through today. 
Um, I think, though, this is really just the icing on the cake for what we're going to be able to see, you know, in the future. Um, and so, you know, new research definitely needs to focus on the energy demands and performance criteria of males that are engaged in a range of sports and not, you know, only the endurance sports. So if we pull out the male athlete triad, this really exists alongside and independent of REDS. Um, and the male athlete triad is this syndrome of three interrelated conditions, including the energy deficiency or low energy availability, impaired bone health, and then suppression of the HPG axis. The key etiological factor of the male athlete triad is an energy deficiency, which may result in impaired reproductive and bone health. And this energy deficiency really refers to the level of energetic status where one or more metabolic adaptations have occurred. So what you see here are the metabolic adaptations that we do find if this you know, athlete is experiencing low energy availability. So we see a suppression of the resting metabolic rate or RMR. You might see a loss of body weight with a new low set point. You might see a low body mass index, BMI, um, or a suppressed T3, which is a thyroid hormone, or leptin, um, which is a hormone that's derived from adipose tissue. And, and this hormone typically helps regulate the energy balance by suppressing hunger. The primary clinical concerns are skeletal health and reproductive outcomes. Now, the outcomes are reversible. However, more research is needed to clarify the bone outcomes and to clarify if this athlete has a low bone mineral density, if that actually is reversible. You know, we also know that consistent, consistently low blood glucose may lead to increased cortisol and that reduced T3 that we already chatted about, in addition to lower muscle mass in the long term. So all of which these have been associated with reduced neuromuscular performance. What I wanna chat about next is that male athletes may exhibit multiple pathways that can contribute to their failure to consume an adequate volume of calories to meet the needs of their exercise energy expenditure. So what we see here is, you know, there's a ton of pathways that can contribute to just the male athlete's failure to consume an adequate volume of calories. So this can actually just be unintentional under eating. An athlete really may be unaware that they are literally not eating enough to sustain their performance. Um, this, you know, these effects may also happen with intentional weight loss. Um, and then we're almost moving towards the other end of, of the spectrum here. If an athlete has disordered eating habits or, you know, has been previously diagnosed with a clinical eating disorder. Okay, now to move on to our second objective, how do we screen this athlete and know if this athlete is even at risk for relative energy deficiency or know if this athlete is intaking enough food to really match their training demands? So we all notice, you know, different symptoms within our respective areas. And these are really just red flags that might come up and might warrant um, a referral to um, a registered dietitian. So if you're noticing that the athlete is, you know, experiencing increased fatigue, um, if the athlete has unexpected changes in their mood in the weight room, um, if the athlete is experiencing reoccurring injuries, illnesses, um, maybe having that decrease in weight that is leading to a decrease in performance. Um, and also another one um, that does coincide with the male athlete triad is, um, you know, asking the athlete if they have experienced a, a decreased um, frequency of shaving their facial hair um, or if they've experienced, you know, a decreased sex drive. So if a player mentions to you that they are having um, a, a hard time in bed, that can be a good indication um, that you might need to refer to a registered dietitian. Um, we do have new literature um, that is 
it was recently developed and validated and we've previously had the leaf dash q questionnaire which was the low energy availability in females questionnaire and this new literature is the low energy availability in males questionnaire however there definitely are its limitations and for you know the time we have today we aren't necessarily going to to dive into that just wanted to to make everybody aware that that does exist now, because athletes with unintentional energy deficiency may not actively be attempting to restrict their food intake, they may not actually screen positive or be experiencing a lot of the conditions that we just mentioned that might warrant screening. So you do want to look into differential diagnosis um, and a couple questions that have been utilized in the literature you can find here. Um, and these you can find in the new position statements for um, the male athlete triad and relative energy deficiency in male. Um, so just a couple questions. I won't read through all of these, um, but you know, other pathways that you can go down are asking this athlete if they worry about their weight or thinking about if whether it's yourself or any other staff members have recommended that the athlete loses or gains weight. Um, if the athlete has, you know, experienced stress fractures before or have mentioned that they have low, low bone mineral density. Um, and then you can also check in on, you know, are they avoiding certain types of foods or different food groups? And if you have suspicion for the male athlete triad or relative energy deficiency, um, then this is a great referral to registered dietitian, medical staff, because additional labs and a DEXA scan may be indicated. You would need the DEXA scan to identify that bone mineral density. Um, and then these athletes, you also want to screen for eating disorders. There's a number of questionnaires out there that you can utilize. Um, you can utilize the eating pathology symptom inventory. You can util utilize a questionnaire that's called the EDE-Q questionnaire um, or the eating disorder screen for athlete questionnaire um, that was validated um, in male athletes and again, also has its limitations. Um, really though, athletes can be diagnosed with the male athlete triad if they have one or more components along the spectrums of the male athlete triad. And what, you know, we are looking at on this slide is this energy deficiency. Um, and within all of the categories listed here, so dietary behaviors, their medical history, any medications that they're taking, family history or psychosocial factors, these can all contribute um, and can all be one of the components that might lead to that diagnosis. It can be challenging to assess energy deficiency and low energy availability without being in a lab setting. However, it can definitely be valuable to explain the concept and perform example calculations when the goal is to really encourage the athlete to increase their energy intake. So this is where a referral to a registered dietitian can be super valuable so that the, the dietitian can, um, you know, go through a 24 hour recall or food frequency questionnaire or a dietary log um, to learn a little bit more about what that athlete typically eats. Um, whether it's, you know, day to day, whether it's, you know, assessing what that athlete is eating um, throughout different, you know, phases of their training or different parts of the season. And then um, you guys as strength coaches and, you know, the registered dietitians can work together um, to so that the, the dietitian can understand, you know, what's happening in the weight room and, and what those training plans look like. Um, and then, you know, in, including that into the overall plan of energy expenditure with what the player is doing on the field or within their workouts. And I'm sure you are all familiar with this. So, you know, how do you estimate exercise energy expenditure? Um, we might be using heart rate data. We might be using an accelerometer. We might be using the physical activity compendium. Um, and this is really just to, to gain a better understanding. Um, you know, again, there are limitations to this. There's limitations with, you know, calculating um, energy expenditure. There's limitations with um, going through a food recall. And so it's really, 
you know, kind of using both resources and, and using the knowledge that, um, you know, both strength coaches and dietitians have um, to really determine if, if there does need to be a reason to explore this a little bit more and also to, you know, help the athlete achieve a little bit better food intake um, based off knowing what that athlete is doing within their training environments. I do want to emphasize this quote that I have here, that a stable body weight does not ensure normal energy availability because an athlete may reach a state of energy balance while at a low energy availability state because of the suppression of the normal physiological and metabolic functions that we previously chatted about. Now, I think it's really important to note that the weight is only a small piece of the puzzle and it doesn't always give us all the answers. And so, you know, hopefully as we've been going through um, this presentation today, um, you guys are thinking through, you know, a number of different areas and pieces to the puzzle um, that might be coming up for an athlete to really assess, you know, overall health, internal health, and if this athlete is at risk for anything more than you may have previously thought. Um, so next, you know, I did mention that you might need to refer to, a, to the medical staff. So there are a couple suggested lab studies for the evaluation of the male athlete triad, and these lab or the, yeah, these lab studies are listed here. So you might be asking for a complete blood count, a vitamin D level, total and free testosterone, um, a thyroid panel, so TSH, T4, and T3, and a comprehensive metabolic panel. And if an athlete is diagnosed with low testosterone, you really want to assess for the consequences of having low testosterone, especially if you know, this athlete hasn't received a formal diagnosis. Um, you might see low trauma fractures. You might see poor concentration in the weight room on the field or throughout their workouts. They might have decreased energy. They might have a depressed mood. So it is really important that, um, especially after diagnosis, that this athlete does consult an endocrinologist. I have mentioned a DEXA scan a couple times here. So in order to know if this athlete um, does have low bone mineral density. This athlete does need to have a DEXA scan completed, and this, you know, would give a Z score, um, which we're looking at a Z score that is less than negative two, um, being a significant risk for this athlete. And last, moving into our third objective here. So, you know, how can you guys apply this information? How is it relevant to you in your day to day? Um, in the weight room, you know, what can you do as strength coaches? So when we are thinking through the treatment, we are really looking at how do we increase this athlete's energy intake to match their training demands. So for you guys, even just encouraging foods that fall along these categories for calcium, vitamin D, iron, magnesium, B vitamins can be really supportive and really beneficial. Um, for our B vitamins, you know, we are looking at thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, pantothenic acid, and biotin. And just to name a couple of foods that, you know, do contain these B vitamins, um, let, let's just chat through um, a group of these foods. So we might be encouraging um, rice or pasta or tortillas or milk, cheese, Greek yogurt, lean meats, eggs, almonds, um, leafy green vegetables, peanut butter, you know, chicken, fish, um, sweet potatoes, avocados, beans, um, peanuts, almonds. Um, I probably repeated a couple, a couple foods there. Um, just foods that you can encourage your athletes to eat um, that can help, you know, focus on some of these micronutrients that are going to be very important. Now, you guys can be super supportive in the weight room by encouraging, um, you know, food intake before exercise and workouts, and that might be bananas, applesauce, pretzels, honey stinger waffles, 
um, or a carb carbohydrate source that you have available and also prioritizing post-exercise carb and protein snacks. So this might be the protein shaken in the weight room. This might be, you know, whey protein mixed with a clean recovery or a carbohydrate option that is available. And just to sum this all up here, check in with your athletes. It is, you know, well within your space to ask your athlete if they ate breakfast this morning, you know, ask them when was the last time they ate, ask them if they've drank water, how their energy levels are, if they got a full night's sleep. Um, you guys a lot of times are, um, and I would say more so than, than not, really the the day-to-day -day with the athletes where the dietitian is, you know, maybe a little bit more out of the box there. Um, so you guys are going to pick up on a lot of these symptoms that we mentioned. And these questions, you know, can be um, very helpful in understanding, you know, if this athlete potentially um, unintentionally might just not be eating enough to support their, their training demands. Um, and anytime that you feel that, um, this athlete might not be eating enough, say they told you they didn't eat breakfast or they haven't eaten all day or they've eaten one meal before their workout, um, that might be a great referral to a registered dietitian um, to really evaluate if, you know, there potentially is um, anything else going on here. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I wish that I could have been live, um, but I hope that the color red is on your mind and that this brought a little bit more insight into um, really ensuring that our athletes are matching their food intakes with their training demands. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Kara. Great information. A lot of things uh, sometimes that fall through the crack when it comes to strength conditioning professionals is, you know, the sleep, the amount of, uh, you know, how many times they're eating a day, what they're eating, the hydration levels, uh, more than just about the iron pushing and pulling. So great information that we can all utilize and, and improve our services to our athletes and, uh, and other clients. All right. So to finish out the afternoon session before our Q and a is Mr. David rock. Uh, David is in his seventh season with the Minnesota Twins organization, he spent four years prior uh, with the Twins with the University of Washington as the assistant strength and conditioning coach. Uh, David has a master's in education with a concentration in coaching from Boston University and a bachelor's of science and exercise phys from UMass Lowell. Uh, David and his wife, Susan, reside in Fort Myers, Florida. The presentation title for David's talk today is Development speed, developing speed for baseball. David, hey, this take is it away. Rock. I'm here on behalf of the PBS CCS and the Minnesota Twins. I want to thank you for coming out. Um, and we're going to talk about developing speed for baseball. So as we get into the presentation, there's a couple myths that I talk about. These are things that we often hear from both players and also skill coaches. Um, first one being speed cannot be taught. So oftentimes you run into individuals who think that developing speed is too advanced, too difficult. Um, or just something that the majority of players are not capable of doing. That's 100% not true. Um, everybody has some capacity and some capability to, to improve speed. Um, some people have higher ceilings than others, but we can absolutely work on getting players faster. A lot of times it's going to be technical. Um, and then for some individuals, it's going to be physical limitations. They might not be strong enough. They might not be powerful enough. And then obviously there's going to be a handful of players that need both technical improvements and physical qualities that need to improve. The second myth that we often run into is individuals think that speed training needs to be heavily drill-based. Um, there's kind of a preconceived notion that if we don't have fancy drills, if we don't have a ton of bells and whistles, if we don't have a ton of technology readily available, then we can't get players faster. That's 100% false. Um, if you really boil it down, you don't need any tech. Um, of course, technology is gonna be helpful, it's gonna be useful, but we're gonna lean on foundational principles um, and good solid technique. Um, and you don't necessarily have to have anything that's crazy advanced um, or anything fancy on that front. All you need is some players that are willing to run at 100% full intense speed, uh, a good plan. And then 
if you do want to introduce tech at a low level, all you really need is a, a decent camera and everybody's smartphone comes with the camera. So you're good to go there. So if you don't have anything fancy, if you don't have a big extensive drill package, uh, don't worry, don't freak out. Um, you don't need any of those in order to train speed effectively. The third myth that we often run into, and this one specifically comes, you know, mostly from players, is people think that they have to move really fast in order to be fast. We we see specific examples where players think that the faster they move their legs, the quicker they move their feet, the faster they will run. This is a, a really big myth, um, and it's a hard one to kind of bust with players. But more often than not, you'll see guys coming into uh, your sessions with that preconceived notion. And we have to work really hard to get guys to understand that quick, short, fast feet don't necessarily mean you're going to run faster. So we're going to work through some, some technical um, cues and technical um, principles for acceleration. And, and we'll kind of show you why that's not necessarily true. Um, the last speed myth also here is just going to be expecting your players to look like track athletes. I think the track world has a lot to provide and a lot to offer when it comes to understanding how to get uh, athletes and players faster. Um, but I, I think more often than not, individuals will place non-track athletes on a track pedestal and expect them to look like Olympic sprinters when that's just not the case. Um, keep in mind that baseball players are going to juggle a lot of different um, tasks. They're going to have to be good at a lot of different things and track athletes need to be really good at sprinting. So it's a little bit unfair to expect all baseball players to look like track athletes at the end of the day. With that said, we will pull some principles from the track world, but we're not going to make a carbon copy track stars. So as we go into base running, specifically in developing speed, one thing I wanted to pull out is we want to be really, really good inside of 20 yards. So when you look at the distance between first base and second base, it's going to be 90 feet um, and 90 feet is 30 yards. So you're probably wondering, okay, if it's 30 yards, why do we need to be good inside of 20 yards? Well, when we factor in the average distance on a lead, it's going to be somewhere between 10 to 12 feet. And then you also need to factor in, we have to slide into second base at some point. So if we subtract the lead that um, we take off of first base and we subtract the distance from when we initiate the slide to when we make contact with second base, we're going to be left over with about 20 yards. So that gives us 20 yards of just pure runway to accelerate. So that's going to come down to linear speed, linear uh, speed technique, and maximizing as much of that 20 yards as possible. If we have poor mechanics and we don't accelerate well, we're not going to be able to take advantage of that full 20 yards. So the athletes that can be technically sound, strong and powerful, and accelerate well over 20 yards are going to have the best chance at stealing second base or advancing to that next base. Um, so when we talk about linear technique briefly, there's really two things that we're going to boil this down to. Um, and we're going to kind of oversimplify this. But like I said, it doesn't have to be complicated. We're really going to focus on the angles that we're getting into and the ability to produce force. So powerful athletes will be able to hold angles better and they will be able to produce more force. So it really can be that simple. It just comes down to angles and force production. So as we get into the concept of angles and force production, there's four kind of technical pillars that we're, we're going to lean on heavily whenever we're doing any kind of sprint work or speed development work with our players. Um, we have a lot of different drills that we can run. There's a lot of different drills out there um, in, the, in, in this kind of speed development space and in the strength and conditioning space. Um, so regardless of the drill that you're running, these four technical pillars are going to need, need to be present within those drills when we're talking about working on acceleration. So the first pillar we're going to talk about is just using the arms violently. Oftentimes we'll see athletes have short, choppy kind of T-Rex arms, and they don't use their arms efficiently. So if we have short arms and, and non-violent arms, that's going to trickle down and we're gonna have kind of short choppy steps. So remembering that the arms drive the legs um, is really, really important. The second technical pillar is gonna be hip extension. We wanna make sure that we're, we're providing a position where we can get maximal hip extension, which is gonna help us put as much force into the ground as possible. And also the direction of that force is gonna support acceleration. The third technical pillar is gonna be the, the concept of projection. 
So when we talk about projection, we're talking about how much ground we're covering with each step. Fast athletes that can accelerate well project really, really far with each step. So they're not wasting steps and they're making the most out of their steps. Um, so when we look at the front knee position, where the foot strikes, um, and then also just maintaining that concept of projection for multiple steps, those all kind of matter and will dictate how well we can project with each step. And then the last technical pillar is just going to be maintaining a good torso angle. Oftentimes, our players will struggle with this um, specific one, and that's going to have a trickle-down effect um, to some of our other technical pillars. So as we move into um, this concept of hip extension, you can see where my cursor is, kind of this white line. That is kind of exactly what we're looking for. This is a really good example of good hip extension on the left. Um, this player is able to put a lot of force into the ground in a good direction. This player over here on the right, you can see that his spine angle and his leg kind of don't really match up. You can see that the hip is bent. Um, this would be what we would consider limited hip extension. So this athlete is not able to produce as much force on the right as the athlete on the left. So we're leaving a lot of force um, kind of on the table and we're not taking advantage um, of some physical capabilities here. So this is an example of good versus bad hip extension. So in this example here, we're going to talk about um, projection. So this would be an example of poor projection. So we're going to let the video kind of play and we're just going to rewind this. All right. So as we rewind the video, just take a look and see how, how much ground does this athlete cover um, when they do their sprint. So if we're watching that video, it does not cover really much ground at all, all right? So that would be an example of poor projection. So we would want to see this athlete cover significantly more ground with each step. So as we're kind of going through this in slow motion, you'll see that there's a lack of hip extension. The arms are short and choppy. The foot is striking here in front of the hip. The torso angle is kind of vertical. Um, so you'll see that the projection is off and also so are the other technical pillars. And then as we run through this video in slow-mo, again, just not covering much distance, not covering much ground here, all right? So that would be an example of poor projection. Now, some common faults that we'll see um, is, like we mentioned, lack of projection, lack of covering distance. Oftentimes, when we have an athlete that doesn't project very far, they also will have a a limited kind of hip extension component to their sprinting. So you won't see that hip kind of fully extend and a lot of force be produced into the ground. We'll also see athletes that lose posture. They kind of stand tall early on. They don't maintain a good forward angle when they sprint and they'll be a little bit more upright like the, the player was in the previous video. We'll also see a short kind of choppy arm drive. I kind of call them T-Rex arms um, just because they kind of stay at 90 degrees and they just kind of pump really fast we don't get any violence and we don't get any length. Um, so again, tying back, the arms do match the legs. So short choppy arms are gonna give us a limited kind of hip extension quality. Um, and then one of the biggest faults we'll see is athletes will, may start really, really good. Their first step, their second step may be good, but steps three, four, five, six, seven kind of get lazy and they may hold our technical pillars really well on the first one or two steps, but then you'll start to see the choppy arm drive, the loss of posture, the lack of projection show up early on their third, fourth, fifth step. We want to see, can we push those technical pillars for as many steps as possible while we have an opportunity to accelerate? So here's a video of one of our players that unfortunately just does a poor job of everything. Um, so kind of all technical pillars here, all four are kind of butchered. So we're going to run through on this video and unfortunately for him this is just not what we're after and just not a good rep um, so as we kind of break this through let's watch this video first and just see what his arms look like and you'll see that the arms kind of stay at 90 degree angles they're short and choppy there's no length all right so then as we trickle down from here and we we kind of run this video back we'll notice that he does not get good hip extension. So the first step is pretty decent, but after that first step, this is going into step two, leaves a little bit on the table there, right? Doesn't get full hip extension. Going into the next step, doesn't get full hip extension. 
doesn't get full hip extension, right? So the arms are lacking, the hip extension is lacking. Now let's watch the video and see how much ground he's covering with each step, not really covering much ground. All right. And then as we rewind this video again, while he's not covering ground and not extending his hips, let's take a look at where his foot strikes. So this is a good foot strike for step one. Whoops. Let's bring that back. This is a good foot strike for step one. On step two, you'll see that he starts to get out in front. So the foot here is more in front of the hips. So we're not in a position, we're not in an angle to produce a lot of force. So it's going to be hard to project and cover distance if we're stepping in front of our of our body. Um, so that's going to be another culprit that's going to kind of hinder our projection. So this is an example of how those technical pillars kind of feed off of each other. And if one is off or two are off, chances are the rest of them are going to be off as well. So we're going to run another video back here and we're going to bring our attention over to this athlete over here. All right. He's going to do a really good job of attacking all four technical pillars. So let's watch his arms on this first example. You're going to see that they're violent. They're long um, and it, his arms kind of hammer back as he sprints. All right. So what I mean by that is when he gets into this position here, you can see this arm is long. And then as he goes into his subsequent steps here, it's kind of hard to see on that step, but this step has a better visual. We got a good arm position here and a nice long arm right here. All right. With that long arm, we see this nice long position here where we got good hip extension. We got some good knee drive. And then he goes into his next step here. Same exact thing goes into this next step. This is probably going to be step four, I think. Um, nice long arm position here. So he maintains good, good arm drive. So let's watch his hip extension. So the arms check out hip extension. Awesome. Second step. Good. Third step. Good. Fourth step. Good. Step five. Good. Right? So that's also there. Now let's look at his projection. So he covers good distance here on the first step foot touches underneath or behind the hip. All right. So that's what we're after. Second step covers good distance. The foot's underneath the hip. Next step, his foot makes contact right around underneath that hip. Next step here comes through. Okay, so you can see this athlete is striking more underneath their center of mass, whereas the athlete that was struggling in the other video was was touching a lot more in front. And if we pan over to the athlete to the left, you can see he is striking the ground much more in front of his body than athlete number two here. All right. So let's just play this video back in full speed so you can kind of get the the visual of everything kind of at, at game speed, so to speak. So this is a this is an awesome job running all the way through. And then the last thing to touch on this video is just notice how he maintains a good forward angle throughout this sprint. Okay. Whereas the athlete to the left, you'll notice he's almost falling over right? And he's running with his hips flexed. He does not maintain a good angle. Um, he's almost running downward um, instead of kind of keeping that good 45. So just an example of um, what really, really good looks like. So we've talked about hip extension and projection a bunch already. Um, so a couple things just to, to think through is how do we coach that? How do we cue it? How do we get athletes to figure this out? What we've tried to do is we've tried to help our athletes feel what these principles um, are kind of in real time um, through some drills. So a couple drills we have here in the presentation are going to be a med ball throw to sprint, um, some resisted sprints. We're going to use cones to help with um, projecting. And that's kind of like our anti choppy step drill. Um, and if you don't have med balls or anything to resist sprints or, or cones, or if you have absolutely nothing, what you can always lean on is counting steps. Um, you can videotape your athlete, see how many steps it takes them to cover the distance that you're sprinting and also have them count the steps themselves. What this will do is this will bring awareness to that concept of projection. If we're doing short choppy steps, you're going to be taking more steps than you should. And what that'll do is by counting steps, it'll 
it'll bring some awareness to trying to cover more distance and shaving off one, maybe one and a half or just a half step, um, depending on how far we're going. So counting steps is the low tech, low equipment um, solution. So this drill is gonna be your med ball throw um, in, in sprint. So what this athlete's gonna do is he's gonna get into a good two point stance. He's gonna throw the med ball um, as, as kind of line drivey as possible. We don't want a big pop-up, we want a line drive. And then he's gonna sell out and get as much hip extension um, coming out of this stance as possible. So as we play the video, we will see. All right, there he goes. We'll play it one more time, full speed. All right, and then now what we'll do is as we break this down, what we're looking for in the goal of this, this drill is for him to get this long line in this aggressive angle. So this, this rep is successful. This is exactly what we're looking for here. The direction of the ball is going outward, not upward, um, and he's getting into some good angles. So that is a win. Now to take this a step further, let's take a look at what step number two looks like. Step number two looks just like step number one. He's got good long position here. He's got good length, good hip extension, good torso lean. Perfect, that's exactly what we're looking for. Now for this athlete, step three, he kind of starts to fall apart. You'll see that when he touches the ground, his foot here is way in front of his hip. And also watch his arms. His arms get real choppy here and short as he starts to sprint. Um, so now we're starting to lose positioning. So for him, the he meets the goal of the of the drill. He does a good job now extending those concepts to step two. Now, if I'm coaching him, I'm going to push him. Hey, we need step three to look just like steps one and two. I need you to hold those positions and those angles for multiple steps. Um, so this would be an example of an athlete that does really good in the start, but struggles to kind of finish the rep. All right. Um, this drill here is going to be our cone ladder. So essentially we just have cones. Each cone distance gets a little bit longer. And this is our anti choppy steps. This is our, our projection, uh, drill. So when we have guys that don't project well, we like to lean on this one. So as we play this through, you'll see that what we're doing is we're trying to teach this player to cover more distance by maintaining a torso angle. All right. And then by maintaining a shin angle and getting the foot to try to strike somewhere underneath the hip. All right. Yeah. He's a little bit in front. Okay. But ideally we want to see that foot right underneath the hip and in a perfect world, a little bit kind of further back here. So is this perfect? No. Is this better um, than guys that take choppy steps? Yes. Um, so this is still a work in progress, but it's a visual of what we're kind of aiming to get guys um, to achieve. The big thing we want to look out for on this drill is just making sure that when guys touch their foot down to make their step, they're not reaching in front of their body. All right. So that's where the torso angle is going to be really, really important. So we'll play this back one more time. So this is our cone ladder. And we like to use this for guys that struggle with projection. On this drill, we're going to do some resisted sprinting. And I want to highlight these two guys in the back. I wish they were up front so you could see it better. But unfortunately, these guys are in the back. Um, so as we get going, we like to use resisted sprints for um, teaching a good aggressive uh, lean. And you'll see these guys get really, really leaned here, really aggressive. We can kind of overemphasize this lean. We can kind of overemphasize some of these positions. Um, and what this does is it gets guys comfortable kind of on the extreme end of the body positions where they just need to feel what that looks like and they need to kind of test the boundaries. So then when they run and sprint normally, they're a little bit more comfortable pushing, pushing the limits here. Um, oftentimes we don't see guys get into aggressive positions and angles. So anything we can do to help kind of foster that and get them more comfortable, we're going to be all, all for. So we're going to use this drill to kind of teach good hip extension as a byproduct of a good lean and just run forcefully. So you'll see that these guys in the back do a really good job coming out, maintaining good angles, um, and just running aggressively. So we'll play this full speed. So we like to use this for good forward leans, good angles, good torso position, good shin position. Um, so the drills may vary. Um, there's a lot of drills out there, but the principles will still remain the same. And again, we're going to fall back on these four principles 
Um, and as we kind of broke down some of the videos, we talked about how these principles all kind of tie into each other. So now as we move into a lateral start um, or a steel start, what we're going to do is we're going to look at stance width. We're going to look at does the athlete have a good lateral push? Do they use their arms effectively? And what does their directional step look like? So we're going to play this video in real time. This is an example of what a really good rep looks like. So when we break this down, what we're seeing is this athlete does a good job of using his arms. He throws the elbow back, throws the other arm forward. That gets him turned, all right? And remember, we talked about how the arms drive the legs. Aggressive arms here are going to give him a good opportunity to maximize a lateral push. When we have a good lateral push, we're driving towards second base, right? Getting a good body angle. And what that does is that allows us to have a good, clean directional step here where we can get our foot in a position to have a good shin angle and produce force. There's a lot of discussion about directional step, what's good, what's bad, should you do this, should you do that. For us, all we care about is, is your directional step effective and does it put you in a position where you can get good force production and accelerate from? And in this athlete's case, the answer is yes. Once he gets turned, now this is just good linear sprint mechanics. So. He knocks out the hip extension component. He uses the arms violently. He covers distance really, really well. He gets good projection. The foot strikes underneath or slightly behind the hip right here. So he's even behind the hip. Um, so he's knocking out good linear sprint mechanics once he comes out of his, his steel start. So that's exactly what we're looking for. So now, um, what are the common faults? We see athletes stand up early um, out of their steel start. We see them have a wasted directional step. Um, we'll also see poor utilization of arms. Um, they don't get turned. And a lot of times these issues come from a stance that's either too wide or too narrow. All right. So if we watch this guy in the front here, he's going to be an example of someone that's a little bit too narrow. So as you can see, he kind of hops up and he really kind of wastes his directional step. So as we rewind this video, you'll see, watch his front foot, his, his, his foot comes up, he comes up, he spends a ton of time in the air, and then he kind of gets going really vertical. Um, and that would be an example of a wasted directional step. He's someone that almost like steps into the bucket, right? Steps up and over and then goes. So now let's watch this athlete over here, athlete number two. As he gets going, his directional step is a little bit crisper, spends less time in the air. It's a little bit more direct into the point. And he does a good job of using his arms and getting some hip extension here, all right? Shin angle is in a position where we can produce force, gets into a good linear acceleration position here. And then for him, you'll see as he gets going, I'll bring it back, as he gets going from here, which is good, to here, he kind of lets off the gas and all of a sudden, now he starts to get vertical and strikes in front. So he's an example of someone that starts good and needs some improvement to finish. And then as we look at the guy in the back, you'll see he almost doesn't even pick up his foot. He almost just kind of swivels. Again, that's fine. Different strategy. Is his shin angle in a position to produce force? The answer is yes. Does he have good backside hip extension? Yes. But then once he gets going, he's really kind of poor with the hip extension component. And he basically just runs with his hips flexed as he turns this into a linear sprint, all right? So these are some examples of different faults that we see coming out of that steel stance. So just to, just to hammer this point home, there's a big connection between lateral and linear sprinting. We have to make sure that players um, get a good first step, but after that first step, it turns into a linear sprint. So we can be really good from a steel stance, um, but we're gonna fall back to our our linear sprint mechanics. So we want to make sure that linear sprint mechanics are good in conjunction with a good steel start. So just one more example here of all four things going poorly. You're going to see poor utilization of arms. Boom. And then short choppy steps. All right. So that unfortunately is not a good rep. So when we coach speed, just a couple things that we want to talk about is um, players have to run full speed 
um, if they run anything less than 100%, it's going to be really hard to get into good positions, good angles, and produce force. When you're coaching speed work, make sure you demonstrate the drill as best as possible and as much as possible, and use video feedback as often as you can. Um, it's going to be good for the athlete to see what correct and what incorrect is. Keep cues simple. Try to use external cues versus internal cues. Um, an example would be instead of saying, hey, like, run with your arms long, pretend like you have a hammer in your arm and hammer nails behind you as you're sprinting, right? That would be an example of an external cue. Uh, run with hammers, right? And then like we talked about, create an environment where the athlete can figure out the drill. Um, all of the drills we kind of provided in this presentation give the athlete an opportunity to feel what correct is and allow them to kind of piece, piece things together um, in a way that makes sense for them. Um, and then at the end of the day, don't create robots, create athletes, let guys be athletic. Um, don't coach the athleticism out of your players. And then as we wrap up, just want to talk about how important the weight room is. Um, technical work is only going to make about 10% of our, our speed work. Um, because again, like you can get in really good positions, but you have to be able to produce force. So 90% of our speed development is going to be in the weight room. So don't sleep on the power development piece. Make sure that you're attacking plyometrics, single leg plyometrics, um, incorporating dynamic, dynamic effort lifts when possible, speed deadlifts, speed squats, um, and then just intent on compound movements. Move your RDLs aggressively. Be aggressive out of the bottom of, of your reverse lunges. Um, have intent when you're moving loads in the weight room. Single leg strength is going to be critical, um, and then also core stiffness and core control is going to be critical for maintaining torso positions as well. So don't sleep on the weight room. Um, a lot of times people only get wrapped up in the technical aspect and forget it's important to get strong and powerful. That happens inside of a weight room. And then as we end here, um, please reach out with any questions. I'll do my best to, to get back to any and all questions in a timely manner. I have my, my personal email here listed. Um, that's the best, fastest way to get in touch with me. Um, so I look forward to any questions um, and hearing from you all uh, in the future. Thank you. All right, um, great job. Here we go. I uh, just finished up the, the final talk before the Q&A. Now we will have one more talk after the Q&A, which we will roll right into. Um, so I think our, our Q&A practitioners or presenters are, are, are on, the, are on the, the Zoom here. Uh, we have a few questions that came in. So oh, I see Miss Stephanie Wilson is on as well. Very good. I wasn't expecting you, but there, uh, there is a question that, that we wanted to get answered from you. So good stuff. Uh, Lee, are you on here? Yes, I'm on. All right. Uh, first question that came in, the, the distance of the turf in your facility. Uh, that was the first question. The second one was regarding the physical therapy in your space. Was that insurance, an insurance-based or a cash-based model that you have there? Uh, insurance, we the college and pro um, insurances, but um, mostly cash-based. And then uh, space on the turf was like 17 yards on the, on the turf. 17 yards, okay, very good. Okay. Next question was for Mr. Joe Ken. Uh, hit on a couple of great things that we really don't think about in baseball, or at least I didn't when, when I was in that seat, um, and how, how working the neck or working our mid traps and, and rhomboids uh, really helps with neck, neck stability, neck strength, and it kind of all runs together. Um, also, the range of motion piece. You know, we're always talking about neck strength and stability, but the, the range of motion uh, routines that you gave that, that can be done in, in, you know, minimal amount of time is very beneficial for, for our baseball, uh, different positions, different, different ranges of motions. The question we had for you was, um, in a lot of your, the, the videos you had, you had your hands behind your back when you were doing, doing some of the exercises. Uh, was there a reasoning behind putting putting the hands clasped behind your back with a different range of motion and movements you did with your neck? For me, I think everybody's going to have a different ability to control their, their shoulder movement. So for me, it helps me uh, concentrate and helps the athletes 
that tend to, especially like in uh, the rotation stuff with the lateral flexion, you tend to raise the shoulder when you lean to one side. So it was to try to remove as much of the shoulder movement, the, the ancillary shoulder movement as possible. But I, I do think it could be done if you if you have good control, if your arms are just in a neutral down at the side. So it's more of a personal choice. I would venture to think that as you're going through and watching and evaluating your athletes, uh, some may have to lock behind. Uh, some may have pretty good control and can put their hand by the side. Uh, for me, it just helps me cue and reminds myself to maintain a movement where I want it to be done and to alleviate the non-necessary movements from ancillary parts of the body. Very good. Another question that just came in for you, Joe, do you have, do you have like historical measurements or you take, do you take girth measurements for your neck and do you have norms, I guess, in your world for the different positions that you worked with, with football? You know what? We never, I never got into that anthropometrical stuff because everybody's built different. Uh, and, and again, uh, we, we, we knew we had big necks. I could see it. So I didn't have to measure it, <laughs> uh, but I do know a lot of teams in college, they measure all, you know, arm size, neck size, thigh size, calf size, waist, chest. Uh, I I've just never, you know, I just trained them hard. So I don't, I don't have anything. If, uh, I now when I was in college, they measure our neck every day, but it was mostly because, to be honest with you, to see how see how big a pump we could get. Because the training the neck every day is not something that's new. Uh, anybody who's a historian of strength training and understands the principles of high intensity training uh, back in the day, every one of those programs started with neck work. Uh, I was a I was part of that deal. We started off with. If, if you guys, if you're old enough to remember, you know, you'd go into a knotless circus and you'd start out with knotless seated shrug, 12 to 20 reps, four way neck, 15, 12 to 15 reps, the old seated rear delt machine, 15 to 20, 20 reps. And then we also had the lateral rotation manual resistance machine where you put yourself in, they crank the damn lever over like you were going into some type of crazy machine and your coach would rotate you back and forth. So uh, I had a 24 inch neck in college. I think mine right now is hovering around 20. So I, I, you know, I mean, again, I guess I'm kind of bouncing around the answer. No, I did not. And I didn't feel like it was necessary to do it. I could see that visually. And we knew when, if you train neck every day and you vary the exercise and movements, you, they're going to get bigger and stronger. It's really a part of the body, Joe, that falls between the cracks with a lot of programming. I know with baseball, it's not a traditional body part, but with our catchers, I'm pretty sure all of our strength coaches, at least at the pro level, train it just for the, the science that is out there behind the, the girth of the size of the neck and also how it relates to the, the reduction of the severity of the concussion, um, helping to reduce the risk. You know, we were interviewing a strength coach from uh, – Texas who was working with the Air Force and part of the interview he was talking about how he trained those guys and, and he would put them in that diagonal rotated position that you talked about the range of motion and they would do a lot of isometric strengthening in that position because of the g-forces these guys take on when they're looking at, at fighter jets in their back corner almost like looking through your rear view mirror and it's just something you don't think about a lot with uh, the different animals that are out there it's very interesting well and, I, and again I think you have to explore things, right? Like we all came through what I call the standard big four, flexion, extension, and lateral flexion. Nobody really talked about the rotation piece, especially the diagonal rotation piece. And I'm not here to promote any one piece of equipment, but that's why I think it's necessary to have a lot of tools in your tool shed. I mean, I like doing a lot of stuff with bands because budget wise and number wise, it's very capable to knock out a lot of people at once, but you know, four-way neck machines, neck harnesses, uh, pieces like the iron neck, uh, top spin three. Uh-oh. I think we lost them. <laughs> hey, hey, you know, I'm going to have to get on him because remember in our pre-panelist like uh, panelist call, he talked about he had the greatest cell phone of all time. And, uh, he must have, he must have hit the wrong button. Oh, here, <laughs> here he comes. Okay. Jump on him, Matt. 
Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> But for some of you guys on the like from back in the day, I remember even what Mark Sanovich at with the box station one was was neck before they went into the program. Yeah, coming from the what, University of Michigan, yeah. uh, Mike Gittleson, Gittleson it was huge, huge with neck strength training. This was back in the eighties, and uh, learning the manual methods, manual strength training uh, with with the neck and really with all the parts. But um, right, anyway, with, with his technical difficulties, I'm, we, we I'm back. Let oh. Me get- me in well hold on i have to just make sure that you have you know the the best cell phone of all time because i remember no my son my son was trying to call me they just won the equestrian (laughs) national championship oh awesome that's that's a little more important than you so (laughs) all right it it kicked me out so let me back in man you're in you're in you're in so now why can't i get my picture back all right all right, it won't let me add my audio. I made your co-host, so. We co- oh, what the hell? That's just uh, the same looking at your caricature there. It looks just like want, See, that's when you know you're doing right. One of, your, one of my former It's got players. great neck in, 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 the, in the picture. I cannot believe I can't, now can't find a way to. It says you're on mute. Yeah, there you I go. know. Can you hear me? Yeah. But now it's not uh whatever. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Yeah, we were we'll just talking. Back to you. We'll bounce, we'll bounce back to you, so we'll, you know, for, for time point. Uh, yeah. So we had one for Dr. Wilson. Uh I see she's on. So the yes, a lot of the a lot of the, you know, the um, for managing stress and cortisol, you know, some of the the remedies you have, because we all know it's there, but we were really interested in the the uh solutions and, and the different things we can do to help ourselves the some of the things you talked about and forgive me if i butcher this ashwanga ash how do you say it ashwagandha ashwagandha yes. and then it, is that like a whole foods Trader joe type of purchase where, where can we get that um there's actually it's an ingredient found in supplements that are nsf certified so um it's it's actually an herb based um it's like, it's just so an herb ingredient. You, yes. You can't you can't buy it as a standalone product. You can buy it as a standalone. I just wanted to provide solutions that were NSF certified. Um, okay. and if you go to the NSF for sport website and put in ashwagandha as an ingredient, it'll show which ones are um contain that. I didn't I didn't want to promote any specific one. Um got it. But there used to be a, a really good one that I know worked and was very strong. They actually removed the certification. Um, because it was more medical grade, but it it is a great uh, ingredient for managing stress. And you said about two hundred and fifty milligrams per day. Yes, and and there um, I haven't seen a per kilo dose. So if anyone knows of that, you know, go ahead and nudge nudge on that one. Uh, but I have what I've noticed anecdotally is that if I have a much larger athlete, I, I will use you know uh, two two pills, or um, I'll use a little bit more than the two fifty. Okay, love the fact that you mentioned the fruits and veggies for the, the antioxidants and, you know, eating, you know, eating right, helping to manage your stress. Uh, there was a question that came through regarding the zinc and the gut repair. Um, yes. Are, are, the question was, are there different forms of zinc? Because you, you mentioned zinc carnosine. And if, yes. if there are, is that the only type for the gut focus? Great question. Um, there are lots of different forms of zinc in a supplement form. Um, That's the one that I've seen in the research most for gut repair, um, specifically mucosal gut repair. But um, I can look into that a little bit more to see if other ones specifically aid on that location too. Um, I just know that that one is uh, bioavailable as well. Very good. Uh, Let's see, Frankie Rivas, next question was for you. Um, The the shoes for training, when when you you talked about ankle stability and development, we saw some shoes on, we saw some shoes off. Where do you fall in, you know, what's what's optimal and and um, what do you recommend in regards to, let's say training in the weight room, uh, shoe, what, 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 what are we putting on our feet? So first, as I say, you have to assess the athlete, right? So if we're dealing with someone that's flat footed, I wouldn't recommend spending too much time barefooted until you solve the problem. Um, 
if you have someone that has spent most of his life in shoes as well, which is 90% of the, of the population, um, I'll also be careful. It's just like any kind of training, right? Like you first learn to do a plank and then you'll do a push up and then you do a bear crawl. It will be the same for, um, for barefoot training. Uh, once a guy has a good arch, we start with sled walks, as you saw with the video with the guy. So we did it as a movement prep. So they will come in, uh, do a sled walk forward and backwards. Um, and then over time, we'll go back to shoes and then the, they will do their lifting without shoes. Plyometrics still with shoes. We'll never go plyometrics um, without shoes, just for obvious reasons. Um, we we are a big advocate for good shoes, like the one that has a big toe box. So to prevent what we talk about, like if that big toe gets really close to the other four, then your arch is gonna start collapsing. That's when you start seeing people with bunions and things like that. Um, Nike turfs are being really good for us. Uh, New balances, um, the barefoot shoes, um, sometimes are good, sometimes are bad. It's just you have to assess the foot first. I mean, you can go into barefoot shoe shoes, but if they still don't have an arch, or they have a pretty uh, pretty poor toe mobility. Doesn't matter what kind of shoes you wear, you just gotta fix the problem first. If it, if it's a stability, then it will help doing some stuff with barefoot shooting um, shoes. Um, but if it's like the toe is not, cannot move at all, then you have to address that first. If that, if that answers the question. Yes, thank you. The, another question that came through for your talk, Francisco, was were there normal ranges that you look for with your plantar flexion and dorsiflexion of the ankle? You can look at degrees. Um, we normally put like tapes on the ground. Um, the one, two, three through the FMS made things easier for, for everybody. Because uh, if you say, yeah, this, this kind of degree is optimal. Um, I will say like you have people that are crazy mobile and they have like 30 degrees of flexion or um, whatsoever. Um, I, I like to see it from like, a, if you're if you're a two and below, that's not optimal for me. I go in that range um, and it's easy for everybody to, to look at that way rather than trying to find an app in the phone to make sure the actual angle, you know, like there's different ways that you can get it done. Like you have guys that have night, more external rotation and don't throw as hard. And you know, guys that have less, it's just how you adapt to the problem. But yeah, you should at least should be um, a bot of one for sure, just like any other dysfunctional pattern. Very good. And you mentioned rhythm a lot in, in your in your talk, which is something that we, we at least I've found, I talk a lot about it, is, is good athletes have rhythm, at least in the baseball world uh, and, and, and talking through some of that. Uh, Logan. The next couple of questions, uh, what, the one that came through said that is, are there um, red flags you look for when you're doing a, a preseason assessment in regards to something that may lead to a hamstring injury? If so, what are they? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think uh, for the most part, I mean, it's going to be highly case dependent uh, as most things are. It's not, unfortunately, we don't live in a black and white world. There's a lot of gray and I think, um, Generally speaking, I think anytime that we can create a robust system to evaluate is going to be advantageous. So we're looking from an objective and a subjective standpoint. Um, but if we're getting passive range of motion assessment numbers, some hardware type data, um, and from there we're watching with our eyes to see how they're moving through different ranges of motion, um, that's going to give us some intel as to maybe what are some of their movement deficiencies um, from, from a controlled uh, weight room type environment where we can control a lot of the variables at play. And for sure, a lot of these types of things start to show up as we start to increase velocities and, and such as we move out onto the field. So specifically uh, in our population, we're keying in on a, a lot of unilateral type assessment uh, type things because that's going to highly replicate and carry over the, to the demands of playing the sport of baseball. Um, for sure, on one leg with one arm from one side of the plate uh, for the most part. So uh, it's a tough question to answer because I'm not sure that there's that there's X, Y, and Z that's going to be applicable across the board. However, I think um, doing a, a needs analysis, if you will, to determine what's important for your sport and your environment with your athletes, that will give you some insight and some intel as to how you can structure an assessment and evaluation um, to best cater towards what those needs are. Um, so I, I think if, if there's more, um, if you're in search of more information, I guess, on that, or maybe to discuss something that could be applicable to, to 
to you, I would for sure encourage reaching out just because I, I do feel like it's highly case dependent and it's difficult to give a specific answer um, to, to a crowd, I guess, if you if you will, because we don't don't work in, a, in the same environment. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. So, so Logan, you talked about um, you guys that use a norm board, correct? Yes, for sure. For Nordic. So, did you see like norms like were too low or too high? Because I remember using in the past where we thought two seventy five was low. We saw some injuries, and then there were guys were too too strong that were five hundred and above. So, the sweet spot was somewhere in between there, where guys were relatively, I don't want to say injury free, but had had less of a risk. Yeah, I, I I think that's fair to say. I think anything if we're peaking too if we're if we're too high or too, if we're too low, I think there's definitely like an indication that um, maybe there's something else going on. So to to your point, yeah, I think anywhere we see a lot of figures, a lot of data between the three seventy five to five hundred range, somewhere in that sweet spot there. Um, again, I can, I think it kind of depends on is a guy a, a, a loose mover, is he a stiff mover? Kind of like what are his other baseline assessments? What do their power numbers look like? Um, maybe on a four stacks in the sagittal plane, but then are we gauging any kind of data that's a little more specific to the plane of movement, you know, planes of movement that are, that are applicable to baseball. Um, Cause as we know, power is very, you know, plane specific. So I, I think uh, from a Nordic standpoint, we definitely utilize it to, to gauge them or gather some objective data um, to help guide our decision-making. I don't know that it, that it necessarily makes any of our decisions, but I think it's just context from us to pull from some data that we can, that we can leverage appropriately to help build maybe some baseline information. So that way, when we do check in and we are um, comparing data to our baseline levels, we can best determine where is this individual along in their progression. So yeah, to your, to your question on the figures there, I would say anywhere from 375, 400 up to 500, that's kind of where we see a bulk of our data uh, coming in. We, we are, um, we are seeing some 500 plus figures, and we, then we do some see we do see some rather that are 350 and below as well. Okay, cool. And we had one other question for you, Logan. When you're doing your assessments for the players, like in the later phases before they return to play, is that something you're out there with the athletic trainer and the physical therapist? Who who's all involved with that part of the process? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I. I made a point to emphasize the, the importance of collaboration and, and working together as a unit to like achieve whatever the outcome is for, for us collectively. Um, so yeah, it's very integrated. Like we're as much as possible, we're, we're inclusive in the sense of we want to, we want an athletic trainer, a physical therapist, a strength coach, you know, if it's something skill specific, maybe we include a uh, biomechanist or something along those lines. Um, but we're trying to basically fill the gaps and, and bring as much knowledge and as much insight to the table as possible to help make sure that we're um, best using our experiences to help create the best plan possible. I think it's it's much more difficult to make a mistake when you have that kind of approach than it is um, in some instances where we're forced to maybe one off a solution or an approach or fly by the seat of our pants, if you will. Um, I think that those are the, the instances where maybe we have some gaps in our training um, or gaps in our protocols that are returned to play. And that's, in, in my experience, when we see the higher incidence of re-injury, um, when, we, when we aren't able to fill those gaps appropriately with the right stimulus on our journey back to return to play. You know, with this new the stat cast that, that all organizations have access to now, and it wasn't around when I was with the Pirates back in, you know, the early 2000s or even when I got out in 2011. But the stat cast give you, like, if I wanted to drill down and measure the stride length of a player running first to third, you know, would it give me that information? And if so, be able to video our player rehabbing and compare those that that stride length with what, you know, he had in game footage with StatCast. Do you know if that's available with with that uh, modality? Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm, I'm pretty positive all the, all the big league stadiums have the ability to objectively track, you know, high speed running and and uh, so that, that, you know, we're talking velocities there and acceleration figures, deceleration figures, uh, distance covered and, and stuff like that. Uh, at the minor league level and player development, obviously, those those resources aren't readily available. However, you know, we we have experimented in different ways to try to gather some useful information. If it's somewhat subjective, so be it. Um, if it if it gets us closer to a, a goal that we have in mind or if we can leverage that data and use it to interpret it and make decisions. I think it's valuable, you know, if we're just gathering it to gather it and we don't necessarily have actionable steps off of that. Um, it's maybe not the best use of time or resources, but I do think that 
if we have the bandwidth to be able to do such a task, I do think that gathering that information in the places where maybe we don't have a tech uh, solution that will gather it for us. Um, so I'm thinking more of at a minor league, minor league environment, maybe at, at the collegiate level, the high school level, stuff, stuff like that. Um, finding mechanisms to track high speed running, uh, sprint efforts, distance covered at that high speed running, because all of those are highly correlated to uh, soft tissue, hamstring, adductor, that type of thing. Um, so I think that, again, those are kind of just figures that we can kind of use along with our force dex measurements, our Nordic data, and maybe some of our um, ATC, S&C measurement type eval stuff that we do. Now we're able to like kind of fill the pieces of the puzzle together to, um, I don't know, maybe create a better plan than we would have been able to if we were just maybe going off only experience or only data. Got it. Very good. Great points. Uh, well, team, that's that wraps up the Q and A. Uh, I don't think there was anything else left in the in the question box. Um, so we will. Uh, all of you, Stephanie and and Frankie and Lee, Joe, Logan, um, thank you all for coming back on and, and being part of the being part of the Q and A uh, after your presentation was done. We're going to roll right into our final our final presentation with Mr. Thompson Remo. Uh, Thompson is the Watt Bike Load Performance Educator with Woodway USA. He is an elite level competitive cyclist, indoor cycling world record holder and performance education consultant to professional sports teams, universities, and private training facilities. Uh, Thompson is going to speak to us today on uh, the Woodway Bike Sprints Conditioning Program. Thompson, good to see you again. Good Matt, to see you as well, Frank. Matt uh, says you go Germany. Uh, actually, up in the Netherlands now. Oh, the so, oh. Normally, I'm based out of the Woodway USA headquarters in Waukesha, Wisconsin, just outside of Milwaukee. Uh, today, I'm coming to you live from Europe, where it's the middle of the night. So thank you to the PBS CCS for having me. And it's a pleasure to follow up all of the great presenters today. A lot of really useful information, some of which rolls directly into what I'm going to be speaking about, which is performance and power profiling. So Frank, you did a great job of uh, summarizing my background. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, former elite level competitive cyclist, world record holder over the thousand meter distance, uh, current US national uh, deadlift champion in powerlifting and consultant to many of the teams which are present on this call. So I'm familiar with many of the, the names and faces of the attendees and look forward to meeting with those of you who I don't already know. Today, we're going to start this off a little bit more like a physics class in the sense that we're going to be referring to some of the major mechanical uh, components and quantifications involved in athletic movement, but also related to automobiles and other implements that are used for transportation or locomotive action. So what is torque? Torque is the tendency of a force to rotate an object around an axis. Now, when you're looking at the specifications of a vehicle, let's say you're buying a new car, this is one of the ratings for the vehicle that you'll normally see. And it's typically expressed as Newton meters or pound feet of torque. Typically, this metric is something that you'll see associated with a larger vehicle that's responsible for doing a lot of hauling. So a uh, semi truck, pickup truck, uh, typically those are going to be the vehicles that have higher torque outputs than the majority of the other vehicles you see out on the road. The other metric we're going to be talking about is horsepower. Now, power on its own is the rate at which work is done or energy or the rate at which energy is transmitted. Uh, the unit of measurement for horsepower is one horsepower, which is 746 watts in America or 735 watts in the metric system. So when we look at horsepower in a vehicle, uh, this is typically something we look at on a sports car or a muscle car, something where you're seeing how much power the vehicle has to see how potentially fast it'll be able to take you. So the torque and horsepower relationship is something that's displayed not only in vehicles, uh, but also in locomotive actions of people. 
normally as you're starting a sprint or if you're in a vehicle starting from a dead start and accelerating as quickly as you can, you're going to see the highest torque output toward the beginning of that movement. Whereas as you travel a little bit further down the road or down the playing field, you're going to see a higher power output, which can also be quantified as horsepower. So when we go back to David's talk about the uh, first 20 yards, we're typically looking at the torque component as the first section of that sprint or the initial acceleration phase. And we're looking at the horsepower side of it as the, the last uh, 10 or 15 yards, which would be considered the peak velocity phase in a lot of cases. So these are some examples of different vehicles and their torque and horsepower ratings. On the left side of the screen, we have a large truck, which as you can see has a significantly higher torque rating than the other vehicles on the screen, while the horsepower rating is relatively mild. In the middle, the muscle car has a sufficient amount of each uh, high torque and high horsepower rating. And then the sports car on the right has a relatively low torque rating with a higher horsepower rating. And you can see that horsepower happens at a significantly higher cadence, which is that revolutions per minute figure. When we talk about optimizing performance, it's no surprise, and especially as strength and conditioning coaches, uh, more is typically better. So more strength, more speed. But how do we find that perfect balance of strength and speed? The vehicle in the image shown has significantly more horsepower than all of the vehicles on the previous slide, but also has significantly higher torque producing capabilities than the vehicles shown on the other slide. So when we look at a high torque vehicle, we would equate that to a strong vehicle or the same way we would quantify a strong athlete. The horsepower, if you have high horsepower, we would consider you to be a powerful athlete or we would consider that muscle car in the middle of the last image to be a powerful vehicle. And when we look at something with a high RPM or high velocity limit, we would typically consider that person or vehicle to be fast. So, the chart that we have on the screen is Dr. Brian Mann's uh, velocity zones chart. On the chart, you can see that I've written some of the commonly used uh, strength and conditioning terminology below. So when we look at an athlete who excels in the lower velocity range, so right underneath that absolute strength section, if that athlete excels there, we would typically consider them to be strong. If an athlete excels in that middle range, so moving loads at 50 to 70% of their one rep max or working right around that one meter per second mark well, we would consider that athlete to be powerful. Whereas athletes who may not possess much of either of those other qualities, but are very good at moving quickly, maybe with no external resistance at all, or very light external resistances, we would consider that athlete to be fast. So all of those qualities can be summarized with one individual performance metric and power is that metric. Power is the ultimate performance metric as it combines strength and speed in a singular resultant. So today we're gonna to be talking about preliminary force velocity profiling, which can be done using power output or watts as the main metric to evaluate whether someone is strong, fast, or somewhere in the middle. So when we conduct force velocity profiling in the weight room or on the playing field, it's a two-step process. The first step is to test that power output on typically three different resistance levels initially. And we want to make these three resistance levels distinctly different enough so we can evaluate how they're applying force in a variety of different scenarios that are different enough to draw conclusions. So typically, we'll start with a light resistance test and then move to a medium resistance test and finally, a heavy resistance test. Once we've completed those tests, we'll rank the power outputs from each by highest to lowest power output. So the area with the highest power output is that athlete's area of aptitude, and the test resulting in the lowest power output would be that athlete's area of deficiency. So athletes with high power outputs against heavy resistances are typically considered strong, similar to the pickup truck that we saw in the previous photo. Whereas athletes with the highest power outputs against the light resistances are considered fast, something closer to the sports car in that same image. So once you've determined whether an athlete is generally strong, fast, or somewhere in the middle, which we would consider sort of a hybrid athlete, 
you can zero in on that athlete's optimal power producing velocity by performing additional tests on resistance levels that are slightly above and slightly below the best or highest power output producing testing resistance from the preliminary testing session. So the secondary testing session is going to tell you the athlete's true top power output. So let's say when we were conducting those first three power tests, they produced 800, 1000, and 1200 watts respectively in each one of those tests. In this case, we might work just above, just around that optimal power producing resistance to see if they can maybe produce 1250 or 1300 on a slightly different resistance level from there. So this really helps us dial in on that perfect power producing velocity for that athlete. Secondly, this allows us to see how the athlete compares relative to sport or position specific performance standards or benchmarks. So A, we can see, do they produce as much power as other players in the same sport or the same position? And B, at which velocity do they produce this best power and where does that fall relative to the other top performers in this sport? So we might see a handful of, for example, short stops producing their best power output around that 0 0.8, 0 0.9 meter per second mark. Maybe this athlete is currently producing their best power output at 1 or 1.1 meters per second. So we can see how far that deviation is from the other top performers in their sport. When we're measuring power, we're using a tool called a dynamometer, uh, often referred to as a dyno for short. Now. Many of the teams are using these in a variety of different formats. Uh, grip dynamometers are a popular readiness test that are utilized not only in baseball, but a lot of the sports that are currently focusing on readiness assessments pre-game, uh, either the day before or the morning of, because it's not too invasive. The tests on a cyclogrometer, uh, which would be something similar to the watt bike in the right corner, is going to be a little bit more invasive. So it has a little bit more of a dual component to it in the sense that it provides a training stimulus and also a testing result at the same time. So you're able to draw useful information and actionable information from these assessments, but they are slightly more invasive and will, in most cases, induce a little bit more fatigue or more of a training stimulus. So the advantages of using a bike as your dynamometer uh, are as follows on the bullet points listed on the screen, which is that you're in a fixed range of motion. So when you're sitting on a bike, uh, typically we'll perform these power profiling sessions seated. So we'll make sure that the athlete is set in a position that allows them to produce significant power safely. So we're looking at 150 to 155 degree knee angle, a uh, flat back, uh, hands comfortably situated on the handlebar with the, el the elbow, uh, directly above the pedal spindle when the crank arms are in that front end of the range of motion. Uh, we do have a lot of resources available on proper setup for the bike fit. So when you're conducting these tests, you set the athlete up exactly the same way every single testing session, which ensures uh, consistency in technique or movement pattern. So this allows us to take some of the technical components out of the power profiling process. If you're power profiling in weightlifting uh, using velocity-based uh, training devices. Not to interrupt you real quick, but I know you're talking about your PowerPoint, but it, it's not up for people to see. You got to re-screen share. Is it going now? Are you able to see the presentation now? Yes, sir. Excellent. So continuing on the advantages of using the cycle ergometer, you're in that fixed range of motion, but you're also working through a 360 degree concentric. So you have continuous time under tension, which allows you to evaluate uh, testing sessions over a wide range of durations. So you can use a testing session that lasts anywhere from a fraction of a second to several hours in duration. And along these lines, you have zero impact. So there's no uh, mechanical impact like there would be from jumping, uh, sprinting on the ground. Now, you still definitely want to do those things, obviously. and 
you should still consider profiling your athletes with force plates and velocity-based training devices, but using the cycle ergometer does lend to a much wider range of exertion duration capabilities, and it has that zero mechanical impact component. So using that, we can assess both aerobic and anaerobic qualities. So how do we do this? Typically, when we're performing a power profiling test on the watt bike, uh, we're conducting a familiarization session, which consists of three 10 second sprints. So leading into that, you can perform the warm up on the bike itself or in a variety of different fashions. But one of the advantages of performing that warm up on the bike is you have the opportunity to get the athlete to experience a wide range of cadences or movement velocities. So that'll help them get comfortable on the bike and ultimately allow them to be more familiar with spinning at higher leg speeds and giving their all out effort when it actually comes time to the assessment efforts. So once you've warmed up on the bike, we'll typically go into a light, medium and heavy resistance sprint uh, using that order. So we'll do a light resistance sprint first. Uh, typically, if we're using the Watt Bike Pro, that'll be done on fan level four. We'll rest for typically five full minutes to ensure that each effort is done at the same intensity level as the previous one. Second one might be on fan level seven on the Watt Bike Pro for males. And then the third one on fan level 10, which would be the heaviest resistance level in this scenario. And we're going to look at the power outputs from all three of those sprints. So when we look at the power outputs from each of those sprints, we're going to look at the average power. So you will see a peak power figure, which typically happens during the acceleration phase. So as the athlete is getting up to speed, but that average power output is going to take some of the technical component of actually starting or accelerating a bike out of the equation and focus more on raw power output. So we're looking at the average power over the light, medium and heavy resisted sprints. And then we rank each one of those efforts according to which one produced the highest power average. So in the scenario shown on the screen, uh, the effort which produced the highest power output was that middle one. Uh, so that would have been fan level seven on the Watt Bike Pro. Second would be the heavy resisted one. So that was fan level 10 on the Watt Bike Pro, which produced 1100 watts. And thirdly, the lightest resisted one where the athlete maybe wasn't capable of spinning at a high enough velocity to produce significant power, or maybe the resistance level was too light for them to really feel like they had anything to dig into. So when we're looking at the aptitude and efficiency assessment of this athlete, we would consider this athlete to be more of a hybrid. So we would bias speed first because that's the area where they're most deficient. And then strength secondly, because that was their second or middle uh, characteristic or attribute. So what do we do once we have these results? We can, as I mentioned before, zero in on the athlete's optimal power producing cadence by performing those secondary tests. So since this athlete produced their best power output on fan level seven, that medium resistance level, we might also test them on fans five, six, and eight to see if they could produce a little bit more still. We can also compare this to the athlete's raw power output uh, to other athletes in the same sport or position. So if we know that all of the pitchers are producing uh, 10 second power averages in the realm of 1700 to 1800 watts. We can see where this athlete falls relative to those similar performers. And we can see at which cadence they're performing that effort and where this athlete's cadence is. So we can work them toward high performance in their particular field. And if they are already one of the top performers, or if they're showing outputs that are higher than most of the others in their category, then we know something's going right. But we can also use these results to create an immediate action plan. So we can tell whether we want to bias speed, strength, or a little bit of both, some sort of a concurrent or conjugate style system. We can predict an athlete's performance in anaerobic capacity tests. So this is particularly useful if you plan on performing a wind gate, let's say a, a 30 or 60 second sprint on the cycle ergometer, because from that 10 second test, we can very accurately predict what that athlete's 30 second power output will be without actually having to subject them to the misery of an actual 30 second sprint. Um, typically that 30 second sprint on a bike is going to induce a lot of nausea. So if we can get a number that's going to be very accurate with regard to the 30 second output without subjecting them to that, we save the athlete from 
uh, experiencing a lot of discomfort, which helps with athlete buy-in and they'll be more willing to continue to use the watt bike on a consistent basis rather than viewing it as a misery inducing tool. We can also guide some of the testing parameters for aerobic fitness assessments. So once we have that 10 second power output, we can determine a starting resistance level to perform a maximal or submaximal aerobic ramp test. And many of the teams right now are using uh, some sort of ramp test to evaluate aerobic fitness levels, especially with the shortened pitch clock. So if we're looking at an athlete's VO2 max or a derivative thereof, we can get a very good starting point for conducting those tests, which is going to make that test uh, in some cases last longer. So you'll be able to conduct it more frequently and less invasively. We can also use these results to gauge an athlete's readiness or effort or mechanical improvement using overlays such as muscle oxygen saturation or heart rate and heart rate variability. So when we're looking at power output on the bike alone, uh, we're typically looking at pure mechanical output and that's quantified as wattage. But when we add muscle oxygen saturation devices, especially for the sprint style tests, we can see how steeply or how deeply that saturation drops during each effort and we can see how quickly it recovers. So this is something that can be translated not only across uh, the cycle ergometer, but over to running and throwing movements themselves to see how much of a saturation decrease you see and how quickly you can resaturate. And you can also see the heart rate's response to these activities relative to the mechanical output. Lastly, we can assess readiness, especially with pitchers and catchers. So more of a baseball specific scenario here by evaluating today's top power output to previous personal best performances. So at any given point in the season, we can see through a quick sprint test what an athlete is producing today and how that uh, compares to the preseason or to the off season. And hopefully we're seeing steady improvement or at least not regression throughout the entire year. So if you have additional questions on this process, uh, feel free to reach out to me via email or phone. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm based out of the Woodway USA and Watt Bike offices in Wisconsin, uh, just outside of Milwaukee. So I look forward to staying in contact with all of you on the call. You got to undo the screen share. Perfect. Thompson, that's unbelievable. Um, and it does make a lot of sense, obviously, with the with the pitch clock now, uh, with the pitcher's conditioning. Uh, but great talk. I, we appreciate everything. Uh, you guys can all see Thompson at any of the trade shows. Uh, I'm going to have to talk to Deke. We have to get you a raise. This guy's got you working in Europe. He's got you on, on uh, webinars. He's got you at all the trade shows. Uh, I will definitely put in a good word. We've got to make sure we get, we got to get you, get you some, some more, some more money. <laughs> appreciate it. It's always a pleasure speaking with the group. No, I appreciate it. We'll definitely see you here soon. And definitely at the, at any trade show, you guys can see them and, and also here at the winter meetings. We appreciate it. And, and thank, you know, Woodway for all they do. Actually, they were our first vendor sponsor, you know, so many years ago and they've been with us ever since. So, uh, I'm going to say from the PBSCCS that we appreciate Woodway more than you can imagine. All righty. So listen, uh, for everybody out there, uh, Thompson was our, was our last presenter. Uh, we're going to do some, some final, final uh, thoughts right here real quick, wrap it up and then uh, hope everyone can, in, in, you know, find a way to finish enjoying the rest of their Saturday. So thank you for everybody attending. We also want to, uh, I really thank uh, Lee for giving us a tour and showing us everything about uh, DST. I mean, uh, you know, all the different locations, everything that he's doing, that's, that's, that's quite a setup and, and quite a, uh, a program you got running in, in, in so many places with so many age groups. Um, so that, that, that was awesome to see. And uh, I look forward to coming out there and getting a chance to uh, maybe work with you a little bit on that hill, right? Uh, one of the things I asked about what were the degrees, all of the, the hills that I had put together have run between either nine and 12 degrees uh, to, for, to make sure they have proper 
uh, foot strike. And then for some of the overspeed that he doesn't going down, make sure that uh, there's nice smooth transition going from on the hill back to flat. So um, those are important things as well. But Lee, we appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank, you know, Brandon McDaniel, our president for, for jumping on. I want to talk about, uh, thank uh, Tim Maxey and uh, John Coyles of Major League Baseball, obviously big supporters of the PBS CCS. Always want to make sure that uh, we say thank you. And then for the rest of our speakers, Stephanie, we had Joe, big Joe jumping on. Appreciate him. He's out at the uh, Strongman uh, today doing his piece. Uh, Casey, Francisco, Logan, Kara, and David, and obviously Thompson uh, doing doing a great job in, in supporting and participating with the PBS ECS. So uh, everyone, we're going to conclude right here. I appreciate everybody. And uh, we will certificates as far as your CEUs will be going out here in, you know, on Monday. Uh, and that's for the, the dietitians as well as the strength and conditioning coaches. I know that's important. That's one of the reasons why we do these things is uh, one to increase our education, but also to make sure we get our CEUs, right? So, because we understand the importance of that. Uh, do you look at, if you look at another screen, like you've run the internet, listen, this game's going on right now. People have limited time. So uh, it's, it's really important that people get these opportunities to get their CEUs in. So it's a long grinding season. Uh, and even at the youth level now, people all summer long, you know, with the travel ball and stuff like that, there's, there's plenty of games uh, for all the coaches. So enjoy your Saturday. Appreciate you being here. And uh, thank you. We'll see you here soon on our next webinar.